Hi, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours. Uh, if you are watching on YouTube, uh, you can uh, you can see a little link down below and you can click on that link. And uh, you can get to Zoom. If you're watching on Zoom, you can see a little link and you click down below and you'll end up in uh, Mukana. And that's where you become the producer. And so the producer is uh, area is where you decide what we're going to talk about. All your questions, we don't have an agenda. The agenda is your questions. So what questions you ask and what questions you vote on is really going to drive the entire show. So uh, make sure to, to, to go into Makana, uh, ask your questions, vote on the questions that you're most interested in, and let us know what you want to talk about. If you think that you can answer some of those questions, we'd love to have you. Uh, we open the doors at uh, 6 o'clock. You can come in and check your uh, system. You don't have to be here, though, until 6.40 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. And that's where we do mic checks. Once we've done mic checks, that's the size of the crew. Now, it changes a little bit on Saturdays because we, uh, we open up for our um, education a group um, at eight o'clock, and uh, we'll start. We'll start right on time. We have David Ma uh, Malin here from Harvard University. Uh, David in, is going to talk about CS50 and uh, what they're working on there. Uh, Nick Jushishin from Drexel University will be here at 10 a.m. to talk about meta humans in Unreal. Um, and then, of course, we have the Mad in the Kitchen project uh, starting at four, really. The doors open at four, the cooking starts at five, and uh, we're kind of experimenting with new kinds of education uh, there um, as we as we kind of move through that process. So um, anyway, let's go ahead and jump into the questions. Bill? Starting today with Rupert McRae in Dallas, Texas, who asked, BBC weather presenters use a single wired button clicker to advance their slides. The wire appears black, but when it appears in front of the keyed frame, it disappears. How are they doing this? All right, go ahead, Rupert. I can just show you a quick example. I don't have exactly what I was talking about, but uh, like here. See, she's holding a wired clicker, and if she were to raise her hand like over the picture, the wire would actually disappear. I just wonder how they do that. My guess is some kind of, she's all lighter colors. They could do a Luma key on that. You know, that, that would allow it to disappear if it was there. The only problem would be the, the actual wired clicker that she's holding. Um, yeah, it, it, I'm not actually sure how they would do that. Yeah. I'm not sure when, why they're using a wire. When it happens, you can <laughs> see the, the, the device itself, but the cord just vanishes. I wonder yeah, if that's, it's reflective of some sort. The coordinates picking up green screen from around yeah. her. Is that possible? Yeah, go ahead, TJ. Do they? Does she? Do, do the presenters move a lot? I wonder if they're using some sort of garbage mat. No, uh, I don't think no. She work. stands still, basically. I mean, a little bit here and there. They don't walk around. Mm -hmm. But like I say, if she just raises her hand, then that thing disappears. Go ahead, Charles. I think based on what Bill said, there is a bit of reflection going on with those because if you look at her wrist, most of her jewelry is gone. Oh, so when she does I that? Think, yeah, yeah. So, so I think so they're just doing be... a really hard. They're probably doing a hard key, you know, yeah. on it. So that that's probably what's what's going on there. Uh, I think it's funny that they're using a wire. You know, I, I get, I get the the. You don't want to have anything fail, but a DSAN, you know, perfect queue is pretty stable. So, so it's it's an interesting uh, process. I'm sure they know what that is. All right, next question. Jonas Dattel Reutling in Germany is next. Can Guy show his moving Amazon Echo? Go ahead, Guy. Sure. It's uh, right behind me, right there. So if I move my head, you should be able to see it moving. Wow, so the whole thing's moving. Yeah, so this one pivots, unlike the, f the other one. It actually moves as I move. And how much is that? I think it was 250 And do you find it to be uh, more responsive than the portal? Um, it does seem like it's a little bit faster, quick on the draw. Shorter lifespan. And it goes 360. <laughs> so it, it'll spin all the way around. I can't go down there because that's a long way down. That's the stairwell down there, but basically it'll spin 360. 1080 or 4K? Uh, 1080. It's a, the camera is super tiny. I mean, it's, it's, I think the portal plus might have a little edge there on the. So you feel like the image quality, quality is better. Image quality is better the portal on the plus. portal. portal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead, yeah. Jo Jonas. And what's interesting is it can track the voice. We had um, in the post show yesterday, we played with it. And when he uh, turned his head but kept talking, it kept tracking him even without seeing him. Because it oh, can track using, the voice. It's using multi. So, multi yeah. Mo mm -hmm. If he talks the activation word, it turns to him, which is really cool. Yeah, it's nifty. I can feel my uh, my wallet getting warm. 
<laughs> so I have to figure out how to test it. One of the things we're looking at is still trying to decide what we send out to, to the chefs as we work through the kind of the training stuff that we're doing about whether it's a portal or whether it's something else. And and um, now I have to read. Now I have to look at that. So we'll, we'll yeah, take a look at that. The, the only bummer is that the tilt is manual. So if you if you tilt it, uh, you have to do that manually. And yesterday we found that if we tilted it while it was trying to move, it, it'll say the port or the echo has bumped into something and then it, it doesn't work anymore. So you have to actually restart. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, maybe we'll stick with the portal. All right. Next question. <laughs> Peter Rosado in Las Vegas, Nevada is up next with, how are the panel members integrating their portal TV into production? Using the ATEMP, I've not had success getting an external mic to work. The auto pan follow is nice, but how can we leverage that while ignoring the built-in mics or using better mics? Go ahead, Ken. Uh, yes. I uh, don't use the mics um, that are built into it. Um, I will be testing um, the USB-C port out from the Portal TV, um, but presently I can only get that to work on a network connection, but I've got a few other devices that I want to test to see whether I could get good audio or good mm -hmm. um, audio in or out from it. Yep. Go ahead, John. I'll use my Portal for, for two things, to bump up to 720 mm -hmm. and then also use it for... Um, for attendee viewing, just as a as a confidence monitor. Yeah, what we're looking at doing for the the mat in the kitchen is basically using that to follow our chef around that's in the that's in the kitchen. So it just will follow them around a little bit, and then we have another overhead camera. How we get that all in, whether it goes into one uh, cam one system or it goes into two systems, is still something that we're kind of playing with. So it's a, right now we're planning to eventually have two feeds going into Zoom, so that we can just cut back and forth in master control. Um, so that, you know, we don't have to worry about them doing anything on site. Uh, we think that that's going to improve it. We're not going to use the audio. Uh, the audio on the portal has never been, never been good. Um, next question. TJ Asher here on the panel from Minneapolis, Minnesota says, what are people's philosophies on organizing data on a NAS network attached storage or near line storage? One big volume or multiple volumes with each targeted for a specific person or file type or perhaps something else TJ hasn't thought of? Go ahead, Sky. Well, in a feature film world, you want to keep that project all together so that at the end of it, you can move it all collectively. So that's how we would do it with regards to a film or a, a TV project. Okay, go ahead, Mickey. Exactly. As, as Sky mentioned, if you are working with a team or multiple teams, uh, you would want to make a volume for each project and only give access to people that are supposed to be able to access that specific project. If it's just you, I would suggest making two volumes. A, a large one that is for your bulk storage and one that is for public that you can share or maybe access remotely. Good, John. Uh, in the enterprise world, we tend to split it up as needed and assign to different servers. So we could have one, we would have one volume per server uh, and then you would connect and attach the storage to the servers instead of directly through the NAS. So that's another way you could do that. Next question. David Brady in New York says, TV of Tomorrow, event in San Francisco and New York. Is this something new? Has anyone on the panel been asked to speak and or has anybody, uh, is anyone here involved in the production or planning to attend? I'm curious to hear more and he has a link to the show in the question. I haven't heard of it before. So this is something that I guess is happening soon. <laughs> so, uh, so I, yeah, I haven't, I haven't heard of it. I'm, it's usually, a, I mean, I've heard of many things that are like this, not to be a little bit of a curmudgeon, but usually it's a, uh, not usually the TV of tomorrow. It's kind of the TV of almost yesterday. Uh, Roscoe. Yeah. It's very into audience and data analytics. A lot of the seminars are, so it's still very uh, marketing driven and commercial driven. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, I think that that market, I mean, it might be the, the, the TV of tomorrow, but it probably isn't the TV of next year. Is my is my is my uh, is my guess. Uh, a lot of those things are going to be more and more difficult to support. Next question. John Puitt at Hunterville here in the panel says, "Why do directors like audience shots so much? I find that when I'm watching a show and they cut to a shot of the audience, it tends to take me out of the show and not add to it. Music, sports, award shows, fashion—they all do it." The concept. So what's funny about that is that if you're in a, if I do a lot of stuff where we're doing stage events. And those cameras, the wide cameras, the jibs, all of those are only for the webcast. They don't use them in the iMag that goes up on the screen. And so they're, the, 
the concept there is usually to provide the online audience with context. You know, where what is that? Where are they actually watching it? Why are they watching it there? Uh, as opposed to people can say it, there is a comment that it gets suffocating when you have a lot of close up shots or just the shots of the stage and there's no sense of that there's a hundred or a thousand or, or two thousand people in the room. Uh, also, uh, generally, jib shots are seen as an opportunity to increase um, a, a perceived production value. A big sweeping jib shot makes it feel more more mag majestic, so to speak. So those are the main reasons that we see those come up. Uh, to your point, I think as we start looking at digital first events, uh, we probably will see uh, less of that. Go ahead, Bill. Well, also on the big award shows and things like that, the secondary marketing opportunities for the fashion industry and things like that, they want their clothes seen as much as possible. So there may be commercial tie-ins where there's a specification in the contract. Yeah, sometimes there's people shows. in the audience that you want to show, you know, the, the stars and so on and so forth. Go ahead, Guy. Yeah, I think it conveys emotion. I'm, I've uh, ran those big DigiPower 77 Fujinons on Tony Robbins stage and over comms are telling me to pick up somebody who's emotional and boom, I'm, you know, right there. I'm searching, scanning and mm -hmm. constantly they're asking me to, you know, slow pan across the audience. So I think it is just that social proof and like, hey, what's going on and how you should feel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead, Roscoe. The impact of any particular moment on the screen is in how people react to it, not the actual giving of the moment. I do think that it's interesting to, to, to think about it in, in terms of concerts where I, I was just, I was talking earlier in the pre-show about, I was watching a concept concert that's done with surround and a lot of other things. And, and uh, I did find that cutting to the audience was not, for a concert, was not particularly useful to me, you know, as a, as a process. I mean, a shot every once in a while saying, wow, that's a big stadium. <laughs> that, was, that was interesting. But for the most part, you wanted to stay on stage. Uh, next question. Cami Vansafek in Redondo Beach, California, says, while Zoom describes things as unlimited, quote, end quote, is it really, if one runs a meeting 24-7, 365, will they get upset? I understand that one would need to restart the meeting every so often. Uh, I believe that, the, that every meeting needs to be restarted every 24 hours. I don't think you just leave it on open-ended. And by the way, for our, for our viewers, uh, the, the questions are a little uh, slow today uh, or for our producers. It would be good to get more questions in to, uh, to kind of fill the hopper there. Go ahead, Mickey. Yeah, I think uh, Zoom's unlimited per meeting means 30 hours, I think. 30 hours per meeting? Oh, it's 30 hours, yeah, not 24. Yeah, 30 it's hours per meeting, yeah. 24 plus a little extra if you forgot. Uh, go ahead, Rupert, and then uh, Guy. Just in my experience de dealing with this terminology, uh, like unlimited doesn't necessarily mean without restriction. Right, right. Go ahead, Kai. Yeah, the one that I think Alex and I both are pushing right now is the cloud storage, which um, for your recordings, um, that is really that does unlimited. appear <laughs> that does appear to be unlimited. Uh, I, I'm going to get bit at some point, and probably more bit if I say this on YouTube. But right now, I'm at 1.14 terabytes. So, yeah, so it's it's 800. And they yeah. keep sending me messages like every day. So to get rid of the, un, or to get to unlimited, they say to go to enterprise. So you might be right. getting a call from your rep and then you can, then it is unlimited. So that's the time that I've heard that term with Zoom is go to the upper tier and you can have all the cloud recording you can eat. But I'm like, why? I'm getting it right now. <laughs> I, I have to admit, I'm just kind of seeing how long this party lasts. All right. All right. Next, next question. Ron H. in West, Michi West Michigan, excuse me, says, might anyone have an alternative to solo shot and or S-W-I-V-L swivel, swivel. swivel robotic cameraman, both do audio following of the talent. In this case, it would be a teacher without the ability to have a camera operator. I think the alternative that a lot of us are experimenting with are things like the, the, the new Alexa or the, uh, or the portal. Uh, those are the, probably the less expensive solutions to those. I don't know if they're as accurate. One of the things we notice is that the portal likes to settle. So if you don't move for, for very long, it'll, it, it will let you give you a lot of room to sit. And then as you, you, it tends to not start reframing until you break frame or get close to the edge. And if you do it too quickly, you just kind of walk out of frame and it goes, oh, right, I, sh I, should, be calling, I should be following you. So, so that's the only thing to, to kind of take into account. Uh, as you uh, as you look at it, but I, I think those are some of the only ones. There are other, so um, there are some more advanced ones. Someone's uh, shooting from. Oh, that's the that's the uh, right. There's that's the Alexa that guy showing there. Uh, the uh, yeah, there's there's some very advanced ones using motion capture uh, sensors in the pocket. Those are what I can't for some reason my 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 I'm not able to come up with the name black. Uh, 
some, one of our stage folks and I, I've been talking to them and I just can't think of the name of, name of the company right now, but they'll do ones where they're following you via sensor. So you put a sensor in your pocket and they, and the cameras will follow you along. So that's another way to do it. Uh, Mark Roberts, um, makes a control system that allows one camera to follow someone on a football field or a stage, all the other cameras triangulate to that person. So you can get all the different angles for, of that, of that, uh, player or of the speaker, uh, without, ha with only one operator. So that's a, that's another thing to think about. Next question comes from Rupert McCary of Dallas, Texas. And Rupert says, any thoughts on the new Road Connect app for podcasting and streaming? It allows for up to four NT USB minis to connect to a single computer with virtual channels for connecting remote guests. Has anyone played with that? It looks pretty interesting. Road has really taken on the pod, or just taken on online pretty aggressively, you know, between the Go and between the other the other uh, mics and so on and so forth, it's been a pretty interesting go. What do people think of the road of that of that mic? Does anyone has? I think we've had a couple people on it. Does anyone have any strong opinion about it? Go ahead, Roscoe. Yeah, I mean it's really for quick quick function. It's not super high quality, um, but right. it's great for just quick function. It's functional microphone in my mind. It's something that you literally can throw in. And the seven hour battery life, which I haven't ran to the end of, that just mm -hmm. makes it a really. You have two of them. You've got an all-day single mic source easily. Yeah. Go ahead, Mickey. Yeah, certainly bang, bang for the buck. It, it's no, it's no like, you know, PR40, it, it's no U87, but it gets the job done at, the, at a decent price. Next question. Comes to us from Edgar Mann in Berlin, Germany. And uh, Edgar is wondering what second camera Guy Cochran is using on the pan tilt zoom stuff today, Guy. Yeah, it's the the new Echo Show 10 inch, so you can see it kind of moving around. <laughs> guy, guy went a little too fast for it there. Yeah, it's pretty quick. Well, I'm gonna fall over because I'm on a chair of a. Yep. Uh, but yep. yeah, it is. Pretty it does pretty quick. well. Yeah. yeah, I feel I'm like it, it does feel like it's more responsive. My concern is that it won't last as long as the as the portal. Moving parts is a, is a challenge, but uh, I'm looking forward to when they turn that into an arm. Uh, next question. I'm still looking at his blue backlight, and he looks like from another planet. Uh, Tim Holm in San Lorenzo is up next with, I have a 7-inch monitor that I use for speaker view. What's the best placement for it so that it appears that I have a good eye line into my camera, above or below? And at the same time, how close to me should I put it? Yeah, go ahead, Ken. Uh, I have this, a similar setup. Um, I'm looking at the monitor now, so you tell me in terms of, how does my eye line look? It's below the it's below the lens, and it's about an arm's length, just over an arm's length away. Uh, that's my setup. Yeah, we used to do it above, but we do it below most of the time uh, because it, we do feel like it looks slightly more natural, and people are more used to it because we're, we all have screens. Uh, TJ and then Roscoe. Uh, I agree with Ken. Uh, just slightly below the monitor gives a better eye line from what I've seen, as opposed to being above it. Yeah, uh, Mickey. Or is it or Roscoe? I'm sorry, Roscoe. Yeah, I'll just go real quick. What I do is I actually put uh, speaker mode on, so uh, and then I block it out with Mukana. So I'm actually looking at Alex right now, with, and he is right below my camera, and I just put Alex and Bill right below my camera lens. Yeah, go ahead, Rupert. I've been experimenting with the various variations of this, and I found that if you use just a small monitor for speaker view, you have to turn your eyes away further to look at whatever else you've got going on. So I just tended to keep active speaker at the top of my main monitor, have the camera there and just have the rest of my workspace on the same screen because then my eye line is all within the same area. Yeah, no, absolutely. One thing that, that we have found is that as we move towards digital first events where you have audiences possibly watching someone digitally, uh, we have found that you play, we, we play a lot with the monitor underneath the, 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 uh, the lens and we'll play with that height because what it'll do is it'll bring an eye line down. And when you see it in us, we've done point to points where we bring executives into, you know, you have an executive in let's say Mountain View and another, and, and someone in Singapore or Morocco or, or something like that. And if you get that eye line right, it looks like they're looking right at the audience. <laughs> it's quite a, it's almost unnerving if they're sitting in the audience because you, but so you're actually drawing the eye line away from the lens a little bit to get them to look like they're looking right down at you on a big screen somewhere else in the world. Next question. 
comes from jail. That's all the information we have. No place. Mm -hmm. uh, how is Office Hours produced? Are you guys using vMix or something like vMix? How are the video and audio signals captured and output? Thanks. It's very high tech. Everybody jumps onto Zoom. We have a conversation. We stream it to YouTube from Zoom. <laughs> we, we, we do much more complex ones. As you know, I have a half million dollar facility that just does this and we tie everything together and we pull Zooms in, you know, as uh, individual feeds and, and there's a lot of other things that we do for this event, given that we do it for hours every day, seven days a week. Uh, one of the things that we considered was, um, you know, stability and, and, you know, how can we actually produce this every day? So we've kept the tech purposefully fairly simple so that we, it's something that is sustainable. Uh, where the tech has really been applied is by all of our panelists and all of our users who have invested heavily in their rigs. So we kind of, that's been the thing that we're, we're grateful for and what make part of what makes the show is not so much what we do in the central area, but, but what's being done on the edge. Now, next question. Comes from Jonas Dattel, our friend in Reutlingen, Germany, and he says, "One uh, could one add a webcam like the C920 uh, from Logitech mounted on top of the Alexa 10 to get a better image?" <laughs> you could do that. You could do. You could put a. You could probably. I. You. Could, I don't think the Huddle Cam would work because I think it would be too heavy for that little guy. I think that would definitely lower its. Uh, lower its. How Camera long it lasts. Stacking. Um, but. You are right. What you won't get is the zoom, but what you would get is the, and I think that the other thing you have to be very careful of is the cable. So I think that I would say that weight, weight and that cable pulling is probably outside of the spec of that, of the motors. And so, you know, they're really built a lot of times when they build them, they're building for a very specific thing. And I think you'd, you, it might work for a while, but I think you'd end up wearing the motors down um, as you start to give it a weight structure that it's not, uh, not used to. Yeah, next question. Um, Ryan Rood of Cokeville, Texas says, how was the initial organization of Matt in the Kitchen's roles assigned, particularly for the office hours experiments on Saturdays? It'd be cool to see more of how the teams are put together to run a show. For the most part, someone pinged Sky or me and said, hey, I want to play. Uh, go ahead, Sky. And that's to your point. Yesterday, I was aware that Aaron is now our graphics yeah. person because he showed he up. Asked me, he asked me, and I said, "Yeah, sure. Talk to talk to Alex." I, I, I sent I sent him over, not not another me, me, but Alex Golner, and 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 so and yeah, I we, bumped into Alex Golner at, at the water cooler uh, yeah, yeah, in an, in yeah, an after exactly. hours. So, so people yes. volunteering has been how how the teams have been built so far. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Next and question. Love, love more more people to play. Absolutely. Next question. Uh, David J. Mulan of uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts says, does anyone have experience with and recommendations for cost-effective video walls that can be used in lieu of on-stage screens and potentially green screen? Most any display or TV beyond 85 inches, we found, unfortunately, costs an order of magnitude more. Uh, David, how, how long do you, how, how large do you want the wall? I think at this point, we'd be happy with anything greater than 85 inches. We use, the use cases for us are not just slides, but code-like content. And so being mm -hmm. able to stand in front of it and point at very visible content would be ideal. Right. Yeah, the, the, um, the challenge you know, with that is that, is that the cameras, when, when you deal with uh, LED walls in general, number one, as, as you know, they become astronomically expensive very, very quickly. They also have a tendency, anything that's remotely cost effective, the pitch is too high. So uh, if, you, if you're at a 2.5 mil pitch or above and really anything over about 1.2 mil, you're going to really be, and that's the distance, of course, between the LED um, lights. The problem that you're going to end up with is Marae and then also that it defeats the um, temporal compression of the, cam of the stream. So Zoom and other things will, you know, they're trying to figure out where to spend their resources. It's a fixed, you know, compression rate. And any pattern behind you will cause uh, it to try to spread that out and you get basically too little jam over too much bread and it just breaks up, you know? And so we see breakup in streams all the time when someone uses an LED wall in front of them or behind them, especially if they get close to it. So if you're talking about touching it, you're going to be close enough to that wall that no matter how large your sensor is and no matter what you have set up, you're just going to start getting the texture of that wall in it. Um, now there's, so th that's the, that's the real challenge. Now, Sony, uh, makes some very, very high resolution screens that are very, very expensive. Um, that may be something you could get to where you wouldn't see any Marae, but it's, it's, un it's, it's unknown whether that would work. Um, Barco also makes 0.9 mil, 
again, I wouldn't go up to the screen and touch it. Um, mostly what I've done, and I tore it apart right before the show, uh, or yesterday I did it for, a, for another thing, but uh, generally when I'm trying to talk about code, I usually use Telestration, which I have, again, unfortunately defeated here uh, for another show. But uh, so I can draw on the screen that I'm talking to as opposed to walking up to the screen and touching it. Um, and I found that to be a better situation for um, being able to show the code, interact with it um, in a cleaner way than trying to shoot the screen. But there, yeah, to your point, you're, you're absolutely correct that it, it's hard to find something that's remotely cost effective that's, both, that's also large and high resolution. It's just we haven't gotten there yet. Yep. Um, yep. Next question. Uh, comes from Joe D'Amato in Vancouver, British Columbia. And Joe says, for recording one-on-one -on -one interviews, does the room lean towards Zoom or are there better alternatives? I, I want to annotate something. I know we never go back. But the one thing, uh, David, if you have enough area behind you, uh, you can do multiple projectors to kind of get a really bright, flat flat projection. You have to worry about vignetting. If they're anywhere close, if the projector doesn't have enough throw, most projectors will need 20, 30 feet minimum to throw it. But if you have a large stage with a large um, backstage, you can put it on. Projection will actually, is actually less expensive and will actually look pretty good. I mean, we still tend to use pretty bright projectors, but that that will not moray and you will be able to walk up to it and it's as large as your screen. Um, anyway, that's another thing to think about there. Anyway, uh, let's go back. To, so we have one-on-one uh, -on -one interviews. I know a couple of us have been using different things other than Zoom. Go ahead, Peter. I've had good luck using Memo Live, live you know, Memo Call functions and that I can bring three or four people in very nicely with that. Then it handles all the stuff I need to do and get a clean a clean feed to record. I don't use it for live streaming though. Yep. Go ahead, Victor. Ecamm Live has a nice solution that is um, system independent. In other words, just works on a web browser up to four people. You can record the ISOs. Uh, it's, it's a decent solution uh, for this problem. Although I do think Zoom is probably better. The big thing is whether it's gonna be live or whether it's going to be, uh, uh, the question is really, what, is, it, is it going to be live or is it gonna be a record that you're gonna play out later? Uh, if you are going to do a record, you probably wanna try for the highest quality to think about double ending the event. So basically what you're doing there is you're having some camera or system you know, record locally. So when we do a lot of these point to points, we're sending out larger camera systems as, as high as a 6K, a Blackmagic 6K that's shooting in log at, at 6K with a USB pre with, you know, 32 bit float and, you know, a good, a good mic. That's the highest level of what we do for these one on ones because they're not live. And so they're, they're basically, we're recording those and we're getting all the, the, the double end means that we're just on every end we're recording. Uh, one way to do that with webcams is using something like riverside.fm. Uh, that is something that, that uh, I know that Alan and a couple other folks are, are using. So that's another option there. Um, and so you can, and then of course you can even have them open QuickTime and start recording while you're talking. Uh, so there are a couple different options there to, to capture it locally. Zoom is still, in my opinion, probably one of the easiest ones because you can just send it out. It'll traverse complex networks a little bit more effectively than than WebRTC. And uh, but you do have you will have some breakup that you wouldn't have with a double end. Go ahead, Bill. We've been iffy on all the other services for a while, but I have to say I have a monthly that I do uh, for a pretty large corporate client, and we've been using Teams just the last three or four months. They've made pretty great strides. So a screen scrape off of a Teams signal has been remarkable compared to what it was 90 days ago in my experience. Yeah, go ahead, Chad. Uh, you can either use vMix to do screen scraping of other tools or use vMix Call. A pro license gets you eight callers. A 4K license gets you four callers. Uh, next question. Uh, Cami uh, Van Zoyk Fake uh, is back in from Redondo Beach with Dolby, has video conferencing cameras that use 4K cameras and pan automatically within the frame. Does anyone else have something like that? And has someone tried to use it with other software? That's exactly how Portal works. Uh, the Portal has a 4K camera that it's now, that it's panning and scanning inside of the frame. Uh, I think that life-size also has a version of that. Uh, so life-size ca camera systems will also do that. So um, panning and tilting inside of the, the 4K, 4K image is a pretty, e it, it, what's nice about it, it's mechanically simple, which means it'll last longer, especially if you're installing them into a lot of locations. Uh, next question. 
Our friend Alex Forty Golner in London, England, says, uh, "When video, when will video include alpha mats as a matter of choice? Mac or PC displaying video with alpha, switchers being able to composite video that includes alpha channels, streams with alpha, so that people at home could receive video with an alpha. For example, compositing in alt, uh, alternate reality. AR. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, Jonas." Technically, it's already there because the new VP8 and VP9 codec um, for WebM has an alpha channel and you can stream that one over WebRTC. So you can do it technically, but it's not used yet. The tech is there though. <clears throat> yeah, and, and uh, AR would probably be more likely done on the remote system you know, that people are watching as opposed to something that you'd stream out because part of the real value of AR there is that it's tracking to the scene that it's that it's within, is that it's not really part of the video feed that's there. And so one of the things you see a lot of is compositing. If you look at what Caffeine, not Caffeine, um, uh, Vidpresso, you know, it's all, it's all got Caffeine, but Vidpresso that was bought by, it's funny how your mind kind of connects odd things together. So uh, two different live streaming services. So if you look at Vidpresso, what they did is figuring out how to do it in the stream. So they're able to add all those graphics post uh, your stream or between the mezzanine and the edge. Uh, so they're, they're able to kind of put those into that into that puzzle uh, as, as it goes through. So it, and a lot of the stuff is available. As, as Jonas said, the HDMI uh, 2.1 spec, at least, I think, does support alpha channels. It's just that no one's using them. Go ahead, Roscoe. Do we need the 40 bit pixel three for red three or sorry eight for red eight for blue eight for green eight for alpha and then we'll need another eight for depth yeah and i think that those a lot of those things are kind of you know working their way out but i think that especially as we get back to ar that's mostly being generated by the by the device and and that's that's going to be something that is comped over over top of it now authoring for that is still going to be a challenge i think that most of us are going to end up authoring in mass with things like motion and final cut in the short term because apple's building all the ar tools into it currently called usdz um, next question richard gutarski of stockholm sweden is up next with panels thoughts on skipping preview tally lights they have events with talents who are not so used to camera tally lights just noting which cameras active is hard for them preview seems to just confuse them i'm a big fan of wetware development I'd rather teach. I'd rather not dumb down my show. I'd rather teach the the, the participants how to how to interact properly with the cameras. Uh, having a preview tally is super useful for for the talent. Once a talent understands what they're looking at, and yes, if this is the only time they do it every year, that's going to be a little bit more difficult. But I would I would add rehearsal before I took away the preview tally because as a host. It is integral to everything I do of knowing where the camera is going next is creates a much different show. Go ahead, Rupert, and then Peter. So in terms of preview, I would think of it as like a kind of ready, set, go, ready, set, go scenario, a bit like uh, something like this. This is something everybody's, everybody's, <laughs> right. everybody's familiar with. Like you're about to go, it's coming, get ready, and then you're about to go, and that's it. When you get used to it as a host, it, it becomes a very comforting thing where I know where that camera is going to go. If you wonder how people are being able to be totally interactive where they suddenly turn to a camera and start talking to it and it makes sense uh, and the cut and the and the uh, the host act in unison that is from preview and uh, live tally go ahead Peter well, the only comment I would make is I I watched a an executive get very confused at work once with tally lights turned out he was red green colorblind and had no <laughs> clue had no clue what was going on at that point. Okay, so I'll annotate my 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 comments with uh, check with them. Do they know which one is green and which one is red? That would be that would be useful. All right, next question. Tim Holm of San Lorenzo says uh, re recommendations for standard definition hard drive enclosures that would work well with ATEM Mini Extreme ISO. I want to save money and be able to swap these out. Is that SD standard? I think it's SSD. Is my yeah, guess. SSD. Yeah. That's me. Yeah, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead, Mickey. Yeah, for um, SATA SSDs, uh, I've had uh, very good luck with this these enclosures from Akitio. They they look like the uh, G technology drives, and they're just regular USB uh, um, USB micro type C. If I'm saying that correctly, mm -hmm. USB gets uh, pretty 
pretty uh confusing at times yeah, go um, ahead, uh, and also sorry just one last thing there yep. i have dozens of these from uh, owc which are the same thing just usbc enclosures and they're i believe 20 or 30 us dollars each very go affordable ahead. charles yeah uh i was gonna say a <clears throat> sorry i was gonna say owc in the absence of jason but mickey covered it so <laughs> um I will say that the ones that I use for everything in there, they might be a little bit more expensive are these Samsung um, uh, T5s. And I know that they're not an enclosure, but I have stacks of them and they just work, you know, and you can put them, you can collect them in there and they're small and you can throw them in your pocket and, and they work every single time. Uh, so I would look at that. I would also research uh, NVMe enclosures with NVMe uh, storage. A, a lot of those aren't super expensive and they are super fast. Uh, so something to, to also consider. Uh, just make sure don't buy the cables separately and make sure they're data cables. <laughs> my only my only recommendation. We've gotten enclosures that are, were really cheap and they came with uh, power only uh, uh, cables, which was odd given that they came with a drive. Uh, go ahead, John. Are there any drive arrays you would recommend, like a NAS or something like that, that can be directly, not a NAS, but a, a, for the, a, for the a mini, RAID array? For yeah. a mini extreme, I wouldn't do that. I, I, I guess I would rather transfer it from it. I would rather keep it small and simple. Uh, go ahead, Mickey. Nope. Uh, Mickey come back to me. I'm going to pick, pick All one right. up. All right, next question. Okay. Jim Hankins of Chesterfield, Michigan is up next with he's asking, I'm considering building a Mac mini based Zoom room for use in a 1300 soft conference room. Any recommendations for a pan tilt Zoom camera that supports far end camera control? Yeah, go ahead, Guy. Yeah, the, I've played with a few of these ones. The Bird Dog P100 is one that comes to mind, but the one that we settled on in our conference room is this one. It's uh, a USB-C uh, or it handles the that protocol, the USB, USVC, UVC, UVC. Sorry. Mm -hmm. um, so very few of the ones that uh, are high end have that protocol. They they won't have a USB port. They'll just have HDMI and SDI, which then doesn't give you that far end control. So this one uh, is a 12x, and it's it's pretty decent. So I take a look at that one. Yeah. Go ahead, Peter. Yeah, I've had. I've had good luck with the Bird Dog P100 doing doing what uh, again it but it's got all the they can do remember I can do simultaneously all the protocols out the back side so dealer's choice of which one you pick off right you can do NDI USB C HDMI SDI all at the same time and so how you hook it up it works just fine and you can and one, control it remotely and the one that I'm uh... I, I will admit I'm, that I'm circling that I want to test is the new Canon. So the new Canon is a one inch uh, CMOS sensor. It's got, it does NDI uh, HX support. So it's not the full NDI, but NDI HX support as well as the standard uh, video outputs. Uh, I believe it has SDI on it. A one inch chip, uh, it will actually do log out. Uh, so it, there's a lot of control there. So that's one that I'm kind of circling. One note about Zoom on a Mac Mini, uh, the M1 does not support Dante yet. So if you're planning to use any kind of uh, useful audio <laughs> out of it over IP, uh, you will have trouble using the M1 mini, Mac Mini until Dante's uh, code is updated. Uh, go ahead, Mickey. I go back to John Pewitt's question? Yep, go earlier. ahead. Yeah, so this is what I use for uh, RAID enclosures uh, that, that are partable. This is from CineRAID. And it has an actual RAID controller in it. This one's for two, two and a half inch drives. And you can set it to, right now, it's set up to scary RAID, the RAID 0. But you can set it up <laughs> to uh, RAID 1, RAID 5, uh, whatever you need. That's great. Next question. Uh, comes from Vincent Alvarez in Bellingham, Washington, showing my young nephew my collection of three-quarter inch U-Matic tapes. Uh, so we're going down memory lane. What are the oldest or largest formats you have worked with on physical media, gang? Uh, Ken and then Sky. Yeah, I'm um, presently, um, this is a six uh, VC60, 60, 60 minute um, VCR. It works <laughs> in a Philips. It's right. Circa 1972, oh, and I'm trying to get from that into digital. Go ahead, Sky. I, I physically never used the two inch, but there mm. is a two inch tape that was uh, in the facility that I was at here in Seattle. But I mm. actually learned on an RM440 uh, 
three quarter inch controller. So it's the uh, good old days. Good, Bill. My oldest piece of technology out in the garage and still functioning is a wire recorder from probably 19... 19- 24, 25, it was one of the earliest recording uh, pieces of technology. And I actually have, it came, I got it at a yard sale with some wires. And I have recordings of somebody playing the violin back in the ancient Great. days. It's fabulous. I think the, lar- the largest format I've used is the, that I've interacted with is IMAX film, which is <laughs> just, just massive compared to all the other ones. Uh, go ahead, uh, TJ. Uh, yeah, speaking of film, I used to use film. There's this thing you had to put, you know, put pictures on and then you put it in the chemicals and it smelled bad. And it was, yeah. yeah. Kids ask your parents. I have an eight by 10 and larger in my, at my parents' house. (laughs) It's it's cool. All right. Next question. Charles Klein in New York City and here on the panel today. Mickey, you mentioned the Neumann U87. What details in the sound would a trained professional like yourself notice that it puts, it puts it above the Heil PR40? Yeah, go ahead, Mickey. And for me, it's it's having a nice like rounded mid mid low end and uh, low end without annoy being annoyingly boomy like uh like say uh, personal uh sentiment uh, i find the low end of the uh sm7b annoyingly booming uh, b- mm-hmm. boomy uh so uh, the u87 has that characteristic b- b- without being over uh overpowering but at the same time it all it still uh, it still has that detail on the high end yeah. That smooth yeah. high-end detail, yeah. And, and we are going to make sure that we stop at 750 so that we have a little time to, for the educators to come in and get ready for, for David. So um, we'll go pretty quick. Go ahead, Bill, and then Victor. Well, having been in the voiceover game for a long time, the, the combination of uh, sensitivity versus uh, the ability to use a mic in more places other than a controlled sound booth has always been the defining factor of different mics for me. If you're in a completely controlled environment, then all the sensitivity and articulation in the world is great. That same mic in a noisy room with air conditioning and things like that fails miserably. So you're really picking the horse for the course in this case. What are you trying to do? That's the best mic. Good, Victor. Musically speaking, for a vocalist, it is a wonderful mic that can pick up that air that's so desired, uh, especially by female vocalists uh, vocalists with the U87. And you can get them far enough away from the mic that they can perform and and still, you know, in a good environment, get the performance they need. Go ahead, Mickey. And yeah, if I were to condense it down to just one word, smooth. Yeah. (laughs) Next question. Tim McAlpine of Chilliwack, Canada says, I'm putting together a pre-flight list for my live stream productions. Do you have examples you can talk about and or share on Discord? Yeah, go ahead, Roscoe. Yeah, all my checklists have 10 items or less and they're all divided by the job responsibilities. Uh, I just find that um, having a huge checklist doesn't work for anybody. So you literally have to make the checklist and then hand them off to the person who's responsible for that particular area. A lot of our checklists are based on the casing. You know, what goes into this bag, what goes into this case, what goes into the, you know, these pieces. There are some overall checklists. We do like to, for larger events, we like them to be software-based so that you're checking off your own individual little thing, but it's it's in a larger area that we can see kind of everything is green before we leave. Um, that is, and really trying to think down to all the way down to the cables. The thing that kills you is you have a really nice set of mics and you don't have the cables that connect them to the transmitters. Not that that's ever happened to me or I had to fly someone from New York to Switzerland to fix it or that I'm bitter. All right, Bill. Yeah, I was going to say exactly the same thing. It's the difference between task checklists, which I agree need to be as limited as possible, and things like gear checklists where that one cable or one plug missing can take down the entire utility of a case with 75 things in it. Yeah. Next question. James Falslein of Minneapolis, Minnesota says, just bought two bicolor ring lights. Does it make any difference if I set them to daylight and set camera for daylight or indoor and set the camera for indoor? Go ahead, Rupert. So it can depend on whether you're trying to match other sources or maybe if you have daylight coming into your environment. If you do, then you want to probably stick in the daylight range. Beyond that, it depends on your camera, really. I'm using Mm -hmm. a Brio, which seems to do better at the higher temperatures, more like daylight up to 6,000, somewhere around there. But Roscoe and then Sky. Human blood is red. We like to see the color red in people's faces. So use red or light, which is the 3200. And Red's understand kind. that your, your colors are your emotional medium of visual. And so Rupert is the perfect example. He uses color in his backdrop as an emotional 
uh, contrast. I have found that most of my my cameras perform better at fifty six hundred over thirty two hundred, even though that Roscoe is correct in the in the area that you want to go towards that, um, and so they they just perform better that way. And so I've used fifty six for almost everything I've shot in the last ten years. As a result, next question. Alex Forty Goldner in London says, "What's the worst piece of advice you've got that you followed? <laughs> <laughs> How much time do we have?" <laughs> I'm trying to think of the ones that I've followed. Um, usually, they they re, they usually that they they have something related to we don't have to prepare for this, or we don't have to need we don't need that much time, or we don't need you know all that gear. That those are usually the ones that have been that have that have um, usually eaten me up on the you know in the in the field. Uh, go ahead, John, and then Ken, and then Bill. Pretty quick. Here, eat this. You'll like it. Oh, no, I I I get a lot of good ones out of that. I have ended up in bed over that. But anyway, go ahead, uh, Ken. Yeah. Um, the advice was to get this speaker. I wanted to use it with my um, Mac mini. Awful sound. Looks good. Then. <laughs> go ahead, Bill. And then Nigel. Worst five words on a set. We'll fix it in post. <laughs> go ahead, Nigel. He's great. He won't need to rehearse. Oh, my gosh. Uh, Jar Charles. <laughs> Had a higher up. Uh, as I was a junior person saying, it's going to be fine. And I'm yeah. telling him it's not going to be fine. And it wasn't this fine. Is not, this is not going to be okay. Now go ahead, Mickey. It's it's cheap and it sounds good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Those things don't go together. Go ahead, Victor. He's a good engineer. He can fix that vocal in the mix. Yeah. Yeah, we'll we'll fix it. We'll fix it in the field. Like, let, let's open up that case. That, that that's been one that has gotten us. Like, we'll we'll open up the switcher in the field. Not that that's ever happened to me. Uh, go ahead. Next question. Tim Holmes, San Lorenzo. Has anybody tried to use the Bluetooth feature to get a higher level mic into the Facebook portal in order to improve the sound coming into it? Go ahead, Ken. Just connected these to it, um, and I'll test it. These have a mic built in, so we'll okay. see. All right, next question. John Puitt of Fundersville says, can I use the ATEM Mini to start recording on a Blackmagic Design camera, or do I have to start it manually? Uh, yeah, go ahead, Roscoe. Yes, you can use the ATEM Minis to start Blackmagic Design cameras, and you, yes. You can also, with in absence of the mini, you remember that you can. There's an iPhone slash iPad app that you can use that that will control the camera, which you can start record. It also works on the M1, so uh, so that 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 actually ports over, so you can open it up in your Mac Mini if you have an M1 as well. Next question. Do you have a link to that, Alex? Because that'd be uh, useful. I'll, I'll try to find it. Yep. Yep. Uh, Arturo L. Real in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, outside of LED walls, what sort of setup would you recommend for live virtual production of Unreal Engine and into Zoom? Are Blackmagic Design cameras the way to go? So the one thing to remember is if you're going multi-cam versus single camera, as soon as you go into multi-camera with an Unreal background, you remember that you have to track that camera's position. So in the room, it looks very odd. We've done it where you're basically cutting. As you cut cameras, you have to cut the background or you have to have separate backgrounds of Unreal. So we've done it in a couple of different ways. One is the one that is the most confusing is, is when you're cutting, Basically, remember the camera has its own perspective into that. And if you watch like a Mandalorian behind the scenes, you're going to see this, that they're moving the background for the camera. And so the problem you get into is that if you cut between two different cameras, you may have to change that background. And so when you're cutting in the room, you're seeing the back, the, the screen changing, which is an odd experience. Um, the Now, you can also just say this is the background for the Unreal Engine, and then, then you just kind of cut to it. Um, that doesn't have quite the same dimensionality, but it, and especially if the cameras are locked, you can make up, make that work. Um, most of the success that we've had is with green screen where we're comping those in the post and someone's in front of green. Um, but the, the issue is, is that you really have to get green, right? So if you're going to use green screen to do this, don't, don't do it unless you're using, I mean, I, I recommend an Ultimat. An Ultimat is the way to, to derive that alpha channel. I don't think there's anything less than an Ultimat that does hair very well. And it drives me a little little kooky. Uh, it's the math isn't that hard. I, I, I don't understand why so many keyers are so bad because the, the basic uh, channel operations to do a good key are relatively simple. Um, but Ultimate seems to be the only one that does it well. Uh, go ahead, Charles, and then Jonas. 
yeah outside of an led wall the only option you have is a green screen with a lot of trackers the problem that you're going to run into very very quickly is that your lighting between your subject and your background once you pump it in is not going to match because an led wall is actually used like you saw in the mandalorian it's used as a light source from the environment so it's trying to replicate that and for you to do that on a green screen we have found there's always a deviation we can't get the edging right it's always a problem so outside of an led wall go green screen but know that that's a issue that you're going to run into very quickly yeah yeah and, and some of the way that you can get some of that done in the comp is using a uh you know promist kind of filter around them so you're doing edge you're basically pulling the back the digital background around the edges and so um so we'll we'll do a lot of those comps uh to to do that and so you you basically derive a hard edge and a lot of them will have these kinds of uh it's not promist i, I misspoke there but it's a, and i just can't think of the name that we used to call it but it basically will bring some of that environment around them and 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 uh corrupt the edges with the background colors it's not really that accurate but and you when you notice it you'll see it a lot if you watch star wars episode one we used it too much and so you'll see a lot of things that look like it's kind of glowing around them uh to to kind of pull them back into the into the scene but that's one way that you can kind of get around some of that a uh, distance to the green screen wall makes a big difference uh you you if you're going to do an unreal engine background my recommendation is a minimum of 10 feet to the wall which means that that wall has to the green screen wall has to be relatively large because the, remember that that's a huge green source and it's going to cause wraparound of green the closer it is because of the diffuse angle of the light coming down on it so so you need it to be as vertical back to the lens as possible so so those are the things that to kind of think about with uh, a green screen and again you're going to need to track all those cameras which you have to do in either one so led or green screen you're going to need if you're going to move the cameras you need to track them um, there is some uh, telemetry data coming out of the panasonic 150 uh, that um, I haven't seen it pan and tilt, but I have seen it go from position to position accurately. So, so those are other things to kind of think about is getting that data without the trackers um, from that, but I haven't seen it in action. I know that uh, Medio 3 in New York has it and we keep on meaning to bring Damon on. So we'll, we'll try to get him on and talk about it. All right, if you're an educator, please raise your hand, your digital hand and we'll bring you in and we'll do a quick mic checks. So, um, we have a couple people that have already joined. So again, if you're an educator right now, we're going to start right at eight o'clock. Uh, we have uh, David Malin is going to be here talking about uh, CS50 and uh, his journey. Uh, and we'll start off, if you have questions for David specifically, uh, um, go ahead and put those into Mukana. We've got a couple starting. We'll start, we'll open it up with just chatting with David and then we'll uh, go to your questions. So go ahead and start throwing those questions in. And again, for all the educators, go ahead and raise your hand. Uh, I'll be back in just a minute and uh, we'll go ahead and start doing mic checks. All right, thanks. Hey folks, um, you know, you guys know the drill. Uh, please put your first name, last name and location here in Zoom. And on our meters, the goal is to hit negative 24 lefts. Um, let's start off with uh, Dan Huber and then move on to Chris Clark afterwards. Good morning, everyone. I got to find the meters. There they are. I think uh, I got the pile microphone going into the tech rise into uh, my MacBook, and I think I'm a little cold there. Yeah, bump up two or three dB, please. There's two or three, and I'll retest, but the meters moved. There they are. A little bit more up. There's a little one more up, and I think I'm about there. So that's a good check. Thank you, Chris. And then the Tony Mopey after. Good morning from Tempe, Arizona. Happy to see your smiling faces and hear your dulcet voices. How's that look, Mickey? Uh, just a, a DB or two up, Chris. Thank you. You want another four seconds of uh, <clears throat> beautiful dulcet tones from me? How's it looking? Uh, one, one more click up and you should be right there. Thank you very much, right. Tony, and then Aaron afterwards. Greetings today from metropolitan Atlanta. Hello, everyone. I am coming in today with a pile mic into the ATEM Mini Pro into the Mac Mini, and I'm using the Video 360 camera. Hey, uh, Tony, on your ATEM, just uh, give us one click down on your level, which should be about a 3 dB of adjustment. That is one click down. It's cloudy Sorry, I think day that's here. That's a good check. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Tony. Aaron and the John Edelson. 
Good morning from Boston, where it's finally spring and it's going to be 70 degrees today. So thank goodness for small miracles. That's a great check, Aaron. Thank you, John. And then Steve Cutton. Good morning or good evening or good afternoon from beautiful Monterey, California. And my new PR30 microphone is now into chain. And I think I'm a little hot, so I'll drop it down. And I think I might be getting closer to where I need to be. How's that, Mickey? Uh, another another DB, DB or two down, John. I got another DB or two down. So did I go too far? Or do you think I'm in the in the pocket? Um, uh, it, it seems like it didn't uh, do that big a, big a change there. So another two clicks down, perhaps. Okay, this is two clicks. Uh, speak much this morning? Two clips down from what we were before. This is my morning voice. This is the first speaking I've done all day. Any chance that automatically adjust microphone volume might have checked itself for some reason? Um, maybe if I moved all this stuff, which I did do, there's a chance that I could have done that. You know, one needs to check one's audio chain. How is this now? This is a test of the emergency broadcasting system. This is just a test. That's it's a great check. Thank you very much. Okay. All right, Steve Cutton and... Uh, all right. Looks Good like uh, Steve is last on the least uh, on, on the oh. last on the list so far. Okay. Hello, everyone from the Bay Area. This is Steve, and I'll be talking about this level. About yeah, this is about not minus twenty four. If I stay at about this level, looks looks in the range. Yes, thank you. Okay. That's a good check. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hey, Dave. Well, I've got a moment here. If there are any educators who are not yet in the Discord, you have 23 minutes left on the Discord link that's in Mukana. Sorry, Dan, you got it. <laughs> David, did I see did I see you at uh, give a great presentation at Zoomtopia? Uh, can't say it was great, but I was indeed there a year ago. It was, ago. I, it was uh, awesome. Actually, yeah, the online one. Thank you for saying so. I actually showed that to lots of uh, teachers here at uh, my university. Uh, I just, uh, I'm the instructional tech technology guy for the, the campus. We have two campuses actually. And then use been using a lot of those uh, tips in there. Oh, glad Good to stuff. hear yeah, it's been fun and a challenge to figure out what's actually possible with Zoom and sort of off-the-shelf tools over the past year, but I've had a lot of opportunities to practice now. These guys help a lot, too. I'm learning something already. This is wonderful that there's so many uh, people in the community out there who, uh, who do things like we want to do. And gals. Sorry. Guys. All the guys. <laughs> and gals. And Aaron, I heard you mention the weather. Now, now I feel like I should be outside instead of with all my windows drawn and the fluorescent lights on or LED lights on here. Yeah, we'll definitely be spending some time outside after this. <laughs> <laughs> David, you're a little advanced because the requirement to be in Discord is that you have a picture of yourself with a white background. So you're there. Nice. Yes, I've been living in this white void all, all year. You and John Stewart, it seems. Are you in the same uh, void? <laughs> I don't have quite the quite as nice a setup, I'm guessing. But uh, we've uh, it's been a it's been a challenge to set this up too. We were actually we started using an Ultimate months ago, and I had a whole green screen set up. And at least uh, I'm doing this from my kitchen, and so it's just too hard to control the ambient lighting uh, from all the windows and such. And uh, so eventually just gave up, flipped the screen around, went to a solid white screen with just lights. Seems to work better. It looks really good. It, it, we never saw that up until Apple did those commercials decades ago because TV was always afraid of white levels. And uh, now we can, the whole world is full of them. Yeah. We can see, we can see how many people have ATEM switchers because all these, all these black screens mean someone is able to tap to fade to black. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, I'll say too, even just with classrooms, when we've been using gallery mode, if anything, it just makes my tile or whoever's using it stand out and pop versus everyone else. So that's, that's had some value too, frankly. Yeah, no, absolutely. All right, everybody, we're going to 
shift gears. Um, and and we thought it'd be fun. Normally, this is just a general Q and A, but we thought it'd be fun to have uh, David M- Mellon. I, 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 M- Malin. I, I've been saying it wrong all week. It was Milan. I wanted to call it Milan. It's Malin. So David Malin is uh, uh, is uh, joining us here from Harvard University. And uh, David, it's it's really great to watch what you've been doing uh, at Harvard. Uh, how did you how did you get started? How did this begin? Ah, it's, uh, I was thinking back on the, the history, actually. So back in 1999, I started teaching at Harvard's Con- Extension School, which is the continuing ed program, and had the f- uh, fortune to be uh, an instructor for my very own course called Computer Science E1, Understanding Computers and the Internet. So not so much a computer science class, but an introduction to technology more generally. Uh, and it was one of the first classes through the school being offered via distance education, Uh, And this was at the time, um, just on the heels of our having recorded the class with via UHS early on, but we uh, quickly switched to mini DV tape among the limitations back then where uh, I I had to stop at like the 60 minute mark to take a break because we were literally out of tape. Uh, I remember fondly early in the days, we used to have one of our teaching fellows operate the camera on a tripod and and an arm. And I swear we have one video where all of a sudden the camera goes uh, when the teaching fellow, an undergraduate at the time, fell asleep uh, at at the helm. Uh, But long story short, things evolve there. I work wonderfully with an amazing, talented technical team, some of whom are here today uh, to give us a bit of an overview of our setup as well. Uh, And it's evolved nowadays into the course I teach uh, at large called CS50, which is the Undergraduate Introduction to Computer Science. And over the past several years, have we upgraded from that old uh, VHS-based camera uh, to experimenting with 21 by 9 aspect ratios, 4K, virtual reality with some Nokia Ozos a few years ago. And now we've been focusing all the more, of course, on, on Zoom and synchronicity and not just aspiring to create a high quality asynchronous experience, but synchronous as well. So really excited to be here and to uh, learn something ourselves along the way. What, what, was your, what was your opinion of the, we, we had a lot of Ozos and we did a, a lot of events with in 360. What was your uh, opinion of that? It was fun at the time. It was a novelty. I think the novelty wore off. Uh, I think the reality of today's headsets, whether Google Cardboard or something fancier, is just no one wants that on their head for two hours. Uh, in the context of a classroom, it just precludes you from doing too much that's useful in the real world, like using your laptop or trying something out. And I think the resolution too just wasn't there. Even on a nice retina to screen with your iPhone up against your face, there's just still not enough pixels there. And so we were experimenting, for instance, with digitally in to uh, injecting like what the content on my laptop screen was because the Ozo itself could not capture it in high enough fidelity to even see what was on the screen. So it was nice to sort of be among the first trying it, but after two years, we put it aside. From an education perspective, what do you see are the major trends? From an education perspective on the... Like as you work on these, a lot of times while we're working, you know, when we're doing a show or we're doing this show or other shows, we start to see threads, threads going into the future of like, oh, I can see where this is going to go. You know, or I can see what we're, how we're going to do this. Uh, for you, what are the things that you're starting to just, you can see coming and they're not, they may not be quite here yet, but just from the fact that you're doing it all the time, you start, they start to uh, present themselves. I would say that... I think there's long been a mindset of a course being on campus or online. And I think there hasn't been enough bracing of, it doesn't have to be one or the other. Indeed, even I with as online as CS50 is in several forms, I don't think of it as an online course per se. We just use the right technology for the job. And we always keep in mind that sometimes our students will be in the seats in the physical room with us, but we will always have students elsewhere. And so I think we design courses really with this hybrid mode in mind, which is probably the descriptor these days but it's not really an either or. And I don't think that we've clung to more traditional paradigms, at least at the college level, that students need to be present in order to be learning. Indeed, even among our on-campus students, we have long allowed, encouraged students to engage with the course as they see fit, not necessarily doing things uh, in seats in a traditional way. And and Ian's here as well. He's he's, he's coming in from from, uh, the CS50. Uh, you're, You're coming in from the stage that you normally use. Is that correct? Yeah, so this is a, a, a little green screen studio we have in our office that we set up uh, over the past year to do a little bit of distance learning 
Um, for Zoom sessions particularly, it's got three large monitors, so I can see the gallery view using Zoom rooms spread out and a few other competence monitors, and a small camera setup. But behind me, you'll see a center stage where we normally host CS50, which with in healthier times would have about a thousand students in the seats, and we would use a sort of red cinema uh, um, setup, uh, shooting lot, you know, live in, in the space there. And, and you have a thousand people. Did you were you at that time when things were healthier? Were you streaming uh, that out as well, or, or recording? Yeah, so we we uh, both right. So we would uh, cut a live show that would get streamed to YouTube and Facebook and and other destinations, and then we would post produce you know with a short turnaround, sort of the the finished product, cutting out breaks and you know anything like that. Um, and then shipping that in 4K and a bunch of smaller flavors, um, keeping in mind that some of our audience don't have the bandwidth to download a 4K you know, video at the time and that accessibility is kind of the core principle. Yeah, and it's funny, awesome. our, our live streaming tradition kind of began fairly organically about six, seven years ago now, some students across the river in Cambridge uh, at Harvard Business School wanted to be able to take the class and the logistics are such that there wasn't enough time in the day to physically walk the mile and a half or two miles to the classroom. So we decided to start experimenting with live streaming from this space that Ian has there, Sanders Theater, across the river. And after that, it was really very... Uh, straightforward to like wired it up to Facebook, uh, to YouTube, uh, now LinkedIn, and just make it broadly available to an open courseware audience as well, which has become uh, very much a mission as well for us. Yeah, I know that my own my own jumping into this was we, we have a school in Rwanda doing media production and trying to figure out a way to teach a class from my office to, in Rwanda became the push of almost all the gear that I have is just trying to figure out how to make that connection actually work. So it is it is an interesting thing. Do you see a point where I guess I guess the question is, do you do you have trouble in a hybrid environment having the online audience be on, at, at an even level with the folks that are in the room? Because we're naturally drawn to looking at folks that are in the room as opposed to a camera. I think for my part, no. I think the reality is once the class is as large as it is with some 800 plus students in the room, I'm not making eye contact with all of the students individually. And right. I'm probably making eye contact as frequently as I might with the individual cameras in the room itself. And I think we've tried to create the experience of being in or feeling like you are in that theatrical hall, in which case I'm not aspiring to create the more intimate feel that we might have here where you and I and everyone are looking at and talking with each other seemingly one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. We have so many questions coming in. I think that we're going to go ahead and jump jump into them. They're stacking up quickly. Uh, Bill, what do we what do we have? Stephen Kimbrough in Berkeley, California, starts with the first one. How many TAs are used, and what are their backgrounds? How do you find them? Yeah, for the undergraduate course at the college, we have about again eight hundred plus students, as well as two hundred students through Harvard Extension School. Um, for that audience, we have a teaching team of about eighty uh, court teaching fellows, as we call them, or TFs and course assistants or CAs. Um, almost all of them are undergraduates themselves, former students who took CS50 and perhaps one or more other computer science courses at Harvard in semesters prior. Uh, and so that's actually been a rich part of the course's history now since its inception and at Harvard within CS and also math is it very common for undergraduates to be teaching the sections. And so they help teach smaller scale versions within the class called sections or recitations. Next question. Jesse Mills in San Francisco Bay Area and here on the panel right now, how would David incorporate a second remote teacher into a Zoom room based class with his current setup? That's a good question. Um, I think right now, and Ian can speak to some of this too, and we brought a bunch of photos and uh, schematics if folks are interested as well. Um, we've been relying for synchronicity in recent months on Zoom or Zoom room setup, where we have three large screen TVs, and then we have one of my colleagues, Rongxin Liu, for instance, who's here with us too, controlling things on the Zoom's iPad controller software so that we can spotlight either me or someone else or the like. So I think if we were to do that, we would use Zoom these days. I would be using Zoom rooms. They would connect with the typical Zoom client, and we would rely on spotlighting them to draw attention to and capture their feed almost full screen for the final recording. Next Ian, question. feel free to interject oh, with good, any of this. Good. Ian, did you have anything to add no, there? No, that's, that's precisely it. So we, um, we actually were able to integrate two different Zoom meetings for the last year's lectures, where we had uh, the Harvard College students and our online audience being able to talk across meetings and into the same space. So it's very complex, but it's possible. 
yeah, our, our whole system that we run on our shows is, is up to nine rooms all, all tied together because it's the only way we can keep track of everybody's audio. So we can we have talk back to each person and then we can cross link them all. But it is, as you said, a lot of hardware. Uh, next question. Actually, it's a Jesse again. He has a follow up here with for the three screen zoom room setup David has set up. Are the three screens always on gallery view or does he use spotlighting, pinning and breakout rooms so forth? Ian, do you want to take that one and perhaps even show a photo when appropriate? Yeah, so they are um, usually all on gallery view. Um, I'll just skip through a couple of these to where we are here. Um, but we will have a single confidence monitor that can be speaker view, or and we are able to pin to any one of the three Zoom rooms. We use an iPad controller to allow us access to pin uh, any participant to a specific monitor. So we try to keep the eye line the same. We have three cameras in this, this space that we can cut to for different situations. If there's sort of a live demo over here or some whiteboarding or something like that. Um, so we'll move the pin speaker around depending on where the camera angle is. What cameras are you using? Uh, right now they're a7s2s. That's great. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's great. Uh, uh, go ahead, Sky. I notice you have a long lens. Do you care about the backdrop, the the rack folk? I mean, the bokeh, the, the depth of field? Or I notice you've got an infinity wall for David. So is it irrelevant what lens you have um it's not irrelevant i you know, it but uh we're sort of mm -hmm. space confined um depth wise in in our location um so we tend to just sort we and the lighting is a little bit problematic this is not the most ideal space to set up the studio it's actually like our uh old office space this used to be the family room where we would have a couch and a tv and have communal lunches and things like that which we sort of co-opted for a studio so the ceilings are a little bit low and the depth um is a little bit short so, or shallow, so, you, so we just okay. Go ahead. I was going to say, so you would have a, a wider depth of field if you could, if you would, for your lensing. Sure. Yeah, I think so because that gives you the opportunity to sort of get up and and move into the space a little bit, um, where you're sort of shortened up right now. We only have like three or four feet forward and backwards. Go ahead, Jesse, and then we'll move on. So this particular class always has a sort of AV assistant assisting the teacher with the uh, pinning and, and such in the Zoom room, and is that the case? It is. I think this is one of the biggest limitations or frustrations with Zoom right now. It's just not designed, I think, with these sort of educational use cases or uh, uh, in autonomous teacher in mind. And yes, right now we rely on humans to make up for limitations in the software. Next question. Peter Collins in Vail, Arizona, says uh, in 2019, CS50 encouraged Harvard students to attend the live lectures. What was the motivation and what effect did it have on the students? Will you return to that effort when live attendance is possible or has, S uh, has 2020 changed your view of things? Yeah, my own thinking on attendance has evolved over time. I think I've very, long been very libertarian about this, encouraging students, allowing students to decide for themselves, do they want to physically attend the lectures in the space that Ian showed the photograph of earlier? Do they prefer to watch online or asynchronously on demand? The reality is even with simple, puristic, uh, simple features like pausing, rewinding, fast forwarding, changing the playback speed, linking to related resources on YouTube or any medium, it just allows for a better experience in many ways educationally than being fixed in a theater for two hours where all of us are constantly zoning out here or there and therefore falling behind. With that said, I think I've become a little more focused in recent past couple of years now on helping students help themselves. Uh, we typically have a plurality of first year students, so new to college, new to the freedom that that allows them. And I think we found too often that students weren't optimizing in their best interests. And even though they might decide to watch online or say they would, they wouldn't necessarily, that would then have a cascading effect on their preparedness or lack thereof for our sections led by those teaching fellows. That would result in more questions at office hours, as we call them too, one-on-one -on -one opportunities for help. And so there was a significant operational cost and I think educational downside to students just not staying on top of things. So nowadays we do expect students, at least just prior to COVID, expect students to attend lectures, but it's specifically to help them structure their week so they don't fall behind in an otherwise very fast moving course. Next question. Jonas Dottel, Reutling in Germany is up with, what are your experiences with the online Zoom study rooms? And he has a link there. Online Have you worked with Zoom. those? Yeah, it could be a uh, virtual study room. I'm just clicking the link here myself. I'm not familiar with this. Is it possible to ellaborate a little bit? With the I think they're new to all of us. Yeah. <laughs> He's um, all like uh, study rooms. Uh, uh, 
John, yeah. I say earlier, I think he's John. Do you out. know anything about about the study rooms? Um, well, I, what I can say is there have been a lot of people who have set up groups or what used to be, you know, study groups that are traditional. And so this is a way of being able to expand that uh, study group concept. You're in a class, you got three friends. Hey, what did that professor really say? Gotcha. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll keep this tab open for later because we're constantly in search of good solutions to problems like these in both healthy and, and less so times. I would say that um, we have looked at pretty much every ed tech over the past year that has suddenly sprung up that integrates video into the education space. Um, we have largely stuck with Zoom in large part because it just does video great and better than most any uh, WebRTC based solution nowadays. It works much better internationally, we found for students all over the world. And even though it itself is not particularly well optimized for things beyond the usual breakout groups and the like, um, I would say that we during COVID have focused on offering our office hours in the form of tutorials, which are by appointment, where we have only three students at a time maximally convened with one of our course assistants or teachers teaching fellows just to kind of help manage things. We have avoided replicating what we typically do on campus where we might have dozens, even 100 plus students in one space with the teaching staff roaming around, largely because there's just too much clunkiness right now with the software. There's too much time wasted between changing breakout groups and the like. So I don't know this particular tool or website, but I will take a closer look if it helps solve exactly that for us. Go ahead, Michael. Yeah, um, so this, this comes a little bit from uh, conversations we've had in the past, but uh, I know when you talked about office hours and trying appointments uh, in in the uh, physical uh, world, um, you mentioned that some people wouldn't show up, and I'm curious if you've had differing patterns uh, of people, you know, missing or not attending office hours now that they're virtual, now that they can sort of just join uh, from you know from their bedroom, so to speak. Yeah, for office hours or tutorials, I don't think we've really seen a difference. There's still about there's still some small percentage of students that simply don't show, which is unfortunate because there's an operational cost there too, literally losing the slot that another student might have taken. Uh, with lectures, which is, of course is a different format, we encouraged students this past fall to watch or attend live, but the reality of time zones and such was that that was just not a realistic expectation, like it might have been a year prior. Uh, and so many students did watch uh, on demand afterward. For the sections led by the teaching fellows, we do expect a synchronous participation, particularly with cameras on, at least in those smaller scale classes. But the larger the class is, the less uh, it's less feasible or necessary it's been to sort of expect those social norms by the uh, nick justice is next and by the way for for david and, and ian uh, nick is in unreal <laughs> for uh, coming to coming to coming to you from drexel all right go, go ahead nick oh your uh your mic is your mic is uh muted there no it was so close. We were so close. It all it all worked except for that last little bit. So Looks that, amazing. That's, that's how they get you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, go ahead, uh, John. So the camera on and camera off has been a big discussion here. What's your discussion or thoughts around having students have their camera on all the time, part of the time? For me, I think it boils down to class size. For lectures this past fall where we were using Zoom in, the, in a theater and I did have the ability to communicate with students via TVs that Zoom rooms in the space. It wasn't necessary, I think, for all 800 students, for instance, to have their cameras on, because the reality is I would only ever see or interact with a small subset of those. However, for our sections, for our tutorials, which let's say are typically 23 to 20 students, there I think it's important. I mean, to me personally, I think pedagogically, I think for us uh, interpersonally, and so I, we've typically drawn the line at the class size. Once we start creeping above 50, I think we worry a little less about that. But for smaller, more intimate classes, um, we have pretty much decreed when possible for students, if their home circumstances permit, to indeed keep their, their cameras on. Uh, going back to Nick, Nick, did you get the audio sorted? Yeah, I think I'm fixed now. Yeah. Hello. Yep. Um, so I just back to the idea of the study rooms and, and such. Uh, one of the things that happened organically at our university, I teach at Drexel, um, is that the students have been really leaning into discord because it blends both asynchronous threads of conversation as well as synchronous video chat. And so our computer graphics students have a SIGGRAPH group, and that's gone in, into Discord. And so students will have monitored lab hours. 
dollars, basically, where upperclassmen grad students are just declared available there and undergrads will connect. And I've actually gotten to a mode where I've encouraged students to use Discord during my lectures, during my classes. Like you guys can talk there without me monitoring you like you can have your organic conversations you could talk together um you know i want you guys to to work together so that um you know you've you're still getting that co-students those fellow students interactions going on and that doesn't need me so yeah. anyway just and share. david do you do use discord or other platforms for that kind of conversation Unofficially, we might. We don't we don't use Discord for that use case. We do use it with our open courseware audience, though not so much for video. Our hands are often tied by FERPA concerns and privacy constraints. And the reality is trying to stick with one or few tools is just a lot easier to navigate on campus and certainly at, at scale. Yep. Next question. Moving on, Jesse Mills is back from San Francisco with what are the various forms of hybrid that have been tested and you have found successful? Yeah, let me think back here. So years ago, back in the beginning, I think all of the courses I taught and the team produced with me were very asynchronous for our online students. And this included not just the open courseware audience, certainly, but through Harvard Extension School, where they would follow the same schedule in terms of homework assignments being due and so forth. But the students experience was entirely asynchronous and they would even watch recordings of sections over the past several years pre-covid we did transition to adobe connect followed by zoom to offer our extension students synchronous opportunities not so much for lectures but for sections led by the teaching fellows so there's an opportunity for q a and review and so forth and then most recently to our comment earlier about live streaming to facebook and youtube and across the river have we made the lectures synchronously available to students as well and now during covid those same students can even interact live thanks to Zoom rooms and such. I think that the reality for our many of our online students, at least through Harvard Extension, where they're often adults with full-time jobs, families, and so forth, is that asynchronicity is actually a plus. So while it was originally a technical limitation, it was a feature nonetheless, given that they could time shift and learn when their schedule allowed. I think the perhaps interesting balance of those two worlds has been a program that I and CS50's team here today have been involved with through Harvard Business School, which is actually an exec ed program where we did pre-produce certain content that students are expected to watch on demand over the course of the week, complete a homework assignment, but then we convene once a week for two months for 90 minutes in the evening via Zoom where those classes might be 20 to 60 students, all of whose cameras are on. It's more of a discussion style class which is meant to review and go deeper into some of those topics. And I'd like to say that might be actually the best of both worlds, factor out of the instruction, anything that is perhaps the densest, the most technically sophisticated so that students really can work through it at their own pace and repeat and rewind and fast forward, but reserve the synchronicity then for things that are more interactive, more spontaneous. I think that's been a really nice balance when it comes to the hybrid model. Next question. John Idelson, our own from Monterey, who's here often. Uh, faculty in the sciences seem to embrace the technology in their classes more than faculty in the arts before COVID-19. Do you see a difference now since we've all been locked down? I think we shall see. It's hard to distinguish people right now just because we're all doing sort of the same thing via Zoom. I think it's probably been a net positive that so many faculty from all disciplines have been exposed to all the more technologies, whether it's web stuff, whether it's video stuff or the like, because I think in among circles on campus, among faculty I know in the arts and humanities, social sciences, for instance, that might not necessarily be as STEM focused as we are. I think there's just long been an unawareness of like what you can do or just how hard it might be to do something. So while there's long been, I think, curiosity, even in less technical circles, COVID's definitely been a forcing function for people to figure out what can I do online, what is easy, what is hard to do. And so I think in a year, it'll be interesting to see just what kinds of hybrid practices, digital practices, other fields uh, preserve and hang on to. Next question. Peter Collins in Vail, Arizona says, what is the Yale students' experience of CS50? Do they have any live lectures or all online? And is CS50 at Yale as successful as at Harvard for students? I would, I, I'm hopeful so. And indeed, this will be year six or seven for us now of the collaboration. Ian, do you want to speak to what the Yale students' experience has been like, particularly via video? Yeah. So um, I believe that Yale students would convene on campus and watch uh, the live stream synchronously. Um, so they would get together and form in their, in their sort of class community and uh, watch in a classroom. 
And then at a couple times a year, we will actually travel down to Yale. We'll move the entire production down to campus and we'll shoot a live lecture there and stream it back to Harvard. So sort of flip-flopping the orientation um, and, and making some time and space for the community down there. And then I know that we often will um, travel down for office hours. I know David, you go down on the train sometimes and we will hire photographers, um, undergrad photographers to photograph their community events so that they get blended in with the photography and the media production that happens around the Harvard events as well. So it is a really kind of um, um, deep integration um, with of the communities, even though they're very separate. We try to try to bridge that gap for them using this technology. And the Go funny ahead. thing there too, in terms of features, originally we indeed did have a start of term, middle of term, end of term live lecture at Yale. And we essentially saw exponential decay in in-person attendance because we had also acclimated so many students to watching online. So we've since whittled that down to really just doing the first lecture live at Yale to convene everyone together, get everyone onto the same page. Thereafter, though, the Yale students have, have statistically preferred to watch everything online, even when we're down there in New Haven, although I do go down for more interpersonal interactions for office hours and meals with the students and staff and the like. Um, but I can say statistically, too, there's been no difference in the performance of either demographic. And in fact, this helped reinforce our conjecture in Cambridge that there really isn't a causal effect between attending class in person and doing well in the class, at least in the context of large scale lectures. And so we had essentially a control group and experimental group that bore that out over the past few years. Go ahead, Michael. Yeah, um, I was gonna ask sort of when, when someone's watching that live stream, uh, is there any interaction that happens with you or anyone else sort of running the show? Or is it purely sort of a, a you know, watching experience that happens there? Up until this year, it was asynchronous. We were streaming unidirectionally to YouTube that was then embedded in the course's website for students. Uh, this year, though, they were all welcome to engage synchronously via Zoom rooms. And what's behind Ian, in fact, is exactly that. One Zoom room set up on the side for our Harvard and Yale students so that they could interact and be with each other. And then also on the left was a second Zoom room for the broader uh, global audience that folks around the world could tune into as well without hitting caps on either room. That's great. We also Next have question. a couple of TFs um, who will jump into the YouTube comments and Facebook comments and sort of answer questions and moderate. And it's very informal and it's who's available at the moment, but we have some people who, who spend some time doing that. So there is a level of engagement, even if it's um, not from David on stage. Next question. Roscoe Jones here on the panel from uh... New York, uh, you've gone from three cameras to a single camera. Was this to increase eye contact with students? And are there other angles that you use for variety or just for better framing? Do you change David's close up, zoom in or out, for example, during a class? Um, so actually when we film lectures, um, so in the space behind me, this is the Loeb Theater at the um, ART in, in Boston. We have six cameras. Um, so we have six red epics that we use. Two of them are uh, manned cameras. One is a robotic uh, head doing just sort of a ping pong with a move that we create um, and a couple other effects. So there's a fixed wide and a fixed green screen camera for uh, comping in code behind David. And so that show is cut live um, and we will adjust the framing based off what is happening on stage just like you would in any other sort of live show. In this space right here, we actually have several camera angles. Like we could cut to the wide shot right now. So this is sort of gonna jump a little bit, but this gives you a little bit of context. You can see the lighting and space on the floor. So if I want it to be out here, I could be out here gesturing. And we have a tight camera right there for um, whiteboards and things like that. So we will vary the camera angle depending on what is happening. I'm a little bit more sedentary. So I'm just gonna sit here and enjoy things, but yes. Great. Next question. Oh, I'm sorry, John Ellison, before we go to the next question. Have you done anything with auto tracking cameras and or do you have a true camera operator? Um, so we use camera operators for um, uh, the live shows. We were running like really big zoom lenses and stuff. They just re require um, attention. We've used a few automated camera tracking tools. None of them have been really um, that great so far. Um, Part of it is like a lot of the motors that get put in them just can't hammer the camera, handle the camera weights. And so they fatigue or they judder and it gets like kind of crazy. Um, so we would love to have something like that because there would be spaces that we could make self service at that point um, that would be sort of really functional. But right now 
Um, they're either fixed camera positions like they are here or they're man cameras um, in, in the seats. When you talk about self-service spaces, are you planning to build more spaces like this during this interim time before you get back to face-to-face? -face? Yeah, I think it, well, it's always a consideration. You know, if the more opportunities you have to create a space that, that someone can sort of step into and experiment and engage with distance education, the more creative ideas will come out of it. So I think that there's a lot of movement on campus about how to take a space that may be used in person and flip it into something that could be used by, you know, as distance education. So, because a lot of space has just been sitting empty for the past year. It's been a really strange experience here. Next question. Okay, and, I, and Roscoe, I apologize for moving you from California to New York. Um, Michael Ball's up next at Stanford. What's the puzzle day look like in a virtual context? Yeah, so we've long had this tradition of CS50 puzzle day, which is like a puzzle hunt in the spirit of MIT and elsewhere where we hand students a PDF or a printout of eight or 10 puzzles, which are really logic problems that they are then challenged to solve uh, in groups of three or four. We created this or we started doing this some 10 years or so uh, on campus, particularly at the start of the semester to send the message to students and prospective students that computer science really isn't about programming as they might have perceived in high school, but it really is about problem solving more generally. Generally, and there's many opportunities for collaboration and collectively uh, solving these same problems. Uh, in COVID times, we moved it online last fall. We, it became indeed a PDF that students could download. We had actually been doing that for the past several years anyway via CS50X, which is the MOOC or edX version of the class, where we've had several thousand students around the world uh, participating in the same event. Uh, and I can actually give you a link if you'd like a full debrief. I'll paste this into the chat on Makana. Uh, where we have some wonderful submissions of photographs and the questions themselves, the solutions themselves, if you're curious to uh, try your hand at the same. Oops, you're Sorry, on I, I, I was muted. Uh, go ahead, uh, Mike, Michael. Yeah, um, I guess one of the part of the question is, uh, and I guess you could talk maybe about like project demo day too, but in the past, you know, some of the engagement around CS50 has been the excitement to an extent, the over the topness that happens uh, with some of these events. And I'm wondering how how you feel like if that's affected the student experience. Um, I'm sure that, you know, students understand that these things can't happen, uh, you know, uh, right now in the same way. But I'm wondering if you've gotten sort of, you know, any feedback or any suggestion that, uh, you know, the level of engagement that they have is, is different with, with any of these events or if it affects, you know, positively or negatively their participation anywhere else in the course. Yeah, it's a really good question and something we thought quite a bit about um, going into this past year. We do indeed have these traditions that are somewhat unusual in that we focus not only on production value in the class, but also on these community oriented, these cultural traditions within the courses ecosystem, uh, where we have not only CIS50 Puzzle Day at the start of the semester, we have an event that is, as Michael notes, an end of semester exhibition of students' final projects called the CIS50 Fair. We have a hackathon a week prior to that where students spend 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. in a large space on campus working on those same final projects, which are software projects of their own. And then we even have students uh, over to lunch at a nearby restaurant, about 50 or so students a week, just to chat with me, teaching fellows, course assistants, alumni, friends from industry over more casual Q&A. And we lost almost all of that over the past year. Um, we have approximated those things that we can. For instance, I just pasted into the Makana chat uh, the 2019 version of the CS50 Fair, which was very healthier times, as you can see from the hundreds of people in the space where students would exhibit on laptops their final projects. Ian and uh, the team who's also here today, Tara and Arturo and Andrew, would walk around filming and interviewing students so we uh, capture those for posterity. We moved all of those kinds of things to YouTube. Students had always been submitting YouTube videos. And so per the other link I pasted in Makana, you can see just a sort of virtual gallery which is by no means the same, um, but it's at least a way for students, especially future students, to browse what some of their successors, uh, predecessors have done. With the lunches, we tried to approximate that via Zoom, but honestly, it, it fizzled over time. Not many students wanted to just hang out with me or members of the staff or alumni just to chat over yet another Zoom during the day, which was quite understandable. So I think educationally, Things went very well over the past year, and I think that's because we've had so many years of practice and training through Harvard Extension, OpenCourseWare, and the MOOC ecosystem. But I think it was less fun for, for myself, I think for students, because we lost a lot of those community aspects. And we're looking forward to them coming back, but it definitely wasn't quite the same. 
Next question. Peter Collins in Vail, Arizona is back with David has two laptops on the table he does his live coding from. When, yet, when you put the code behind him via side green screen, perhaps, you see only one. How are you removing the second laptop from the video? Ian, do you want to feel that one? <laughs> um, sure. So we actually, uh, we have an A10 Mini in the lectern that um, David can switch between his slides, um, the code, or any other laptop. Sometimes there'll be a surface for drawing or something like that on stage. And we take those feeds independently into the, the our sw video switcher in the back, which is just an A10 II ME, ME2. And we can then uh, secondarily cut what, whichever one into the live feed as we want. So. And to be fair, you're seeing the post-produced version. Uh, what happens live sometimes when David forgets to hit the button on the ATAM is I suddenly hear someone doing this way in the back of the room, which is my reminder that I screwed up and need to fix it. <laughs> All right, next question. Ron H. in West Missy Michigan says, David, in the K-12 space, we're finding that very few girls and people of color are interested in coding. No real data on why this is a thing. And what might you have found in higher ed that might help us get more of our kids interested? Yeah, I think the earlier we can provide students with opportunities to explore computer science and programming, the better. I think the earlier that those experiences are, not unlike our puzzle day, collaborative and social in nature, and not just a student at an at a, at a isolated terminal, head down, sort of trying to write some code themselves. I do think that helps. We have found over the past several years within CS50, especially particularly this same gender imbalance that is is all too on, all too common, unfortunately, whereby even during the course's first week, which is called shopping week at Harvard, where students can attend before they even register for any classes, that even in that first day, we're already seeing that gender skew where maybe 30%, 40% of the students in the class might be women at that point, and those numbers stay. So we don't tend to lose uh, one demographic or the other over time or after that first week. But this was one of the reasons that we began to focus on what we call CS50 AP, which I'll paste a link into the chat here too. This is an adaptation of the course's curriculum for high school teachers and students that they can either take if a student on their own through edX for college board credit if they take the end of year exam, or that a teacher can adopt or adapt for their own classroom in the spirit of open courseware. Since we realized that the earlier we could connect with students, whether it's via our curriculum or something from Berkeley or any of the number of other opportunities out there, code.org too among them, I think the more we can change fundamentally that, that pipeline. Um, on campus, it's certainly a focus, but we've also tried to collaborate with others so that before they get to college campuses, they've not been turned off to the field, uh, but rather are all the more excited to dive in more deeply at the university level. Go ahead, Michael. Uh, yeah, I guess sort of a, a two-part question. Um, since, well, you got to CS50 AP, so I was gonna ask you about that. Um, on campus, do you have a, a pre-CS50, um, you know, for the other people, a CS0 type course? And I wonder if you have thoughts on that. And then with CS50 AP, has that, sh have you done any shifts to provide a sort of a different virtual experience for those teachers. Obviously, you know, we know the setup that our high school teachers are working with is quite different <laughs> than what you or I both have, but, um, you know, has that changed in sort of the assignments that you've given, the the direction of content, anything like that? Um, I will say, you know, from the Berkeley end, that's also something that we've struggled with too, so. Yeah, absolutely. It's funny you mentioned the first question about a pre-CS50 or CS0 style material. Um, Ian and the team actually with a colleague of ours, Brian Yu, just finished producing what we've called CS50S, which is CS50's introduction to programming using Scratch. Uh, which is a graphical language from MIT's Media Lab, typically used with younger audiences, but we've used it within CS50 at the college level for some 15 years now, albeit only in the course's first week. What Brian and the team have wonderfully done is kind of stretch that material out at a more um, uh, comfortable pace for students who just want to get more comfortable with programming fundamentals like loops and conditions and events and so forth. And so that at their leisure this summer, for instance, they can take this course, quote unquote, via open courseware or freely on edX or the like, and just feel all the more comfortable coming in, particularly if they haven't had as much STEM background, they didn't have any CS opportunities or the like. So this is one step in that direction. Um, on the other front, in terms of teachers, even though what we do on camera and on campus does tend to emphasize production value, pretty much all of the demonstrations we do back in the day, and even now to some extent, 
can be reduced to just supplies that you have around in your own kitchen or classroom. Um, I frequently just use sheets of paper that granted nowadays we've tended to digitize or make a little more animated, but most any educational demonstration we do, I originally did and sometimes do still do with paper cups or anything physical that you don't even need to buy off of Amazon. You can just grab it from the cupboard. And I do think that's been important just to make sure that teachers do have access to the same teaching resources, even if the packaging up of it isn't quite the same as we're fortunate to do at the university level. Next question. Apologies to Michael for moving him to universities earlier. Dan Hubert of Erie, Pennsylvania says, do you prefer teaching remote or giving a remote presentation on how to teach remotely? Example Zoomtopia. Uh, yeah, that was very meta. Um, teaching remotely. So I prefer when we have at least some number of student, uh, students locally. Um, it was much more fun in healthy times just to have the ambient noise of an audience, the spontaneous questions where there's no latency because of Zoom and so forth, the, the laughter, the, the coughing, well, not so much the coughing, but, uh, but just the, the noise that you feel where you feel like you're all part of the shared experience. Like a lot of that is muted, at least to me on Zoom. We have experimented with adding some ambient house noise into the theater and the like, but it tended to get a little picked up by the mic, so we stopped doing that. So I hands down prefer an in-person audience, but honestly, because of tools like Zoom and, and gallery mode and the like, that there's enough of a... Um, recollection of those times and Ian the the photograph he still has behind him the fact that I was able to have some uh, let's see 25 70 150 faces looming down at me in the lecture hall albeit in tv form was enough to trick my brain at least into thinking it was like 80 percent of an approximation of what it was I can say personally we have pre-produced some of our courses content with completely without an audience just colleagues of mine like Ian on stage and me I think I do a much worse job. I tend to get caught up in my head because now I'm trying to get every word perfectly because I don't quite have that same social pressure of just not being able to stop and restart and fix things. So I, somewhere in between there is ideal for me, having some audience, whether it's virtual or physical, but not just doing things in a studio, which I don't tend to enjoy. And for me, at least, I don't think it yields as good results. Next question. Uh, Jesse Mills in San Francisco is back with which NUC does specifically does CS50 use for the Zoom rooms? Ian, do you have our model number handy? Ew, Tara just texted it to me. So we use um, the Intel NUC 8 business mini desktop computer. There you go. That answers the question. Next question. Sam Greenwood in Toronto is up next with is there a way for a non Harvard student to take the synchronous course? Uh, through Harvard Extension School, yes. Uh, and in fact, let me just put a link into the Makana chat here, which will give you links to how you can take the class. Uh, through Open Courseware 2, we have in the past few years adopted the habit of live streaming all of the course's lectures, now via Zoom, via which anyone in the world without tuition can also tune in. Uh, what you don't get, of course, from that experience is the ability to get human feedback from the teaching fellows to attend sections, which are by design more small scale. So it depends what the student uh, might like, but the extension school would be the uh, traditional answer to that question. Next question. Michael Ball at Berkeley, there I said it right. What does his <laughs> what does interactivity with students look like when in Sanders? How is this shifted when going to Zoom? How different are students' participation patterns when in a Zoom course? Yeah, so in Sanders Theater, we do try, Ian and the team and I, to make students as much a part of the experience as possible as by having volunteers come up on stage as frequently as the topics rather allow for. Uh, the downside of this is that it tends to slow things down. We end up spending more time than is probably educationally necessary to make the point. However, it results ideally in the proverbial memorable moment. So even if we're spending a disproportionate amount of time on one topic, students forever in the audience have that recollection of Michael or someone having gone up on stage, answered some question, done something goofy, made a mistake or gotten something right that tends to stick with students for some time. It was much harder to do that with Zoom, of course. Um, we thought about approximating it by having a colleague of mine, for instance, physically in the theater, playing the role of the student. Ultimately, Harvard's COVID protocols simply didn't even allow for two of us to be on stage so close together, certainly not unmasked, so we abandoned that. 
Um, I ended up playing the role of the student and sort of opening all of the doors on stage and doing more of the props, but that's the first kind of thing that will restore in healthier times. Um, I will say that we did start using uh, tools like Poll Everywhere, um, which is prettier than Zoom's built-in polling. And it also made it possible for us to use two Zoom meetings across meeting IDs and keep them synchronized. Um, it was fun to integrate a little bit of that. Uh, I know some courses have for many years done that either with physical clickers or something virtual, but I, I'd like to think we integrated a little more of that that we could also retain in healthy times just to engage 100% or close to the students instead of just 1% of the students to at least give them a chance to interact. And I can say too, an interesting takeaway was for years in Sanders on campus, we have tried to give everyone in the physical audience an opportunity to answer questions by Slack or the course's discussion forum or the like. And for years, it's been crickets. We always have a teaching fellow there ready to answer the question or vocalize it for me on stage. No one engages, but the chat was so popular within Zoom. And there's something about just that proximity, the fact that it's built in, it is what is foregrounded, and that really seemed to help. So it, trying to preserve that percentage of participation would be amazing. I'm not sure we know how just yet. Go ahead, Michael. Yeah, OK. So I think you just hit on the, the two dynamics that have mirrored my experience, which is text chat pre-COVID is pretty difficult to get right. Uh, and Zoom chat has been uh, at least seemingly quite engaging. Um, and I'm wondering if you've been considering, you know, it's, I know it's the, getting near the end of the term in a way, but uh, what that might look like in the fall. Um, and I guess also I would ask in your current Zoom chat iteration, do you have TFs responding, you know, in stream uh, during lectures or are you watching that or is it just sort of, uh, you know, it's going on? Depends on the scale of the class. In the space that Ian is sitting in front of right now, I did not. Uh, keep an eye on the chat because there were too many students. So Brian or another member of the teaching staff would field most of the questions or Brian, for instance, who was safely in another room with his own camera set up would raise his hand virtually. I would call on Brian who would then vocalize the student's question. For smaller scale classes in like our three TV setup, I'll just keep a, an eye on the chat. Ian, I think alluded to uh, a confidence monitor earlier that I, we, I see some of the chats flying in so long as they're not coming in too quickly. I can say for healthy times, one thing I have been thinking about is for the past few years, we have been live streaming whatever's coming out of my laptop on stage to via YouTube's low latency stream so that students can actually see on their laptops a, a reasonably high fidelity version of what's on stage so that they can even rewind fast forward, can't fast forward, but rewind, pause, screenshot and the like. I think we might toy with the idea of embedding a chat window next to that and maybe even getting rid of the large on-screen projector screen. The first photograph Ian showed of that beautiful space with all of the woodwork, the, the ugliest part of it is the massive old school projector screen that drops down and occludes most of that and isn't the highest quality anyway. I think there's an interesting idea, maybe removing that altogether and forcing students in some sense to have to use their laptops as their own local monitor if a side effect of that would be to put tooling um, in much closer proximity. Might prove a net negative, not sure the Wi-Fi would handle it well, but those are among the open questions. Yeah, one of the things that, that I mean, one of the reasons we created Makana was so that we could span rooms as well as incorporate in-room and, and online at the same time. And we have a, a mobile version. So that's like a, someone could just watch Apple TV and ask questions and, 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 and still chat so that they don't, you know, so that they're not, that, that those two experiences don't have to merge together. Um, you know, and allows us to, you know, manage them in the back end. Anyway, next question. Jesse Mills in San Francisco says, what controller hardware or apps are used with CS50's Zoom rooms and switchers? Let me defer to Ian on that one. Sure. So um, we have a series of Stream Deck um, little touch panels. There's a, a mini one here that allows me to sort of change what's going on behind me. Um, and then we also use um, the the companion, which is from BitFocus to script some of the, the control for that for the A10, uh, A10 minis. And so they'll, there's an A10 mini which controls the podium. There's um, uh, an A10 TV in the control room, which controls the inputs uh, from the cameras and things like that. And so we have access to all of those through the companion app on one stream deck. So next question. Sky Gleason's up next from Seattle with, uh, you said that the location is not ideal. What do you think is ideal for the problem you're trying to solve? And he has a note, how did TED Talk's style influence your camera work? I'm not sure what is meant by location here. Location in what context? Uh, the CS50 production gentleman said that 
that spe that specific space is well i got i thought it's i heard small. the word less than it's small. it's small and less than ideal yeah. so i guess i'm curious what would be ideal yeah i think i you know there's there's I like shooting in Sanders or any of the theater spaces because I can move the cameras back and the lenses have the right amount of throw and I can sort of adjust depth of field in, in that way. And I have a little more control over where the camera is um, distance wise from the, the, the presenter. Here we're sort of constrained, you know, the cameras are about as far back as they can go and, and main, maintain egress. Lighting wise, yeah, so you can see this is our sort of behind the scenes. Lighting wise, you know, we have some light panels up here um, but they're just kind of low. We don't have the ceiling room to sort of get lights in the exact right positions that we want. So space-wise, I think this, this is less than ideal, right? So it's kind of, for me, goes to a more television studio kind of space where we have high ceilings, we have enough depth. But one of the things that is interesting too is actually space behind the stage. A lot of the spaces on campus, the stage is sort of the back wall and then that's it. And having space behind the stage for rear projection, for LED video walls and things like that. And thinking about the space um, be outside of the presentation area is sort of important for us. And that's something that doesn't happen a lot on campus, unfortunately, yes. because it's, very, it's auditorium style, right? Yeah, and a lot of the state, the, the, a lot of the major theaters that we work in might have 30, 40 feet uh, or more, right. 50, 50 or 60 feet uh, behind them is where, you, where you're putting a lot of your technical staff as well as, um, you know, as you said, projectors and so on and so forth. Next question. Christian Ortiz in, Ortiz in South Florida says, what tools are being used for proctoring? The need for the camera to be on, use of lockdown browsers to be present on campus or other? We for CS50's courses don't do any form of proctoring. Any of our exams are open book toward the end of the term. And this was true pre-COVID as well. On campus, when we've had 800 students in years past, we did used to have proctored uh, exams or midterms essentially. Uh, but by nature of the class's size and classroom size, we were proctoring an exam in parallel in probably eight rooms at one point with multiple staff in multiple rooms, trying to keep everything synchronized. And it just wasn't a very pleasant experience. It also resulted in a mountain of paper, literally, that would then have to be graded thereafter, which wasn't ideal, particularly given tools uh, among which Michael works on nowadays for optimizing grading workflows digitally. So we rethought what the exams could be some years ago. And frankly, after 10 plus years of teaching the class, we we're just running out of new questions to ask that weren't just variations on past material. And so it actually ended up working well pedagogically in that we pivoted to not just open book exams, but open book exams that lend themselves to a much broader type of question. I'll paste the link of our most recent test here, which is uh, in the Makana chat now. Um, essentially now our exams take the form of eight or 10 problems, each of which we estimate should take a student at least 30 minutes. And we aspire for each of those questions to teach something new. Um, I view the test now as actually this amazing vehicle via which if I didn't get to some topic in class or there wasn't really something that fit quite perfectly in the syllabus, not a problem. We can kind of branch off the syllabus and explore it in the test itself. So it's opened up a new form of assessment too. And I think one that isn't just a regurgitation of material like it kind of was in years past when we had a mix of short answer, true, false, multiple choice, but rather it's an opportunity for students to truly apply lessons learned to new problems. Uh, and I can say too, for context, years ago when we were in the older model, we did experiment with some form of remote proctoring with students having cameras on them. I, as the teacher was not comfortable with that. I, if I were a student would not have wanted that. I certainly don't want to be installing some uh, third party software that monitors me in that way on my own machine. Um, and there wasn't even really any actionable results that came from it. The company, for instance, I forget which one we were using, sent us a list of suspicious looking recordings we reviewed them, but there was uh, reasonable doubt in all of them. Maybe the student was just looking off to the side or zoning out or the like. So we wouldn't really have done anything with those recordings anyway. And at that point, we figured a better pedagogical approach was better than a technological solution to an old form of proctoring. <laughs> Oh, uh, David, just a, a, a bit of a housekeeping. Uh, we're, we still have a lot more questions. Do you have a little more time past nine? I know I, I said one hour. Are you able to stay a little longer? Is that? Yeah, is of that course. Okay? I think both of us and our team are okay if, if you'll have us. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, great. Um, next, next question. 
Moving on, Michael Ball from San Francisco is up next again with, have you had the ability to equip uh, your teaching fellows to level up their own sections? Are any of those sections taught from studio spaces? Not really. Because of the course's size, we typically need to do things on scale. And as such, we tend to focus, we tend to have this tiered approach where maybe the highest touch experiences are done by the fewest of us just because we can't really afford to scale things out. And in COVID times, uh, we might have equipped some of the team with uh, the webcam hardware, or the audio hardware they might need, but beyond that, not much more. Um, on campus, we're a lot more capable of supporting uh, teaching fellows' interests and in trying something new or different. So that's something we've long done, pretty much procuring whatever a TF might need individually. But during COVID times, we've pretty much just kept things simple. Next question. We would also uh, record a super section occasionally where we would do a smaller setup of just one or two cameras in a in a lecture hall with uh, sort of one of the senior TFs as sort of a uh, you know standard section that anyone could watch later. Yeah, go ahead, Michael. And would those super sections be still virtual participation by the students, or is it a little bit more didactic in that case? It was uh, a mix. Not, we, oh, sorry. Okay. Well, so in in the previous years they were not, but I think David David will speak to it. Yeah, most recently, just pre-COVID, uh, we happened to start steering CS50 itself, the college class, in the direction of Zoom, and we hypothesized that, heck, you know, if they were going to have these once a week extra help opportunities, we might as well decrease the barrier to entry and not expect students to trek 20 minutes across campus for a 30 minute or 60 minute class, especially if they only have one or few questions. Why don't we use Zoom so they can pop in and pop out? There too, I think we saw the sort of phenomenon of exponential decay over time where it wasn't really solving a problem that students needed solved synchronously. So we've instead focused more on the smaller scale at uh, applications of Zoom for those tutorials we mentioned. Next question. Next question. Roscoe Jones, actually in Bray, California, says, what has been the greatest, Ian's greatest frustration uh, with the technology and what does he see as the greatest leap forward? Um, technologically, it's it's uh, signal integration, right? It's uh, like transformation of whatever comes out of the A7S2 in through a Shogun for a local recording over like Cat6, like 300 feet to a control room that then gets decimated out to three or four different sources. And it's just like box after box after box of like, conversion and dissemination. So one of the things that, that I'm most looking forward to is, is um, video signals and flavors that can just come out of a camera and be sent like 600 feet with one cable. Like Now are you, awesome. have you experimented with uh, platforms like NDI for that? Yeah, we have, um, we sort of, yes. And we, a lot of the experimentation this past year has been sort of put on hold because we've been working remotely and at home and stuff. So overhauling the sort of um, video infrastructure that we will take for field recordings and things like that has been on a bit of a hiatus. But as we sort of open up the campus, that is our next our next step is essentially to sort of figure that out. Next question. Michael Ball's back with, have you experience with breaking a lecture down into six to 10 minute chunks? And have you done any analysis of how students watch videos online? Do they drop off as the other research shows? Yeah, we have not. Philosophically, I was not a fan back in 2012 when we joined the sort of MOOC trend with edX of chopping everything up into those shorter segments. Um, for me, this was largely at the time instinctual and sort of philosophical. Um, like I didn't like the idea of, of, of treating the audience as though they do have such short attention spans. I preferred to to capture as much of the experience as being in a live location. So I'd like to think that what we do does not fall under the typical category of lecture capture, but really is a production um, as theatrical as possible. And as such, while having an intermission of sorts feels sort of appropriate, I've never liked this model of breaking things up into such small units. With that said, I think we've tried to meet some students who prefer that format and learn better in that format, admittedly, uh, in the middle as by adding tables of contents or chapter tracks to the course's video player. YouTube now wonderfully supports this in the description as well, just to help students better navigate or pause on demand as they see fit. But I think this is generally driven more by philosophy and what I want students experience to be than by a quantization of engagement at that sort of minutely level, if that's mm -hmm. fair. Next question. 
Kenan Campbell really has a comment from Princeton, Illinois. He says, in class chat seems like a perfect use case for Mucana EDU. Which... Oh, M Mucana, yeah. yeah. It actually started in, in, uh, in, in room. So we, 12 years ago when we started doing Q&A systems, uh, all of it was built uh, for in-room experiences. Um, I think we contributed to some very large organizations stop not taking the mics out of the room because uh, people asking questions is too slow. Um, next question. Often panelist John Idelson in Monterey, California. Do you have any idea of your Creative Commons license and how their course materials are being used in that sense? Yeah, that's been one of the most meaningful aspects of, I think, this initiative that all started so organically for us back in the podcasting days um, where we just started making the audio recordings, the MP3s available of lectures that evolved because of the video iPod into video formats as well. And now it's really become mission of our team, of all of the courses that I and the team are connected to making everything freely available, whether it's the audio recordings, the video recordings, the PDFs, the software, the problem sets, the solution keys, and anything teacher facing as well. And it's been extraordinary to see teachers leveraging these kinds of materials in the spirit of MIT's original open courseware and adapting or adopting it for their own purposes. I think, and those are really the two models. Some teachers, particularly if they have less experience, we encourage teachers to just use the course outright, have their students watch, for instance, my lectures, use our homeworks, and then maybe after a term or two, once they've gotten their footing, then start Start to adapt the course and use it like any good teacher would sort of picking and choosing and taking things more like a buffet style and integrating their own style and approach to teaching into it. And it's been such fun, thanks to social media, honestly, seeing photographs and video footage from around the world where we see demonstrations like the sheets of paper that I might use in Cambridge being recreated halfway across the world to demonstrate searching or sorting or other CS concepts. And in fact, one of my favorite stories was one of our former undergraduates was himself in high school prior to coming to Harvard, of course, and he had discovered CS50 in Brazil where he grew up and he took it on himself after dropping me a note for permission, just make sure it was okay what he was doing. Could he translate the materials to Portuguese? Could he teach his own version of the class to his classmates? And indeed his dad would be in the back of the classroom filming him on a camcorder, which he then posted online. He then made uh, his way to Harvard as an undergraduate, became one of our youngest teaching fellows and head teaching fellows ever. And that's uh, just one example of, I think, how, how the course has been adapted in so many forms. It's great. Uh, next question. Sam Greenwood in Toronto wants to know, David, do you think Mukana would be helpful in CS50 in the future? Okay. Oh, this is a really good question. I, this is my first time and I already yeah. learned the lessons when I asked a question in the chat, but I was supposed to ask it under questions. Um, but yeah, I think <laughs> these kinds of tools are amazing in bringing people together. Yeah. And, and frankly, if I can plug a, a direction we're headed in at Zoomtopia a year ago or so now, um, Zoom mentioned uh, announced Zaps, now called Zoom Apps, where there'll be a general purpose way, theoretically, of integrating third party apps. And we're actually excited by, by that because Zoom's chat is all too limiting. So something like Makana or the like that can also be used in different forms, I think is exactly the right direction. That's not too far away. All right, next question. Dirk Brewer in Guatemala says, have you, uh, your international students moved out of Harvard College vicinity, gone back home and continued to be enrolled and active remotely? Uh, this past year, if, the, if that's the question or not sure I follow. Um, international students, if they've moved out of the Harvard College vicinity, I guess, and gone back home, have they continued their education? In Did you see much of a drop off remotely? enrollment and in, in participation over COVID? No, no, it's about the same. It's proportional to the percentage of Harvard undergraduates who stayed enrolled in Harvard College. About 30%, I believe, of Harvard College students took this past year off. So our enrollment dropped uh, roughly proportionally, but otherwise students continue to engage uh, uh, no less as they might have in healthy times. Next question. Ashadev in New York City says, what do you see as the future of programming languages? Any favorites and if so, why? Yeah, it's a good question. And this is a very risky religious debate quickly as to which- <laughs> Yeah, we usually have saying. rules about no politics, no religion. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, coding style, coding languages could be up there. Anyway, go ahead, David. Yeah, it's a good question. And I feel like a lot of my sort of business school type friends are fond of using the term no code these days, which isn't a particular direction that I'm a fan of. I mean, the logic of it where you can sort of program without knowing program is fine. And it's a reasonable way to think about it, uh, being able to do things logically in software, but with GUIs and the like. But I do think there's something very empowering about just understanding some of the nuts and bolts of programming. And it can be in bunches of languages. There, I don't think there's necessarily one that's ideal to learn with. 
In CS50, we actually still use C, which is an older language with upsides and downsides, but it's just about as close to the hardware as you can get before things get really scary, so to speak, with assembly language followed by zeros and ones. But it also provides, I feel, a solid foundation for students then to better understand the higher level abstractions that have evolved into languages like Python and JavaScript and the like that are more application oriented and assume that there's something underneath the hood doing a lot of the management for them. Um, so these days, a favorite, not really. We tend to, for CS50, write most of the course's software now in Python, just to simplify onboarding of teaching fellow open, uh, and open source folks. Uh, but that's mostly just for the simplicity and the operationalizing of just so many different command line and web-based tools now. Next question. Comes from our dear friend here on the show, Hasma Kajar in Cape Town, uh, South Africa. Uh, David Mellon, a while back last year when I came across you on the net, instinctively I felt there must be a South African connection. Through Wikipedia, I learned you were born in the USA. Is there a South African con connection? And that's coming from a South African. No, afraid not. The family's pronounced our name Malin, and uh, but you are not alone. My uh, high school chemistry teacher, who was from South Africa, asked that same question. That was the first time I think I realized it was also a South African name, but I'm uh, just from the U.S. Next question. Jonathan Daigle of Washington, D.C. Maybe I'm just old, but can you explain how side discussion platforms like Discord and so forth integrate and enhance learning during live classroom events? How is this not a negative multitasking situation? Thank you. I think I at least would echo that they, I mean, all with um, Makana aside and the problems that it's solving for this particular use case, I think that's exactly the experience we had and I gather Michael has had at Berkeley where when we've tried to use Slack or any other tool during a live lecture, students have typically not engaged. By contrast, when it's been built into the tool with Zoom, students have engaged. Of course, students are not in person, so it's not necessarily a fair experiment to have conducted. Um, I think there's something to be said for the friction of it. It's just not quite as present as part of the experience. Um, that's just a working hypothesis. We'll see if this bears out, if maybe we do try this video alongside the chat in Sanders Theater this coming fall or next fall. Um, but otherwise, I think I would concur with, with the, the question asker's instincts. All right, go ahead, Michael. Yeah, um, I I think that David hit on the the sort of integration piece. I would also say that in an in-person classroom where you can get your question answered potentially by the instructor, it hasn't been a necessity. Without chat, in a lot of cases, right, there's just not that feedback. Um, I do think the one thing that will be interesting to see is the multitasking piece. I'm not as concerned about it if we go back. We've had a year and a half now of training students um, well, indeed, most of these students have had their whole lives training with smartphones now, uh, how to properly or improperly uh, multitask. But, you know, I, I think that the big thing is, uh, and I think David could pr perhaps speak to this, but, uh, you know, from March of last year to, you know, April now, is students' patterns of how they've used Zoom really have changes they have learned and we have learned uh, sort of what the best way is to use this all. And so hopefully that continues forward. I think one of the things that we found uh, with Makana and other things is that people are multitasking no matter what, especially if they're on a desktop. And so are they multitasking within the context of the of the class or are they multitasking in Twitter or somewhere else or, or something else that they might be interested in? Fundamentally, as a lecture format, we're not able to speak as fast as we're able to absorb. And so there's a ton of gaps. And so, for instance, the reason I like to watch lectures and flip classrooms all the time is because I listen to everything at 2x. I probably wouldn't listen to David at 2x because he talks really fast. But I literally gauge every instructor I listen to them. I go, oh, they're like a 1.5. You know, like like I could I could listen to them and and I you know and so when I do that when I speed it up I I can't do anything else. All I can do is just sit there and stare at the screen and absorb the information, which is useful for me because I actually can absorb it better because I realized I was filling the gaps all the gaps with other things. <laughs> I'm very ADD. And so by by increasing this, the, the rate, I was able to actually uh, concentrate better. The uh, so, But given that we can't do that in real time, uh, we can't go into the future, uh, what we've found is that by engaging the, the users, we end up with a much higher engagement rate and a much higher uh, um, uh, stickiness. You know, so our, our average view time is, you know, very high, um, you know, 10 times YouTube. So, so it's, so I think that that, you know, we find that giving them a bunch, giving people a bunch of things to do while we're talking, they can absorb it in a slow moment. They can fill a bunch of their time again with something that's around the conversation. Otherwise they're just going to, you know, check their email. <laughs> I can say sense. it's 
an interesting distinction among our audiences this past year too is that I think some of this is just social norms and the access that students have to resources and each other. Case right. in point, in our open courseware audience, when students are tuning in live to lectures, whether it's on YouTube or Facebook or even the Zoom room that we allocated, the chatter is nonstop. I mean, it's almost a distraction. And I would presume that's because that's those students only means of connecting with other humans who are connected with that experience. Whereas undergrads presumably can, you know, I message someone if they have a question or connect via other channels, or it's just not quite as normalized in the same way. Right. Go ahead, Nick. Yeah, I think um, the, your point, Alex, about the folks being able to communicate with one another about the topic on in class, filling in those gaps instead of essentially multitasking to something unrelated to the class is useful. Um, also, what again, what I'm seeing is that Discord is as a place where the students, they're doing that dynamically. It's not sanctioned. It's not part of the class per se. It's happening organically. And those conversations continue after the class and they can continue for weeks. And they could involve, hey, how about we hop on, on Discord? And they, they connect via video and screen sharing. And so that thread continues um, without interruption. And I think there's value to that. And also, I, I do watch the uh, students will share in the Zoom chat, and they'll, they'll make comments about a lot of the, the content that I'm sharing, like, oh, that was cool, or, you know, yeah, that, that person never, you know, hits their target, or whatever it is. Um, and it, it builds the sense of community within the class. And, and that's really what um, I find really a value in that aspect instead of everyone just simply sitting watching your screen okay i took my notes on my own and, and now i'm on my own to figure it out it really builds that sense of community when we're all distanced from one another yeah i think that one of the things we found with our my class in africa was that i would send them a video and a challenge <laughs> and then i expect you to have it done by the class that we're going to talk about it and, and so they would have a little five minute video. In this case, it's th I was teaching 3D. So it was like, here's how to make a waving flag. And here's like a five minute video to, that you watch. Your job is to go make that. And so then they would work on it. They would submit whatever they had finished. And then they would come in a week later and we, the questions are a lot better <laughs> because they've now run up against that wall and they've, and it's kind of scraped open a bunch of hooks that, that knowledge can be hooked onto um, as we talked. Um, next question. Christian Ortiz in South Florida. What is edX and how do all the university, uh, universities collaborate together? Yeah, so edX is a uh, consortium of universities, initially Harvard and MIT and then Berkeley and now dozens of other schools that make courses freely available via the platform in a somewhat standard user interface, both on the web and via mobile. It is uh, the uh, nonprofit incarnation of Coursera, if you're familiar with that and some similar platforms. Um, and CS50, for instance, is uh, exists not only in the form of this college class, but also a number of other forms. I'll paste the URL of our landing page that has this and some courses taught by me and some of my colleagues, all in the same uh, format. Uh, but it's a great place if you want to fill in some gaps in your knowledge, learn something new, uh, and it's on all sorts of fields, not just CS and STEM. Next question. Brian Schwartz in Baltimore is curious whether there's any collaboration between MIT and Harvard in distance education specifically. Certainly on the edX side. Um, beyond that, I think the universities tend to operate fairly autonomously in terms of the different um, tubs at Harvard that are doing online education. Harvard has its extension school. MIT has some of its offerings. Harvard Business School has some of its offerings. I don't doubt that some of the uh, staff at those various groups do intercommunicate, but I think edX is the biggest and certainly most visible incarnation of cross-campus collaboration that I'm familiar with between the two. Yeah, I think that my my wife has a master's from Harvard for um, technology and education. I think that there were a couple of their courses that were integrated with uh, MIT while she was while she was doing that. Go ahead, Michael. Yeah, I mean, I think David's right. And I guess for those who don't know, Harvard and MIT students have a pretty uh, easy culture, I would say, of being able to cross enroll if they wanted to take advantage of that. Um, and then on the research side, the people that I do know, um, there are, yeah, not necessarily, there's not necessarily a formal research center, but everyone is willing to and happy to share and collaborate. Um, and, you know, I talk with some of these people a little bit infrequently, but, you know, they have the advantage of being only a few miles apart, uh, which is something I'm a little jealous of. <laughs> Next question. 
Brody Hafner in New York City. Oh, this is dangerous. Would Davis like David like to participate in an office hours okay. tradition of a brief, ruthless <laughs> review of his audio and video presentation? We do that <laughs> with warning. We do that with warning. So, so like, well, you know, that looks great. I think I love the infinity uh, background. So, um, it, it, it's a, I've attempted it. And I think in my space, it's never, I went back to gray because doing the, I, I guess I'm curious, David, how are you, uh, what are you getting? How are you getting the even light across that behind you? Yes, I've honestly somewhat luckily today. Um, I have two stick lights that are in front of me. Both are at 5,600. I've got two more vertically behind me as well. Um, a white fabric from Amazon that's just uh, about eight feet tall and eight or so feet wide behind me. Um, and it's a bunch of tinkering. I closed all the blinds today, which certainly helps. But I, you're get, catching me at a relatively good day. Sometimes it actually is a challenge uh, in my kitchen. <laughs> Ian has the nicer hardware and setup at the office. And then in the right. theater, of course, we have uh, even higher touch gear. Yeah, absolutely. Bill? I call it 99.9% .9 fabulous. The only thing is I think the white is a little bit bright for me. I'd bring it down about a stop yeah. because on the big screen when it's up there, it's putting out a lot of lumens. And yeah. Yes, and I'm now seeing the Rex now that you spotlighted me again, all the imperfections in my face too. So yeah, You look great. Well, it's, You're fine. It's, 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 if you ever look at our Ruthless reviews, we literally go around and just tear each other apart. Oh you my know, gosh. And, you know, every each screen. That's that's how you end up with a lot of people, a lot of good frames. Is that it's a it's a pretty rough. Uh, we're a pretty <laughs> rough crowd. We did last week. We did one just on mics. <laughs> so oh so God. it was yeah. So all right. Next question. For an hour. Moving yeah, on hour. to Roscoe Jones is back with another one. In this case, Roscoe says, "I saw you did a cooking contest in the summer of '50. So how would you do this in a hybrid model? Why would people want to watch cooking in a hybrid environment? This may be a setup." <laughs> yeah, well, I should clarify. So I, I pasted our smug mug URL into Makana earlier, which is 15 years of CS50 photographs. Um, in healthier times for the past many years, we've had a tradition of summer 50, where some of CS50's full-time team and undergraduate interns uh, spend a week together at the beginning of the term uh, planning for the whole coming year. What are our priorities going to be? What do we want to change? What do we want to keep the same and the like? And I think I and a colleague some five plus years ago were going through a Gordon Ramsay phase at the time, and we really liked cooking shows and the red versus team versus the blue team. And so we integrated, we had to cook dinner for ourselves anyway during this week long retreat. So we turned it into a competition that became a tradition. Uh, there is no aspiration to film that on, on video, but we do have photographs. Uh, there's no notion of hybrid or remote students, uh, since it really is just a fun way to um, bond with the team at the start of a new year. I, I, ahead, so wanna, I, I wanna steal every idea you've got. We are uh, in the process of making yeah. this experience happen and well, we are yeah. learning by the minute. Yeah, yeah the, wow. the uh, we, we do a lot of cooking. I, I, find, uh, I, I find cooking to be an interesting way to think about education because everybody does it. So everybody needs to know how to, well, doesn't need to know how to do it, but it, it improves them. I, when I was thinking about it, I, I cooked a couple hundred loaves of bread to figure, figure, then go went through different training and try to figure out like the best way to talk about it. And we're now doing a bunch of cooking shows on Saturdays. We're doing one later today. And uh, we do it because of the interactive nature of now, because this group is a little different, we've got a hundred people with multi camera setups at home. It looks different because <laughs> people are cutting the close ups and wides and everything else. You might have 15 or 20 people all cooking together where you're not, it's more than just their laptop sitting up in front of them. But it's an interesting way that we all learn from each other like who's using what knives and how are you cutting it and what are you doing? And it's, we, we haven't solved it all yet, but it's, it's pretty engaging, you know, and we made it, we built a raspberry pie together. We, what we should have done is done a cooked a pie and then a pie, but we, <laughs> we didn't. But, uh, and, and those kinds of interactive events, I think, are, are really interesting from a collaborative perspective. It is. Uh, and I'm here with all, all of my colleagues are better cooks than I, Ian and Tara and Andrew Rungshin and Arturo behind the scenes here today. So any cooking questions, I'll defer to them. <laughs> all right. Next question. Michael Ball of San Francisco has our last actual question. And he says, speaking of David talking fast, just curious, have you ever measured your world, words per minute metric for speaking? You know, I haven't, but it's been on my mental to-do list to do a little hackathon project because we've got 15 years of transcripts. And I actually think I talk faster now than I did in 1999 when I first started teaching or lecturing. Um, I say this because we have the YouTube video somewhere from Computer Science uh, E1, that very first course that I mentioned teaching at Harvard's Extension School. Um, and I was struck when I first saw that after we digitized it uh, from VHS, just how slowly I talked, relatively speaking. 
Um, nowadays, I think I much talk so much faster. So it's been on my to do to actually plot it. And I do suspect it's either linear or, or even a hockey stick. Go ahead, Michael. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, you know, you and I have the experience of, uh, knowing, uh, Dan Garcia. Um, and I, I think it's interesting hearing Alex's comment too, because different people have that style. And I do feel like there's something with, uh, you know, the engagement. Um, cause I know Dan, when he was in a classroom, uh, it wasn't until we had a stenographer come in to a live transcribe of the course for a student who needed it. And she had said that Dan regularly hit 300 words per minute speaking. Um, and for some context, you know, most of the automated, uh, terms and conditions may apply type announcements hit that 400 rate, <laughs> uh, but 300 was his normal rate. So I would be curious to see, uh, you know, where you stand. And then uh, for others who haven't had this privilege, watching David and Dan go at it in an in-person classroom is really fun for all of us uh, <laughs> because there is an energy there. <laughs> I believe it. And if you want to see just how much our quality has changed over the years, I pasted into Makana chat. This might not be my very first lecture. It was 9 February 1999. So it's around then. Um, and great. you can see even the old VCR uh, on screen display or whatnot on the on the recording, it seems. That's great. Uh, next question. Yeah, John Idelson snuck in with the last one uh, from Monterey, California. What would your focus be for Zoomtopia 2021 presentations? Yeah. Um, you know, I'm really, you know, all things considered this past year, we were so fortunate not only to stay healthy within our circle, but also to have this really unusual opportunity, I think, to experiment uh, technologically and also spatially on campus in ways that hasn't really been possible when the campus is populated. So case in point, the photograph that Ian had up earlier of the theater is an empty, otherwise empty theater this past year, the American Repertory Theater that holds 500. Um, this is separate from Sanders Theater, but it has a backstage and side stage. It has a prop shop and a whole team of artists with whom we were able to collaborate as a result. And so for Zoomtopia this coming year, if they'll have us, I mean, I think we would really speak to what we were able to do, not just technologically in terms of pushing the envelope with Ian and the team with so many different displays and so many different signals and wires and the like, but also educationally, um, we were able to collaborate with carpenters and artists who were able to help us visualize certain concepts in computer science that I might have always had in my mind. I might try to draw with chicken scratch on the screen, but having it built out of wood or out of metal or plastic, I think was pretty game changing in terms of really bringing the class to life and bringing not just a theatricality, but a physicality to it. That's much harder to do. As beautiful as Sanders Theater is, there's no backstage. We've got to get out of there for the next group of people to come in and and so educationally, it's hard to do what was optimal. And so this past year, I think, thanks to the team, our team's expertise and the ART's talent, um, we were able to really bring things to the next level. And so I think talking about that and takeaways and what worked and didn't would probably be on a Zoomtopia agenda in my mind. I go ahead, Sky. I, David, thank you so much. And I, I, I look at Aaron and I look at, at, at Steve and knowing that they're, they're lusting after your budget and your your experience and and the room that you've got but they've got like a camera and a light and they're doing what they can with what they have so what what in your parting words to these educators that have minimal if any budget at all what what would you speak to sir yeah, it's a really good question. And it's sort of the flip side of having been so fortunate to sort of continue to be able to take things to the next and next level, because people view the current year as like what we do, where I can tell you every prior version that wasn't quite as shiny and pretty as the current version back to that YouTube video that I just pasted from 1999. So I think everything that we have done technologically has certainly been very incremental. It has almost always been a solution to a problem. Case in point, the live streaming became a thing because we wanted to bring business school students across the river, so to speak. And after that, we then steered into it and made it more broadly available and the like. I think we too in education are fortunate to be able, not just at Harvard, but really any teacher to reach out to companies who might wanna be supportive of K-12 or higher ed and loan us hardware. Like we did not pay for the Ozos, for instance. Those were loaned to us by Nokia so that we could try them out. Um, and I think that with even our events on campus, when we've invited folks to either donate something to the raffle or bring in some food or some soda for students, I think just asking has really been characteristic of us. And it's not so much a matter of budget. It certainly helps, I think, that we were fortunate to work at a place like Harvard for, for namesake. 
But I think just asking is something we encourage of our AP teachers all the time, like write a note to drop in on or email someone at a company, a local store or the like, and just ask, because that really is how we've done so much of what we've done is been, has been bootstrapping things year after year. And the net effect absolutely is probably overwhelming and hopefully pretty, but it really is the result of having started with the camcorder 20 years ago and just pointing it up when it's time to film the screen and pointing it down when it's time to go back to me. And so everything since then has just been a marginal improvement. So I would look at us year over year, not 20 years at a time. As you look into the next school year of 2021, what do you think is going to change for you? It's a big question mark right now. We don't know what the on-campus protocols are going to be yet. And I think that's a question mark around the world, certainly as to what will be safe and what will be allowed. I'd like to think we'll return to Sanders. I, I, I miss certainly the feel of the space, the beauty of the space. I'm skeptical that we'll be able to have all 800 students reconvene in person. That just, you know, September is going to be here before we know it. And I'm not sure we want to return to a... Uh, uh, indoor setting with that many students. And so I think we're going to think hard this summer over what can we preserve of our lessons learned this past year with the synchronicity of Zoom, uh, with the physicality of the props that we use. I'd like to think if we can physically, we will start bringing TV screens into Sanders, even in healthy time, so as to preserve that synchronous aspect of Zoom, have all the more faces to interact with, all the more students through extension and open courseware so that they can engage too. So I think it's probably going to be an amalgam, partly as a solution to a risk averse problem health wise this fall. But I think if we look two years out, I suspect we'll keep a lot of the little features um, technologically and pedagogically that Ian and the team have helped us create. I kind of feel like we, when we think about this, that there was this kind of this thread of how we were going at a certain rate, you know, of in-person versus online, and then it spiked and now it's going to drop back down, but it feels like we're kind of on, it's created kind of a new trajectory that is a much more, uh, virtual. Does that, does that feel like it for you as well with what you learned this year? Hopefully in our circle, I mean, my hope nationally and internationally is that all of this online learning for most people has been a net positive because I'm sure there've been some horrible experiences and, and, and understandable too, if so many teachers were caught off guard. I mean, we were fortunate to have been doing this for 20 years and some right. of my colleagues, at least for a few years, and there's so many more teachers out there who had to learn in March of 2020. Um, and I, I wouldn't really, uh, I wouldn't really expect that it would go as well as you might like the first time around. So I hope that it doesn't leave a bad taste overall in people's mouths. Um, for us, though, it really is this synchronous piece that has always that has been possible in some form. I mean, Zoom isn't brand new, but we just didn't think about it as hard. And to be fair, bandwidth is only getting better and better. So I think preserving some of those aspects is alluring. And just last night, I was chatting with a colleague about a course for the campus this coming fall where, you know, we got to thinking especially if we want students to be able to pop in and out based on what needs they have in a given week, maybe we should just use Zoom. Even if everyone is physically on campus, let's just decrease the friction, let them get in and get out and normalize that a bit more. A year ago before COVID, it was a little harder of a sell. Like, why am I going to Harvard College if this is on Zoom? But now that more people have perhaps a sense of the trade-offs and the, the pluses, that too could just be another tool in a teacher's toolkit. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we had a couple comment, final comments, Bill. I think that there's a yeah, couple well, there. Basically, people are saying thank you. That's that's yeah. the core question that kind of represents everybody. There mm -hmm. was a cute one here. John Preto, our panelist from Las Vegas, said, David, thank you and your team so much for sharing with us today. I'm getting a strong Steve Jobs vibe from you. Do you wear <laughs> New Balance 992 <laughs> tennis shoes as well? So I do not. I just got myself a pair of Asics recently, and I haven't worn a turtleneck go. in quite a few years. <laughs> Very good. Uh, David and Ian, thank you so much for joining us uh, and, and having this discussion with us. I hope it was a hope you had hope you had a good time. So much fun. Thank you for having us. Really yeah, appreciate we, it. We would Pleasure, love to have absolutely. you. Yeah, we, we would love to. Uh, we would love to have you back whenever you whenever you want to come back and, and join us and hang out. Uh, it's it's really, really great to, to learn from you. So thanks so much. Absolutely. It seems like an amazing community you've built. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you. Uh, for, for everyone else, uh, we, we've got Nick Justin from Drexel University. He's going to be talking about Unreal. Uh, he is going to be coming up at 10. I was tempted to start a little early, but I think that we're going to have, pe we have people come in specifically for, for, uh, to, to hang out with Nick. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and open it up to open mic. Uh, uh, David and Ian, you're more than welcome to stay. Uh, otherwise, uh, but thank you. Otherwise, thank you very much for, uh, for being here. We're just going to kind of do an 
after show ish diet kind of just talking uh, between now and uh, 10 o'clock. And then we'll start up with Nick. He's going to be talking about MetaHumans, uh, which came out uh, in the last uh, week. And I've already gotten myself into trouble with it. So, so anyway, so we're going to, so uh, Nick and I <laughs> will be talking a lot about it because we're, we're knee deep in, in uh, actually implementing MetaHumans and some, some, some stuff. So, uh, anyway, so that'll be at 10 o'clock. Nice. Nick, I hope you'll yeah. forgive. We have to go to our teaching fellows spring training in a bit. So I'll have to drop off, but thank you. Absolutely. Thanks. So, Ian, David, thank you so much. Uh, take care. Uh, yeah. So um, we'll, we're we're going to go ahead, and if you need to take a little break uh, or or uh, break away there, how, did uh, did all of you enjoy that? Was that a was that a good uh, fascinating? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, that was phenomenal. Wow. It, like a I link to it. this YouTube video is going to like my department head and a bunch of other folks. Yeah, <laughs> in my. In it was great. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I had really to laugh when he said an old programming language and you referenced C. Did you remember I, when they were like, that was the, well, oh, these whippersnappers want to use C. You know, like, <laughs> I, 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 I think to myself, you know, I was doing a learning from Knuth's book on assembler language back in 76. Yeah. Hey, if you don't know basic, you know. <laughs> well, you know Fortran yeah. rocks. Yeah, I, I, well, I started having, in basic and then met I one of the inventors of Fortran. Oh, ball, co ball, co ball, co yeah. ball. I, I went from, I went from, uh, there's a name I haven't heard in a long time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I love Lisp. I... Back in the Clone Wars. And you have to use yeah, punch exactly, cards. Exactly. Well, talk amongst yourselves. I'm going to step away for just a minute. I suppose if anyone is uh, joining us, Oh, this is early, early. It's only 1230. Yeah. So the Unreal folks will be coming in later. Uh, is there a time that we would open up mics uh, or hand raises for folks to come in? and? Yeah. If, if, you're, want to... if you want to be part of, the, uh, of this one, go ahead and raise your hand now. So if you want to be part of the Unreal, uh, just go ahead and raise your digital raise hand. Your digital hand in the participants. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And then... Uh, also, you know, feel free. I, we're going to talk about we're going to talk about a lot of things. But if you want to have an informal discussion about Unreal, we can start early. We just uh, get more into what we were going to talk about at ten. So. Sounds good. And Nick, for <clears throat> yeah. the, stru the structure of archive, I'm and Chad, I guess, and I'm going ahead and grabbing the text from Mukana at this point. So I know a lot of the questions that will be coming into you. Um, maybe I'll get Benjamin to scrape it a second time and to throw it into the Discord links because we're, if we have the that data, it might be available to us in the future in a database concept. So I'm, I'm just cool. letting you know structurally. Hi, Aaron. Yeah, uh, sounds cool. Okay, thank you. So Mickey, while I've got a chance, I do have a new microphone. I'm not sure why it switched back, but I'm. I'm back to where I should be, I think. Test one, two, three, yes, four, sir. five. Sounds this good. is the Thank healed PR30. Sounds good. And without a, without a pop filter. So Peter Piper picked a pack of pickled peppers. So so Chad, I cleaned up my uh, holographic screen and <laughs> yeah, nice uniform. sorry to so now I can. Sorry no, that was great. I appreciate it because I'm like, ah, ah, ah. And, you know. I created I, this you... area for the purpose of contrast for the hand. <laughs> that's I, that's great. There you go. Production technology. Black black blankets are good. <laughs> uh, also addressing one of the attendees, uh, Rongshin. I noticed that uh, your hand came up after we started sound checks, and we weren't able to bring you in then. If you still have an interest, I'm watching. And could someone put me back to attendee? I'll be listening, but I have to run. Dan Huber. Roscoe, while I've got you, what's happening on your campus in terms of planning for the fall? Oh, gosh. Um, we are, we're opening. Is that right? We're opening, but we're not going to have any audiences for, so I don't know what we're doing in the large lecture halls. That's the only thing I'm not sure about. Um, but the smaller classes, uh, if we have the space or, um, they really, well, July 1st, I, don't, I think this is system wide July 1st, everybody technically, you know, the campuses are back to 
everyone being there, custodians and staff and what have you. And then um, uh, the fall is, uh, as far as I know, um, approved. But that's, you know, everything right now still has to be approved by the committee. <laughs> who I, I forget who's on the committee, but so anything you want to do, you have to. So like we want to go shoot in a hallway this week. I had to a week in advance say, okay, this is the name of the seven students that are going to be standing outside this room in a hallway shooting on a bench. And I had to wait three days for that to get approved. What about um, capacity of just general classrooms? You know, you're, I don't know, you, do you guys use resource 25 and have they kept all the classroom capacities the same? Um, no, that's, yeah, that's, that's what I'm, I'm not, in on those discussions outside of my department or, or don't really know of what the campus is doing. We have what are called general classrooms within our building. Um, but uh, yeah, there is a spacing element to it at this moment in time. And now the latest thing I saw, I don't know if you saw that every student's going to have to be vaccinated. To yeah, come I, on I saw the, that the, both the CSUs, UC, and I believe the community colleges, I haven't yeah. followed up on that. As far as I know, it's supposed to be, uh, everything in California, um, or at least they're working on it, but yeah, <laughs> that yeah, makes here, a lot of us our, excited. So what does that mean campus, though? For we've this? actually gotten to, uh, the, the university has actually become a vaccination clinic. And so all faculty, staff, and students are eligible at this point for vaccines on campus. And, yeah, we did the vaccination um, site, at CSUMB. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we're, and we're everyone, it's it's right now all students that will return to campus in fall are required to be vaccinated. It's just going to be part of the, you know, regular vaccination requirements that we've always had, you know, and um, I, we haven't gotten an official word yet, but we're we're kind of thinking we're, we're expecting to hear that faculty and staff are, would be expected of the same. Um, so I imagine that, that I think they're still saying that you can claim a religious exemption. Yeah. Um, but otherwise you didn't just get it. I mean, I got my second shot on Wednesday, so I'm, I'm psyched. I'm going to get to start visiting family again. So, um, you know, my, so many of my extended family are, are vaccinated and just about to fully vaccinated stage. So it's just, it's just like, oh, wow, I can actually start to see people again. This is going to be good. I, I'm, I'm actually, I think in a few hours going to see another faculty member for her birthday party. Um, and her requirement is anyone going inside uh, her apartment has to be double vaccinated. But everyone who will be there will, I think, be at this point for most of us uh, two or three weeks post uh, our second shot, which is a pretty amazing feeling. It's also kind of weird because it's like I haven't seen this many people in our room in a, more than a year. I know. It's somewhat like terrifying. Like I've become a, I've become an introvert. I've been trained. I'm a trained introvert now i should like it's not something i used to be i do think it's weather related because it's warm enough here to where people have been in if you go to san clemente nobody wears a mask and people just walk around in groups all the time which is south orange county san clemente so it's just kind of like okay i guess they live in a different world than the rest of california you um, did say orange say, county which counts as a different world than the rest of california i have to say i'm really impressed my my son is a freshman in in college and i took him to the campus for his uh vaccine on Monday. And so he actually got to see in person some of his classmates for the very first time. And um, like one of them was just like, oh, this is great. Hey, Nikki, good to meet you. And and he he was just like, hi. Like, you know. <laughs> and, yeah. and I was like, wow, that's impressive. Like, because really, he has not gotten out of this house much at all. In What in the campus last is year. he going to? He's going to Drexel's campus. Or oh, like he's, oh, he's, be on campus. He's in the home campus. He's been like, you know, everything's been remote since March. And he started his freshman year in the middle of COVID in September. So he's he's been taking remote classes. He's usually like he's asleep now because it's still only 1230 in the afternoon. So it's not his, his wake up time yet. But normally he's he's behind my green screen do, taking his classes and um so that was like his first time on campus seeing others and and even he was like you know he's been dying for that moment and then he was like oh what do i do um here's my elbow you know? <laughs> so it's, 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 it's gonna, there's going to be some transition time to this whole like seeing people close together again so i, I think you know that my son then ended up moving in with us during um covid and the last time he lived with us you know he was in 
uh, to community college before he went to the university. And I don't think he knew there was anything before 12 noon on Saturday. <laughs> I knew life had changed when, <laughs> when he was up at four or five on Saturdays. Like, Who is this person living in our basement up this early? <laughs> See, in my house, it's me. I'm living in the basement, but, you know, it's, <laughs> this is, it's my basement studio. I don't have an infinity wall like they do when you're a Harvard teacher. Well, I think the fun thing about his presentation is that they had all those years of experience building up to it. That was like building the muscles that they needed to be able to take advantage of it. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, I think he had a great point about the the inertia of higher education, you know, and, and its reluctance to move into that modality in general. Um, you know, I I learned a lot of what I've learned about visual effects, you know, before getting into the industry remotely because I lived in Philadelphia and I was learning from people in California, L.A., San Francisco. And, and so that was just natural to me by the time I became a teacher and I was actually pretty stunned at, at the resistance to the ideas of like, well, we, we could do this as an online class. Like, well, why would, you know, we can't, no, we can't teach that online. We can't do that online. Like, yeah, sure we can. <laughs> uh, and we, that's how we, we actually had started it as a means of bringing in West Coast instructors into our East Coast classes. So even though the students were actually meeting in class, we were bringing in instructors, you know, for a full semester that were based in, on the West Coast, you know. When I was up in Chico, we were DD only things like that. three hours from San Francisco, but to get a guest lecture, you know, unless I could entice them with Sierra Nevada beer, they weren't going to drive four hours up and four hours back to be a guest lecture. Yeah. But, and, uh, you know, I think the thing with Harvard is that, or any of the R1 research institutions, Michael, you probably have the same thing. Your introductory classes are these large lecture halls. Yeah, and they really there's the Zoom and the smaller uh, participation really is an advantage for, in the CSU where we you know quote pride ourselves on more direct contact with with our students and smaller class size. It's a bigger lift. Yeah, and that's where I mean, it it that's where David having uh, eighty teaching fellows kind of makes a difference and i mean i think the thing that's also interesting too is they offer cs50 only in the fall at harvard right now and so uh you know they have the spring term to really prepare and i think one of the things that i've learned over the years uh, of, of talking to david is just that like <laughs> yeah um i mean we all know that preparation is important but there is no way that i have started prepping for fall courses in the spring term because I've got four of them right now. So uh, it's all that I can do to, you know, get things up during the week on the right time. <laughs> well, our course prep for me was the Microsoft model. You know, every course is a prep. You know, I mean, I was teaching yeah. every term, so it, it got better. It usually took me two years to lock down a course. And yeah. then it'd have about a two year life before I had to, you know, completely redo it. Yeah. I, I've, I've kind of been in that model too for some of them, but they, uh, They've been really good about building things up over time. And they have, I mean, I think most people probably figured this out, but uh, they have, you know, a video production team now and a software team that rivals ours, you know, in total. It's sort of many, many small companies uh, that that they have. And they, you know, over the years at Harvard, I think they've even uh, grown so much that they'll have their own dedicated, uh, you know, office space and rooms, uh, which is just pretty cool. Well, my, my, my dad went to Harvard. My brother went to Harvard. So there's a, I went to Northwestern, which I consider the Harvard to the Midwest. But space is the biggest battle in Cambridge. Yeah. So that, to, to, to me, it, they, they could have 800 TAs. They could have 1000 you know, uh, dollars per class. But getting a physical space on the Harvard campus is going to be moving. And you have the same problem berserkly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No. And, and I was joking, too, because, uh, you know, 800 is, is really only 50 percent scale. I mean, sometimes it's only 40 percent scale. But uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, John, your, your note, your note about the um, R1 lectures is is spot on. Um, uh, Drexel's an R1 institution as well. And then 
as a response to COVID, uh, I worked with the engineering college to start basically digitizing um, the the labs, the engineering labs, right? So th there'd be like a heat transfer set up and it's, a, it's on a lab bench. It's something that, you know, hundreds or a thousand or something students would have to come through and work on as part of their, you know, basic engineering courses that there were large lecture classes and such. And all of that was getting pushed to remote due to uh, COVID. And so we actually rebuilt, we built all of those labs in Unreal Engine so that they could be taught and demonstrated in a remote modality. And initially that was because like, how are we going to teach this during, you know, during uh, distanced learning? And as soon as they started to see it, there was like, ah, oh, we could do this like when it's in person. This like everyone could have this like on their desk all the time. Like, yeah, yeah, that's how it works. And, and so, um, yeah, that, that is some of the stuff that we'll, we'll be taking with us. I, I think some, that's some of the positive back. stuff back. If you remember the days of video disc. Um, so oh, I yeah. did a, a research study for the National School Boards Association of replacing wet labs in high schools with interactive video discs because you could simulate all the experiments. We, uh, I, I did a review of, I was supposed to review of all the biology and uh, chemistry textbooks. The biology people wouldn't let me do the research because they thought I was a crazy person trying to deal with, you know, uh, creation theory. But on the uh, chemistry classes, there were basically eight textbooks that every high school used. All the experiments were based on the Eisenhower curriculum that was done, you know, after Sputnik. And they could be done perfectly in simulations. And th there was a great resistance. I mean, everybody said, no, it has to be a wet lab. And I said, you know, most of the wet labs in high schools were teaching cleanliness. You know, we c it could be the home ec class, you know, cl clean your pots and pans. Um, but I wonder if now there would be a, be a different uh, feeling about it because the uh, chemistry simulations that we were able to do back in the 90s with interactive video discs were amazing. You know, you, you could do all those sorts of things in the wet lab that you weren't allowed to do in a high school wet lab, you know, because of the dangers. Yeah, I um, unfortunately, I, I'm the oldest in my family and in high school, I kind of accidentally blew up my chemistry lab and they weren't allowed to touch much when they got to chemistry. It was unfortunate. So. <laughs> because they were family members or because the lab was damaged? The, the lab was damaged. Basically, um, the, the lab was, you, we distilled wood and collected various gases in various jars. And I, don't, I, must, must, I misread the pre-lab. You're supposed to take a, a lit wood splint and put it into a jar that contained CO2 and watch the wood splint, you know, get extinguished and all. And, and that was the experiment. And I grabbed the wrong jar. Apparently the one I had, had acetylene. And so, yeah, that was, that was interesting. And it was, it was fascinating though, to watch these little like tumbling balls of flame just rolling across the floor. And yeah, so by the time my sister got into chemistry, the, the instructor like brought her to the bench and had her look up and see the scorch mark in the ceiling and said, did you see that? That was your brother. This is why you can't touch anything. And so, did you yeah, have the it, smell I, of burning hair? No, no. I th that's yeah. That's where all this started, right? No, um, along your arms though and yeah. stuff. I mean, literally that oh, smell yeah, when you get a I flash. Know. It's pretty. Yeah, intense. it was. It was a pretty big flashbang. Yeah, but I, thankfully, at least my sister went on to become a PhD in in chemistry. So, so she wasn't too scarred by the whole thing. Didn't it damage the family too much then? No, just psychologically, which all, you know, all I did was, you know, you know, pop the Bunsen that. burners, you know, that was, you know, try to make music out of Bunsen burners. And that got me thrown out. I learned a lot my, about uh, my, because okay. I learned yeah. a lot about my dad. He was an art teacher. And when I went to his classroom and suddenly realized there was clay stuck all over the ceiling. <laughs> I have so many windows open. This is crazy. Well, Nick, I'm going to run. I've, I've been watching your presentations on YouTube, but I, uh, I need to go prepare for my cooking show. All right. Later. Have today. fun with that. What are you cooking, John? Uh, we're cooking the potato spice, whatever. I, I 
should know what it is. But our not, our you, version. I thought you be, were rele- relegated now to to tech staff. <laughs> um, well, because Chris Fr- Fritchie's wife is they're a team. I convinced my wife that I can help as long as I don't talk. No. <laughs> Is there a host here that's able to promote Rick Markley? Rick Markley's in the attendees with his hand up, and he's definitely part of our Unreal uh, Mickey's panels. a host. I don't know if he's listening. Uh, Bill we have Davis. our co-host, Bill. Bill. Bill, Davis. Yeah, Bill, can you could promote? John, just don't forget to put Bobby's name in your, in your oh, listen. Uh, ID. I, I've been told, and it, it wasn't me as bad Thanks, as uh, it didn't appear in the graphics. So I think uh, Alex... 4D made sure that was taken care of. My wife won't let us do anything in her kitchen. Well, I I I get these things from H E B in the frozen aisle. They're they're they they're microwavable, you know, they come in packages. I wonder if I could do a cooking show about how to do microwave uh, cooking, you know. You only if you leave the foil on. How yeah. do you how do you pierce the how do you pierce the uh cellophane with a fork, you know? So Paul be, before before I married Bobby, my kids didn't realize that you didn't store things in the oven that you actually cooked in it. I was oh, a microwave. Is that king. right? Yeah. I wondered. I wondered why all those pots. My wife put all those pots and pans in the oven. Yeah. <laughs> I thought John, it was a storage unit. John, are you up for a barbecue show then? Uh, def- well, we're rebuilding our deck right now. I could have made a big barbecue burning the old wood. I no, could do they, a barbecue they, show. Yeah. Oh, that yeah, John. It's outside yeah, that, of my John. wife's kitchen. There you go. Now, barbecue, I could get behind. We do some some heavy duty barbecue in here, down here in Texas. Well, all I can say is, after we did these three shows, I came home and found my wife had a business card for a kitchen consultant for rebuilding the kitchen. So I think it may have really yeah. created a monster here. It's gonna cost that, you. That's a yeah. hundred grand right there, baby. That's well, a new office hours tax. Yeah. <laughs> I, I know guys down here have spent way over a hundred grand on barbecue rigs, man. You well, should see some of these things. Well, I'm looking man. forward to her doing the kitchen remodel because it will make my habit of ATEMs and microphones seem cheap. Can have a good day, that. guys. Thanks, John. Be well. This All one of- guy, no, he took a dumpster, you know, a full on big dumpster and, and turned it into like a gourmet kitchen with the barbecue. And then he, and then he put a roof on the top with a garden where you could sit around on top of it. You know that he had well over a hundred grand into that barbecue rig, you know, and he'd take that thing to the tailgate parties at UT, you know, when the Longhorns played too when bad said- that they, too bad they built that whole block where they had the, the tailgate parties is now built up with skyscrapers, no more tailgates parties. When you say rig, Paul, I think a motorhome has to pull it. So I think a prevost is, you know, adds to the cost of a barbecue rig. Yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah, he had to have something to pull it with. I'd, I made a YouTube video on it. We he did he showed me the whole process. You know, the guy does gourmet kitchens for a living. Chris Nixon's the guy's name. He lives out in the hill country. Yeah, hey, uh, how do I sound, you guys? Um, how's my audio level? You could test drop one, it down two, about one two. dB, it's, I think. What do sounds you think good. It's hot. Two. It's hot. It's hot. Sound, it's hot. Good. It's hot. It's at about negative 16. You can see the meters. Okay. Up yep. Yep. I see them now. Hello. Test one, two. Hello from Wisconsin. Let me pull back a little bit. Any better? How are we looking now? A little bit more. Okay. A little bit more. There we go. Test one, two. Test. There we go. Test one, just, two. You're just 0.25 dBs high right now. Okay. Point two five. Now? Paul's pulling now? your leg. Oh. <laughs> would I do that? Would I do that, Ross? Yeah. <laughs> yes, you would. Negative. All right. 24. So it sound good? Am I good? Sounded good. It yes, came no? a little hot when you just yeah got a little hot oh. there, right? When I leaned well, in here. Well, the thing is, everybody else has to not talk, or you add you get exactly. their reading added to yours. Oops, you're muted, Rick. Test one, two. Hello, hello. Test from Baraboo, Wisconsin. Seem okay? You're still like a DB hot, but you don't sound very much different, so I'd come down just a tiny bit. Okay. Any better? Sound good still? No? Maybe maybe lower? 
No, you're right yes. about there. All right, good. Thank you. Hey, Nick, I want the disease pack for my guy. I want to put a melanoma on him and a tegerium and a mole. <laughs> Is there, so there's a virtual reality character disease pack? That's way too far. <laughs> That's... We're going to have to start, you know, th there's eventually going to be a debate about the ethics of what we inflict upon our yeah. digital Yeah, digital I don't want humans. people putting moles on me and my virtual person in places that I don't approve of. Anyone else want the sound check? You yes, can give me right. a sound check. Hey, guys, maybe I'll do a sound check, too. How's it sounding? Very loud. Everybody Jesse. again? Very Is it loud. loud? All right. Way hot. Come back through a 4 dB. How's so it sounding? Us one, two. Jesse, We're how you been? Yeah. Good, Good to, to see, see you guys. Dude. A little this hot still, Jesse. Little a little hot, hot. still. Good right. to see you, man. Good to see you. Thank you. Good to see everybody. How's this sounding now? And just uh, five seconds of continuous speech by yourself okay. with everybody else I'm being quiet. We'll see what Five more are. seconds. How's it sounding? Is it a little hot still? A little bit no, higher? No, not hot. No, you're down. Low. You need to come up. We need, about we need the mutes on the other people. How's it sounding now? I'm going up about five. I'll keep talking. How's it sounding? A little bit higher still. What are we trying to hit? What's the number? It's been a while. Negative 24 is perfect. Negative 24. It seems like I'm pretty close right now. Negative 25. Tiny a little bit more. You should be right A little there. bit more. You're doing a you're doing a good job out of the out of that canyon in the Hollywood Hills there, Jesse. <laughs> you know, I'm planning to come in via my virtual set and it's coming in on my NDI monitor, but for some reason when I pick my video source is NDI on Zoom, it's just coming in black. So I may try restarting Zoom or updating Zoom. If I close out, will I come back in as a, a attendee? No, no, you'll come back, in as a you'll come back in as a panelist. Okay, you could, so you could let me try. You could tighten up your shot a little bit so the corners of your green screen don't show too. Yeah, then you'll see when I come, if I ever do come in with my virtual set, then I'm going to be way too big for my desk. So uh, anyway, let me let, so I just let me try right now. If there's if there's anyone that's attendee is joining and is uh, interested in being on the virtual production panel, uh, in in the hopes of addressing or answering questions and participating on screen in the conversation, uh, you should raise your digital hand in the participants panel of Zoom so that the, uh, the meeting host can bring you onto the panel and we can do a video and mic check if, uh, if you're interested in being on the panel. I did, I posted about this in a, in a couple virtual production boards, so there's possible that we have some newcomers, but maybe not. I got my eye on it, Nick, so I'll, I've got the attendees panel open. And the rule okay, for those of you coming in for the first time is just that at, you come in and relax for a minute, but then you have to turn your video on or we will eventually bump you back to an attendee. So just get settled. Go ahead, Courtney. I just want to see if my audio is okay. Uh, they're having a book sale on my front porch, so there's a lot of conversation going on in the front yard today. So I may have to stay off. Uh, Could you take your phone out and take some pictures of the books? There may be some things I'm interested <laughs> yeah. in. Yeah, I need a portable camera to go out there and we can browse. That's right. Let's do a live remote from the book sale. sale. That'd be fun. Just a DB or two up, Courtney. Tiny, tiny nudge up. Nudging up. The nudge up. Okay. Gracias. I'm nudged. Courtney, are you going to watch the uh, Oscars by yourself, or are you going to join a watch party? What are you going to do? No, I'll watch. I think I'll watch by myself, yeah. It's coming from Union Station, which is really strange why they moved it to Union Station. I don't know. Maybe they had some competing event at the Dolby Theater. I'm not sure. Probably, really? Probably it's some coming COVID from Union protocol, Station? don't you think? COVID uh, protocol. It could be COVID protocol, but there's no reason why they couldn't do it, you know, you know, maybe it's why they did the Grammys from the Los Angeles Convention Center. Maybe they have more room to spread out, you know, since they don't have to worry about an audience that much. So um, I've trained into the Union, Union Station a Station bunch of times. Is... It seems weird because aren't the trains running? I mean, how? I would think so. Well, I guess it? they're probably on a reduced schedule because of COVID, but I think they're all coming back to normal. I think they yeah. must be. Yeah, the station's I wonder pretty if they're going to do a copy the Grammys, do you think? 
Yeah, but the Grammys had a controlled environment. You know, they were in the L.A. Convention Center, and nothing's going on there, and so they had complete, you know, they had complete control of the whole facility for a week or so to set up and rehearse and do everything else. You know, go ahead. I'm going to defer to Chad there. I was going to ask Arturo, did you have your hand up to say something? Yes, I did. I think I still have to do an audio uh, test, and I think what uh, microphone are you hearing on, you, Arturo? Oh, 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 oh. Mickey's here. Forgot it. Bye. Sorry. Go ahead. What microphone are you on? I'm on my Aeropex because I have tinnitus in one ear, so I, I use this like over over the ear headset. It's not very good, but I can switch if need be. Uh, yeah. If you have a a, a more capable microphone, that would uh, that would be better. Yeah, I will. I also uh, wanted to say that. Well, thanks firstly for having us. I, I work with the CS50 production team uh, over in Cambridge. And um, we're actually, I'm, I'm going to have to duck out a little bit early, so I don't know that um, I'll be hanging around for the virtual production, but that's something that I've been experimenting on my own as well as with the team to try to bring in some of this unreal, unrealness reality into the things that we're doing. So I'm really excited. I messaged Nick as well on the Discord about uh, having done some metahuman creator stuff as well. So I'm excited to watch this back later because uh, it's really yeah. promising. And I'm sure if you know... Mm -hmm. um, Matt, Matt Workman from Cinematographer Database, like he's been doing a lot of really cool stuff with MetaHuman Creator already. Uh, so this should be really fun. And Arturo, all the shows are in back stock on YouTube, so you should be able to look the last three or four Saturdays, and Nick has done deep dives into Unreal for at least the last three weekends. And then there was all series before that. Nick, when did you do the first original? So the, well, we, we did a whole bunch sorry, back sorry, last uh, year. Real quick, because we're at on the hour. Arturo, uh, yeah, please do stay on on the on the panel. But uh, you can stay on those uh, those microphones, which just drop down maybe a, a five or six dB on your on your levels there. Okay, we'll do. Let me see how how is this going. Okay, dropping, 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 dropping. Yes. Can you check on Zoom if you have uh, automatically adjust microphone level checked? Um, I don't have it. Uh, background noise set to low. Uh, echo yeah. cancellation. So, Rick, you have if to talk. I... Sorry. Sorry. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. I thought that you guys were done. Sorry. Go ahead. It's not. Yeah. It's not synced up yet. Unfortunately, I mean, I could, but I have to reroute everything. Okay. Anyway, okay. Sorry. Sorry, Mickey. I I, I didn't mean to inter interrupt you there. Yeah, uh, if uh, automatically adjust microphone volume isn't checked, yeah, just give us a, a bit of a nudge down on your level. Will do. Yeah, I think this is about as low as it can go. But uh, I just wanted to come in and say thanks for having us. I'm really excited to join some of the, the next ones. I'm, I'm unfortunately going to have to drop out, but I'm so, so, so excited to see what you all do with virtual production and then to pick your brains in some future session about this because this is something that we want to implement into what we're doing over at uh, CS15. Our plan yeah, we're, is actually... Yeah. yeah, go ahead, Alex. Yeah, go ahead, Nick. We're, we're about to go way deep. <laughs> Nick and I are about to... We, I might have I might have gotten something signed off for that is way above our... <laughs> So we're, we're about to get real busy with meta. Alex so Lindsay is writing checks that my body might not be able to catch. We'll, <laughs> yeah, so, we'll see so how we'll, this. Is. So if, if if we get as we'll, we'll keep on talking about it on Saturdays, but within a couple months, we're going to be we're going to know a lot about meta humans. So so but yeah, anyway, so. Our, our plan is this is the last lab section where we'll have a focused topic like meta humans, um, but I think going forward, this hour here, this 10 a.m. hour is going to just continue to be. Unreal Engine virtual production, and will be more like the Q&A session, but with the overall topic of virtual production. So Arturo, keep coming back. We're here. Yeah. And, and great to work with you. We're, the idea is to collect just a, what we what we tend to do is look at ways that we can collect a bunch of thinkers together just to trade notes. You know, that's what we're doing every day, seven days a week is just let's let's figure out. And we just kind of so in this hour, I think that we'll end up with more and more people doing talking about Unreal and it will be starting next week, really just an open discussion about it. Like, what are you finding here? And I don't understand why this isn't hooking up or this is, you know, and it'll all just be a focused hour on, on that process. Yeah. And we, of course, we'd love to have you join as often as you can. Well, thanks for, thanks for inviting me to your think tank. Happy to be yeah. a part of it. Awesome. Right. Thanks. Take care all. Yeah. See ya. Go ahead, uh, Courtney. Uh, just, I missed last week. I'm sorry, but, uh, should we have downloaded MetaHuman? I don't have it downloaded in, uh, you might have trouble getting it today. You don't have to. Um, you know, we're going to be talking about it 
it's pretty straightforward to get into. Um, and uh, what I would do is ask questions as as you see it. Um, if you, I don't know if you'll be able to get it downloaded instantly, so you may not. I wouldn't worry about it. What I, I will don't say is try that it during the show, either. <laughs> Yeah, you, yeah, but th during the week, we're going to keep talking about Unreal every hour, every Saturday. So just dive into it. Listen today and dive into it. Next next week, ask a question. That's great. All it right, so we're going to... Oh, go ahead. I was going to let Courtney know it took me a day or two to get uh, approved for it before I could actually get it installed from her. You, like, apply it, uh, apply for it, and then they go, oh, hey, you're in. <laughs> I haven't heard anybody that got turned down. You know, 40, 48 hours or so, you... you Seems to be what it what it took to do that, um, but uh, yeah. So we're gonna shift shift gears here to to Unreal. So we'll talk at least for the next hour, uh, if not more. If it, we'll just see what time we need uh, to do that. And um, go ahead and, and Nick, do you have a, some Rick and Nick and Rick? Uh, do you have anything you want to show? And Rick, I, I have to jump to you real quickly. So you are using a this is a, a meta human inside of Unreal. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Yep. And Audio I also it? have a, I have a, uh, I set up with iClone as well, where I can live link as well. So I can come over here and hit activate link. And then I can actually take control with some iClone animations. So I can actually talk and then move around and, um, you know, talk on the phone a bit, things like that. And then unlink and then snap right back to it. The, the, the hair simulator is a little active. Yeah, <laughs> it's like it the is, wind, yeah. the wind blowing. And again, this is these are early days. We're gonna be able to look back at this and go, remember when we were just pinging around with this and making it work? And and right now, is this, is this tied to your phone? Uh, the face capture is, but not the uh, body. That's all iClone. Mm -hmm. Really yeah. interesting. So, can you show more of the iClone interface and and how you're hitting play on those animations? So yeah, I've got an animation playing here, uh, and I can just hit activate link. And then it'll start going through this animation. And then I can, you know, kind of scrub around and go to different positions. And then if I want, and my screen's really tiny, but I can try to drag some other animations. These are just some pre made uh, iClone animations. Uh, let's see, like, uh, I can't tell what this is. And this is a direct that. link from iClone into Unreal? Correct. Yep. And it's, and it's just sending right the metadata. I was mean, just sending the motion data. It's not sending the model. Correct. Yes. Yeah. So just you know, so, hanging out. Now, so iClone is from Real Illusion, and iClone itself is that. I know they have a free tool, and then there's like add-ons that that cost have their cost. You know, add-ons. Is iClone? Is there a charge for iClone itself? Because I know that they received an Epic grant to be able to connect MetaHumans with it, and that that component itself is free. But I wasn't sure. Yeah, the well, they did get a, an Epic or a Mega grant. Um, their tools do cost money. Uh, I don't remember the exact cost, and I'll be honest, they're they are the masters of the upsell. They give you just enough of a taste to want you to buy more, buy more morphs, more more sculpts, more plugins. So once you get into it, you you really dig it into it pretty heavily, but um, I wish I'd just give you like a package deal, but I haven't seen anything like that. But um, when they got their mega grant, they have the Unreal Live Link plugin, which is allowing this. That was originally about $1,500, but when they got that, they gave away uh, licenses for free to indie developers. And um, that's what happened after the uh, mega grant. And so was there any setup to do the to get the meta human skeleton linked to the iClone skeleton. Cause I mean, internally each one has their own structure and usually there's like a remapping step involved. And it looks to me like if, if you're playing the unreal, I'm sorry, the, the iClone screen, that's the meta human hand and feet. It looks to me like you've exported or someone's exported the, the meta human base body, you know, without the clothes, it's just the hands and feet that are sticking out. Um, so when you're dragging and dropping, you're dragging iClone animations onto the metahuman skeleton. And so is that remapping built in or is that something that needed set up? That needed set up. Um, you're correct. I exported the um, body mesh, skeleton mesh to uh, 3D Exchange, which is also another uh, Reillusion uh, application. 
imported that into iClone and then um, I then transferred that. So in iClone, there's a feature where you select your skeleton, you set up your live link. So this is the live link. You choose your um, your character and then you transfer it over to iClone or uh, Unreal. And then in there, that's where the real work was. You had to retarget your meshes. You had to reconfigure your blueprint to see the correct skeleton and to um, trigger on start kind of thing. Um, so that was kind of a process. And honestly, I I wasn't sure if I'd get it in time. I got it probably about six o'clock yesterday afternoon. <laughs> so um, I was lucky so I got it that on time. Number one, thanks for doing that to share it because um, I haven't had time to, to play with the iClone tools yet in relation to MetaHuman. And all of that retargeting then is happening in iClone so that the live link plugin is just streaming the metahuman skeleton from iClone back over to Unreal. And so Unreal really doesn't have any translation to do on its end. It's just getting what it thinks is a native skeleton, right? No, actually it's it's not actually the translation's done in Unreal. Um, okay, so you did the, okay, I misunderstood then. Yep. Do you, are you able um, to open up any of the blueprint, uh, animation blueprint uh, adjustments that you did for that? Yeah, yeah, I could probably do that. So let's see here. Um, yeah. And I, further, I might, I might crash my machine. By the way, so let me, uh, let me stop. If here. you do, I mean, I'm ready to pick up. I have some of my own stuff in these areas. Uh, I was using Motion Builder um, to do much the same thing to retarget motion capture animations. So, sure. So I had to, like I had to add this, uh, and it's really hard to see my screen. It's so tiny right now. Um, I also had to add the body in, in replace of the uh, original skeleton. And then the same with over here. Um, I also had to replace the original skeleton with the body and then retarget it here. So now that the body that you're pointing to now, that's now connected, is that that's the body coming in through the iClone live link? Correct. Yes. Okay. And then it's and so retargeting then to the metahuman um, body blueprint. Yep. Okay, and so where are you doing the remapping? Are you, are you able to show the nodes so that actually right, doing? So right here, the parent class went from the original yeah. skeleton mesh to the uh, blueprint for Cooper, who's the base for this. And then okay. it's really hard to see. So, And then I had to retarget this mesh to um, the mesh that I'd... Wait, <laughs> let me correct this. So I retarget the mesh that I imported from iClone to the mesh of Unreal then. Okay. If that makes sense, yeah. So so iClone is actually sending out its own native skeleton and mesh. That's yes. coming in live link into Unreal. And then what you're showing there in the blueprint in Unreal is it's picking up the iClone mesh and essentially retargeting those joints, those movements onto the metahuman. And, yes. and so that's your setup. Okay. Yes. Cool. Yep. I will eventually have the um, face as well because then I can record in iClone. They've got some really good uh, like lip sync and correction tools and their facial um, uh, animation tools are pretty incredible. But as far as the capture, I just like going from the iPhone straight into Unreal. It's pretty simple and straightforward. Yeah, I'm I'm finding the same thing. I've um, in order to help Alex get into trouble, I just used an iPad to do a, a facial uh, animation really quickly. Uh, but I am finding the the live link face is is somewhat limited and and not particularly accurate, and it's hard to get certain facial expressions to really translate well. And uh, so I'm also looking at uh, Faceware. Um, I have Faceware Studio. I think I'm spoiled because I've been using Faceware Analyzer and Retargeter for like over five years now. And and I'm kind of addicted to that right now because there's so many adjustments you can make, but it's a post-process. It's not a live uh, solution. And so all of these live solutions, you know, we're kind of depending on the calculations happening inside that software to just constantly be running and be as accurate as possible. And it, it's there's a little bit of limitation in, in how much you can adjust that. Um, there are adjustments to be made. In fact, uh, you you pointed me out to the the adjustment in terms of, I, I think you're, are you using the, the mouth scrunch uh, 
adjustment to make sure the lips close all the way. Yeah. Yes, I am. Yeah. And it does weird things like where if I make an O, well, it's doing it now, but there you go. <laughs> it's like a Neo in the Matrix when they sealed his mouth shut. <laughs> Yeah. It might be worth mentioning the, the calibration process if you're not familiar. Um, if you look at uh, the LiveLink uh, curve debug as a plugin, that'll give you a, okay. a neutral position and let you know where, where all those curves sit um, natively from the app. So you can see what that incoming data is, then weigh that against what you're seeing on the, the skeleton. Um, so you, you essentially just look at all those floats and see, okay, when my face is sitting in neutral, this is what it's seeing in the, the live link debug. And then you can set now, that as your neutral state to the metahuman. So that can really help with uh, what you're seeing on yeah. some of those poses. Now, is that something that's a, a plugin that needs to be activated on the Unreal side? Or is that in... Mm -hmm. I uh, believe I, in the, in the metahuman like sample, it'll be activated by default. Okay. But that, it's a great great tool for looking at where that, that incoming data is. Um, and you'll see that when your face is in a neutral position, uh, you know, your brow up might be 0.2 or, you know, you might have a lip corner that's like 0.3. So you're not zeroed out um, by default. So that, that gives you a good starting place to then, you know, then you can get uh, curves by name and uh, start to manipulate that data to, to you know, um, essentially establish a profile specific to your face. Yeah. Yeah, and the Facewear uh, Studio tool has like that's like the very first step is to identify a a neutral face pose and make sure to you know click a button and then it records that as neutral and essentially zeroes things out with that. Um, in fact, uh, I can I could probably share this. Do 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 do. Where is too many windows? Okay, so uh, if you're able to see this, this is the Facewear Studio software. And what I've done is opened up, this is a video file. Uh, this, this is just recorded with a, you know, a Sony uh, you know, mirrorless camera on a tripod. So I can identify you know, some point here where I feel like, okay, this is supposed to be my, my neutral pose. I'll try and find a frame where I'm kind of centered there. And then I'll calibrate neutral pose. And so now this is Facewear's analysis of my face. And then it's immediately retargeting to, to their target face. And, uh, and so then now if I play this, um, you know, oh, there's my cue that, okay, I'm going to start a take here. And, and so then this is the retarget result. And then with that, I can, there's some built in essentially multipliers here that are really quick and easy to adjust. So if there's something that I spot in the uh, in my pose that I don't like in the in the metahuman, I could adjust it. So for example, I feel like maybe you know my eyes. I feel like they're both open right now, but this eye looks a little cl more closed. So I might you know yeah. So here we go. Eye wide left. You know I I might adjust this value this multiplier here. Um, there we go. To change, you know, a little bit how that that eye is responding. Actually, I guess that's this eye. Um, so yeah, this, and this this will work from either a file or from uh, a live video feed. So this this will accept a feed directly from my decklink board, for example. So I could be using a uh, you know a, a black magic camera or anything that I can capture video from. So I could use a SDI. HDMI or, or USB video source live. Cool. Do you guys Mark, want to jump did you have any anything questions? else? Or, or, I'm sorry, Rick. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Questions. Yeah, we got a couple questions rolling in. Hey, Jesse. It's good to see you. <clears throat> okay. Our first one comes from Eddie Martinez in Palisadro. And Eddie says, what is required to use an 80-inch LED behind talent and extend beyond that LED screen with a very large virtual background. Can you still get parallax and camera tracking features for smaller moves? And he's looking for a hardware list, Vive trackers and base stations, DSLR, LED 80 inch, and what else? He wants to be able to skip the whole green screen experience and do straight LED. 
Sure. I mean, what you're describing is a suite of hardware, and there are a lot of options with every step of the way, right? So when you go with the LED screen itself, there's a variety of brands, and that each one of those LED walls is, is an assembly of panels. So there's a lot of different options in terms of the panels, and you, you, you compare their brightness and their contrast and, and the pitch of the size of the pixels. And so you're going to get, you know, lower cost panels are going to not be as bright, not have as much contrast, have larger pixels, um, maybe have more obvious seams than higher cost ones. Um, those panels then need a controller that's going to be driving them. And then they're going to need a uh, dedicated, uh, basically an end display uh, workstation that's going to run Unreal Engine's end display plug-in so that it'll be able to receive the, the scene and the camera informo information and, and the tracking information, get that all displayed properly on the uh, actual LED wall. Uh, when it comes to the cameras and tracking, I, I heard DSLR mentioned. I generally wouldn't recommend the use of a DSLR with a, uh, a full virtual production LED wall. Um, they're they're just difficult to sync they also have they tend to use rolling shutter in their sensor so what's happening is the the pixel rows at usually it's the top end of the um frame are actually being exposed earlier than the lower end of the frame so it's you know it's exposing and, and recording row by row i mean it's really really fast for us visually we usually don't notice it unless you kind of really jiggle the camera back and forth and then the whole world looks a little like jello but that'll wreak havoc with the ability to synchronize the camera capturing a frame and the LED wall firing the LEDs. So you always want to have the camera and the LED wall in absolute perfect sync. We call that Genlock. And so you'd want a camera that supports Genlock so that the uh, Genlock generator, and, and Blackmagic makes a really small one that, that can work, it'll fire off a click, essentially, a digital click. It's not actually digital, it's an, an analog pulse. Um, that tells the LED wall, uh, NVIDIA display, graphics board, that now generate your frame now. It tells the camera, take a frame now, and that all happens simultaneously. And, and that way you don't get tearing in the, the LED wall. So rather than DSLR, you would want to have a broadcast camera that's capable of, of Genlock. And then you want to track that camera, so there's a variety of solutions. I mean, Blacktrax, uh, Mosis, Stipe, I mean, all of these are dedicated solutions for just tracking a single camera, or you could use a more generic motion capture system. In our studio, we have a, a Vicon system and we have an OptiTrack system, and they're able to track cameras, but they're also able to track full body performance and, and props and things like that. But they're, they might be overkill for just tracking a camera, so that's where Stipe, Moses, Black Tracks, things like that really come into play where you can uh, track the, the camera. Um, I know a lot of people are using Vive trackers, and I think for home solutions and green screens and experimenting, those are great ways, and, and certainly for low-cost, low-budget uh, startups. Um, but the Vive trackers, again, they don't synchronize with the screen and the camera frame. Uh, so that's where like these dedicated systems, whether it's a full mocap system or a camera tracking system, they will accept those frame synchronization signals and make sure that the tracking data stays in sync with all of that. So there you go. There's the overview. And our next question up. Well, we've got hands raised, so. Yeah, uh, go for it. Oh, did Alex? No, Alex is still here. Good. Just keep going. I'm playing with a metahuman while, while everyone's talking. So I'm, I'm trying to work. I'm, it keeps me in the, in the zone. But yeah, keep uh, go ahead, go uh, ahead Bill. Courtney. Just keep running the conversation. I'll jump in if needed. Well, Courtney's got his hand up. Yeah, um, Courtney's got his hand up. Just to jump back to the previous demo of, of expression capture, and does is there a mode that you drop into where you could use a head-mounted witness camera? Uh, so it, it tracks everything. You're not tracking everything in 3D space, but just the facial expressions in 3D space so that you can use that to paste that into Unreal Engine. And does it translate that into the the head skeletal movement, and is it more accurate to, to track with a head-worn uh, witness cam? So the answer is yes. Um, essentially, the way the so so Blueprint is a background. Blueprint is the internal node-based uh, scripting language inside Unreal Engine, and uh, animation blueprints are designed essentially to route 
animation data, incoming data, and reroute it to the whatever the character joints and, and controls that they are that you actually want to manipulate. And so metahumans are set up in such a way that, and I think Rick was just demonstrating it earlier, where you can have body animation coming in from one source, and it could be you know, iClones animation, it could be an animation file, FBX, that's loaded into Unreal. Um, and it could be, or it could be live from a motion capture system for that matter. But the facial expressions could be driven by something else. Now, in, in Rick's case at the moment, he's using his iPhone mounted on a uh, something that's, that's stationary. But you could instead wear a head-mounted rack or, or stand, essentially, that holds either the iPhone and, and uses that, or um, or even a camera. So the facewear, the full suite of facewear, for example, is is a helmet with a bracket and a really really tiny, super lightweight uh, HD camera that also has built-in LED lighting. And so we have this rig that it basically lights the face perfectly for facial capture, and it's got this camera with a known fixed lens that, that captures the face properly. And um, all of that then streams through this Faceware Studio. And again, inside Unreal, you can have the, the facial expressions being driven by that camera and Faceware Studio, while the motion capture system, uh, let's say Vicon or OptiTrack, for example, is actually tracking the head movements because there's reflectors on the head movements. Or the head movement could be driven by an animation. Um, I actually personally, like in, in my experimentation over the last week or so, I actually like having, uh, when using the Facelink live software, I like having the phone anchored on a tripod. And, and that way the facial expressions can be done in sync with the head motions. So it, there's a checkbox as to whether or not the head motions are driven by that live link software. And so if the the iOS device is on a tripod, it's in a locked fixed position, and you're moving your head, you can actually get those head rotations, pitch and yaw, to go uh, into the metahuman and move the head, while everything from essentially the neck down has to be driven by either an animation or motion capture or something else. And I know you did a, oh. a pretty good job of tracking without tracking markers or without any witness markers on the face. Is it that a requirement in any way, or does it handle that pretty well without markers so it's using you know the idea that that humans are generally fairly consistent in in where their noses and their eyes and eyebrows and chins and things like that are um, so if if you have all of those things it's going to use those landmarks as tracking points and so that if the nose in the camera frame appears to one side or the other of the chin and the space between the eyes, then chances are the head's turned this way. And so it's basically, you know, dialing in settings. Um, if you were displaying the the full data that's in the live link, you can, there's an option where you can show all the data feeds at once. There's actually, you'll see head rotation, head yaw, head pitch. And um, it's basically deriving that based on the, the physical landmarks on the face. Um, I know when we use facewear in the studio, we will uh, a lot of times use like a um, eyeliner pencil to you know add dots to the face, especially if someone's got you know really fair complexion, um, in order for the software to be able to like kind of latch on to some landmarks and all. So um, it it can help, but it's not absolutely necessary. Being clean shaven helps as well. <laughs> If Courtney got taken care of there, Rick Markley held up some hardware. Do you want to show us really quickly before we go to Mickey? Mickey has the next question in line. Uh, sure. This is just my, uh, it's an iPhone 12 on a <coughs> tripod with a mount, and that's what's tracking my face right now. Okay, so you can do something as simple as an iPhone on a, on a stand. Uh, go ahead, Mickey. Uh, yeah, sorry, I lost my train of thought of that. Um, it's quite a dense, uh, the, yes. uh, so much information here, so... <laughs> ideas move quickly. Oh. Yeah. All right. Fair enough. Uh, so we'll go to the next question, which comes from Randy in Thunder Bay. And Randy says, what do you think of the core games platform for Unreal? Useful or limited? I'm actually not familiar with it. It's, it's funny. I know Unreal Engine is is considered a game engine. I actually don't use it for games. So Me, this... me either. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> it's interesting. It came out of there, but it's gone so far beyond that that it's it's hard to to go back to the roots. Uh, Arturo Arturo Real of Cambridge, Massachusetts, says, "What ex what's exciting you most about MetaHuman?" I made a basic introduction to MetaHuman with the early actress, uh, early access, and have seen some great progress from Matt Workman over at Cinematographer Database. Anybody excited by any specific aspect of the software or what they're doing with it? It's free. <laughs> I mean, that's always this, an exciting thing. This level of human character rig. Um, was really relegated to A-list studios, either in the game uh, studio world or animation, visual effects. Um, now, this this is slightly still behind them, right? So if I, I speak to a company that that's dedicated in, in high-end um, hero digital characters, you know, the MetaHuman's interface is probably a, a year or two behind what state of the art is inside the studios and their own development, but it is a huge leap for the general public's ability to access this, right? So this means that we can uh, readily create far more believable and engaging digital presence. Um, we, can, we can create simulations and animations that, that look for very, very effective. And I, honestly, as someone who teaches this in, at a university, this is a great example to like, okay, you know, let's just dissect this right now. Like, look how the connections are made and what's going on. I mean, some of the really impressive things that are built into this, and, and we almost take for granted, is is there are uh, wrinkle maps, you know, there are displacements and normal maps that change and blend when the skin stretches. So if you have a character that's, you know, of, of a certain age and they smile really big, like the, the cheeks, you know, will, 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 basically ruffle <laughs> you know and and that's all that's not in the geometry always that's that's sometimes that's just in the normal maps you could find those normal maps you could see where those details were added and then you can actually you know none of it is compiled like a lot of times you know you might get a compiled tool set uh, a dll and not really understand what's going on under the hood metahumans is completely open you can just start double clicking your way through each and every level of what's going on and absolutely dissect everything that goes into building them. And it, it makes it very customizable. So those are the things in general that make it really exciting to me. And, and number one, it's just the sheer accessibility. You yeah, know? it seems like one of those software programs that has so much depth to it that you're really, for the first few years you're using it, you're still exploring and discovering. Are there things on the other side of him? He's asking what excites you most. Are there little I wish it woulds that, that the people who are using it in the panel have run across that might be useful to chat about? I, I've got a few. I, I'd, like to, um, I'd like to be able to put in my own models at least or put in my own imagery i don't think you'd be able to do like a headshot like kind of thing from character creator because there's just not enough information from a still but i'd love to be able to take in a photogrammetry screen of myself and be able to adjust it and to, to comment on some of the things i'm excited about it's cool to be able to take a couple of characters and then create offspring like create a family from them really easily i mean they look like they're related you know, you can make a, a really nice family really quickly and, and you know. So you want a genetics strand. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you kind of get that. If you've played with it, you you can morph between different characters or uh, scans. And and then um, I'm hoping that I can take my creation eventually and then be able to take that and then morph that off of other creations as well. So I'm hoping that it gets to be a point where we can loop back on our own creations and then iterate off of that. You're talking about in the the interface where you can blend like three different models characteristics correct yes yeah it's also so part of part of what's really interesting with meta humans and um and so I, i'm i'm speaking from coming from a, a large publisher so um we have a lot of different titles and um and the the character creation process can be can be months if you're talking about a hero character and what's interesting with MetaHumans is that Epic is introducing an entire ecosystem for character creation and basically leveling the playing field by democratizing the tools that 
you know, to this level, what we have internally is these massive teams that create uh, skeleton systems, automation within Maya. Um, we construct, uh, you know, the skinning process, image scanning, all these components that, you know, Vlad's team over at uh, Three Lateral and Cubic Motion and all of them coming together with those epic acquisitions over the last couple of years has allowed this entire system that, you know, is a, is a team of 30 to 100 artists for us internally at a large publisher down to a cloud-based character creation system that is accessible to anyone. Uh, so it's, it's incredibly interesting because I think we're going to start to see all new streams of content creation. Um, as you see here, you'll see avatars being piloted in live streams. Um, you'll, you'll see these alternate personas and kind of expanding the metaverse. But uh, even just from a machinima perspective, this is interesting because it, this is a huge process for us internally. Um, you know, some of the, the, the trailers that, that uh, we, we compile, the deliverables, it, it takes an entire army of artists to create something to this level. And, um, and now it's, uh, you know, we kind of have a shared language as well. So for us as a, a large game publisher and with a lot of different studios, we're able to speak the same language as far as skeletons and character creation. And uh, we work closely with Epic and this is, um, it, this allows us to have a system that uh, everyone's referencing you know, the same blueprints or the same facial rig, uh, the work that's being done with control rig. Um, so having that natively inside of the engine, all these systems now are completely accessible. What was essentially the secret sauce behind AAA game development and, uh, you know, major motion picture visual effects for facial and body is, has been, that's been uh, distilled down into a readily accessible package for anyone. Um, and I, that's kind of all part of the democratization efforts with Epic. Um, but this is, you know, just to, to speak from the high level, this is interesting to everyone, everyone across the industry. Um, because now we're, we're all looking at a, a common ground for facial, which has kind of been pretty voodoo uh, up until this moment where, you know, with the fax system and there's a lot of different... Um, standards that have been at pl in play and you know you've got dynamics face wear uh, cubic motion three lateral and now we're starting to see uh, some of that shared language and that that helps for not only just to the smaller content creators but also the larger studios that are creating content at scale jason before you go away of course the next question of i knew somebody was going to ask this what are you using for your circle to track your movements in your map <laughs> Um, this is mm -hmm. it's uh, M M H M M. Um, so just been part of their beta for a while, and I, it should be a public release at this point. Um, it's just a, a Zoom. Uh, it's, it's just a client for allowing you to. Um, it works kind of like an NDI source. Um, it's a separate app that lets you really quickly um, adjust your video. You know, I can kind of float around and uh, reposition it and stuff. So it gives you backgrounds and. Uh, I can do an, an, you know, an alpha key and stuff like that. But it's it's a. Can you do an overlay of your? Can you do an overlay of your screen like so that you're just a circle in the corner while you're screen mm -hmm. sharing? Yeah, I'm. I won't. Uh, oh, I that's won't why pop they call it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then I I could add a um, any kind of source. You know, this just might change my backgrounds. I won't. I won't pop up my desktop right now. Oh, but uh, popular Antelope Canyon. Yeah. So um, yeah, this is a great one. Cool. There's a. It's a little bit. Uh, you know, it's it's still early. Um, the Windows version, I don't I don't think is even a a full release yet. But um, go check it out. Nick, do you want to walk through some? I see Jesse Schwartz has a build there, and do you want to talk to any of the people who have got? Hey, sure. I can show you guys around my virtual set if you're curious. Go for it. So one of the things that was exciting for me was when Twin Motion started getting more integrated into Unreal. Unreal bought the program and initially there was no way to bring anything from Twin Motion into Unreal. Uh, what Twin Motion has is a lot of tools that are very geared towards visualization and easy space creation. So the stuff that I'm in now was initially the geometry made in SketchUp, then brought in with a direct link into Twin Motion. 
and that was a dead end before, like last year when I used to come on here. Now they're they're at their second beta of a data smith into Unreal. And this is then that twin motion file brought into Unreal. Uh, and in twin motion, things like creating plants that have a little bit of motion, creating uh, characters, there's a variety of things that you can do that are very complicated in Unreal. Uh, at the moment, not all animated objects that you create in twin motion are supported to be brought into Unreal. But you can see maybe that some of these plants are swaying a bit and the lighting and the materials come in, which uh, you couldn't do if you just brought something in otherwise. Let me show you a couple other views I've got here. I'm going to call out the fact that your Sororo is a little too pale, only because <laughs> I grew up in Arizona and I've had intimate associations with lots and lots of cactus over my youth. <laughs> <laughs> That was maybe True. a little Th more this information one, yeah. that we needed to know there, Bill. <laughs> Keeping it real here. If we have time someday in another thing, let me tell you the story of Cactus Boy. It's a creepy story, but great. And then, okay, let me switch to this. So this is actually what it looked like in Twin Motion. And I, I brought this exact model into Unreal, but at this point, they're not supporting the animated characters. They're not supporting animated humans. There's a bunch of stuff that I think, I mean, it sounds like they're planning to integrate almost all the components of Twin Motion into Unreal. Uh, so this is just a little fly through of the environment in Twin Motion. And the way I'm showing it in Unreal is I just have a camera, an NDI camera that's fixed on this video. Uh, but some of the, the different things you can bring in, like the helicopters, the whole whole bunch of different vehicles. They're just a lot of Where did you get the helicopter? Items. Is that built into that's is twin the motion. That's no no this is it's all in twin, motion? in twin motion, yeah. And did the helicopter come over to Unreal? No. So every right. everything yeah. I just want to add yeah, a helicopter. They have me. if you it's a bit of a painful data smith install where you have to go to their box drive, grab some really large files, open them and, and do all that. But there there is a PDF that explains at this point what comes in and what doesn't come in. So vehicles at the moment are not supported or as are animal. You know, they, they said animals come in, just not animated, but none of my animals came in. So, so you know, what I wanted to share, I, I feel like one of the big things is that Epic is building this ecosystem. You know, it was it was mentioned earlier. You know, with Jason, in the, that now you know you can involve architects, interior designers in their native language in in Twin Motion because Unreal Engine at its core. I mean, it, it grew up from being a game engine, and even as a visual effects artist, compositor, like there are things that like when I get into trying to do compositing with it like there's there's a little part of my, the compositor in me that dies when I have to use some of the tools um, but by having twin motion now if you're going to build a, a stage and an event location if you're just going to build an actual space that's going to be a virtual space you can involve genuine interior designers genuine architects in that conversation bring their uh, experience in and then all of that is, you know, a lot of it's transferring semi-seamlessly into Unreal right now, and that'll just continue to expand. And so now you can tie in, you know, the metahumans with that and the, the cesium that we looked at a week or so ago where you can now bring in full GIS scans and satellite uh, imagery and such. Uh, John? Oh, you're muted still. Zoom you're muted still, John. Didn't hit the button. Uh, is is Twin Motion a pre Jesse? Is Twin Motion a pre after you're done, say, you know, with AutoCAD? Even if you rendered it in 3D in AutoCAD, you would bring it into here to put plants and people yeah. walking around yeah. and stuff. Twin. I don't know about AutoCAD. The programs that are supported with what they call Direct Link, which will let you consistently update it from your 3D modeling package into Twin Motion. 
The ones I know that are supported are Revit, which is Autodesk's 3D, similar to AutoCAD, but more robust 3D creation software, and SketchUp Pro, and uh, I believe ARCHICAD. So that's usually where you start to bring things into Twinmotion. But you may be able to, if you're just using AutoCAD and you do have something in 3D created, there's probably a file format you could bring it in. It just wouldn't be supported as a direct link, which would be constant updates without re-importing it. Okay, is it time to move on to the next question? Ken Jordan from Surrey, UK is in with, can or will the LiDAR on the iPhone, iPad be used to help the tracking in MetaHuman? Interestingly, the LiDAR doesn't actually scan skin very well. I mean, just go ahead and try and, and capture somebody's head with the LiDAR uh, on an iPad, and you end up with this kind of flat, mushy ball. <laughs> and and I, I suspect that part of that is just how the infrared laser light is being you know reflected and absorbed and subsurface scattering going on in human skin. Um, so, uh, it's, it's honestly, it's the depth camera that is used, you know, it, iOS has it integrated for unlocking, you know, face ID and it's, you know, so it's a set of, it's a depth, uh, camera array and that's, what's being used. And, um, that's actually more effective than, than LIDAR in terms of tracking a human face. Um, Nick, have you, I suspect, do you know if anybody's yeah. been doing any testing to see if makeup and or blotting and things like that helps or hurts? Is it, mm -hmm. is it reflectivity or do you have guesses? Jason's nodding. Yeah, yeah. The the so um just to to break down a couple of the pieces of technology here. And sorry if my my Unreal is slowing down my video. Um, so the um, Apple's AR kit which is the, the, the facial recognition. So that, that front facing sensor. Um, so that, that is sending data into, um, Epic's live link face app. Um, and it's, that's worth mentioning because that, the, those, that curve data, which are just essentially the floats, uh, zero to one that's, uh, streaming the information according to the different landmarks. So there's 52 established through AR kit. Um, it's worth noting that that's the app that's streaming that data. So um, when you look at different technologies, it's it's essentially it's going to be up to Epic to implement, uh, say, li lidar into the future that uh, future update for that app. Um, but uh, so the first the the makeup question, uh, anything that can help the phone distinguish those specific landmarks, like Nick said earlier, is is going to help you. Um, you can certainly see a point of diminishing returns if you put 100 dots in your face versus, you know, maybe 10 key dots. But, um, you know, the face is, you can actually see this on the phone app um, when you turn on the outlines, you know, the kind of the onion skin of what it's tracking. You can see the brows, you can see the lips and, um, you know, the nose line and then uh, where the, the, the insides of the eyes. And so if you look, if you correlate that to where you could place dots to help the phone see contrast um, where those specific landmarks are, then you're going to see benefit because otherwise the phone is just looking at, you know, a patch of, of skin um, that may not have the right contrast or it may, you, your lips may not be accentuated enough for it to understand what is, you know, left lip corner up um, versus your, you smiling in a neutral pose. So, uh, so the kind of makeup that actors do to hide blemishes actually works against you in terms of this and and maybe adding beauty marks or things as similar things that let the camera track better might help. Is that what I'm hearing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and there, there's if you if you look up um, th there's some interesting research and, and, you know, if you're kind of looking to get it a little bit in the weeds, you can look up the fax system, which illustrates um, the facial action coding system, which is illustrating how these these different landmarks and it, it it's broken down the specific poses of the human face. Um, you can you can start to disseminate some of that information and see oh okay, then this is how that sensor is working. Oh, it's looking for these certain patterns in the face and this movement and this contrast, and then you can look to apply makeup in those areas. And 
Um, just a simple uh, application of a handful of dots, you know, being clean shaven, making sure the lips are revealed. Um, you know, if you don't have as pronounced eyebrows, you can start to accentuate those a little bit more. But um, you have to you have to weigh that against what the performance is if you're trying to accurately replicate yourself or if it's stylized. Um, there's a lot of different approaches, but there's certainly something to be gained by virtue of how the systems are currently working. So, and that's, that's, so um, to avoid running off on too many tangents, but the, these are, mul there's multiple different systems. So speaking about dynamics or face where you have, you know, RGB video being fed into um, and analyzing software that's looking at all those landmarks moving and those points and changes. And then you build a profile that's specific to the performer. Um, and that's just 2D video being analyzed. And so it's the same advantage. If you have markers that are distinguishing those landmarks, then there's an advantage there versus um, leaving it up to the camera to understand where the lips are and the, the eyebrows and so forth. And that the same applies to Apple's AR kit. Uh, even though it's a, a sensor measuring, um, I think, you know, 300 or 500 various points on the skin or on the face, um, it's still the same concept of there are distinguished landmarks and that's what it's looking for and tracking and that it's sending that data over to to Unreal or, you know, whatever the, the client is. Nice. Yeah, and there's a translation happening there in that it's not saying, you know, these are the coordinates of this part of the lip. It's actually saying, well, this is how much zero to one is the upper lip raised or, or the left upper lip or the right upper lip. So it's, you know, that's internal to the tracking software, whether it's live link face or faceware or any other solution. Ultimately, the data being sent is a small set of controls, not entirely unlike a game controller, um, but it's, you know, it's how much am I moving this part of the face zero to one zero it's not moving at all it's not moved at all and, and one it's moved as far as that muscle could possibly pull it so to, to kind of wrap up the lidar conversation um the so the because that is measuring depth what could be interesting what epic could implement in a future update is uh, background removal looking at the lidar sensor to help with um removing the subject in the foreground from the background to help improve the tracking, especially along the jawline, um, and probably help with some of the head movement to, to see, um, you know, especially as you start to turn your head off and you see your profile change and those landmarks are starting to change and being warped because of the perspective of the camera, the LIDAR might help to, to fill some of those gaps. But again, it's, it's going to be up to, you know, it's up to the individual developers. And at the moment, most of that is you know, if, if we're talking live link, then that's that Epic's specific app, a live link face app. Yeah, has anybody checked out the, uh, is it Cam, uh, live Cam AR? What is it? Cam Track AR? I just downloaded it, but it supposedly allows you to do something similar to that. You can actually remove backgrounds. If you have a green screen, you can actually um, remove it out, but then you can also insert AR objects into the scene. But when you hit record, you can actually track camera data along with that and then export that to like after effects or something like that but supposedly it's kind of like virtual production right in your iphone that seems pretty interesting yeah they, that's a really talented team there they've got some really cool stuff in the works but um yeah it's kind of a you know mocha for after effects or just um uh, camera plate tracking it just now um sort of democratized into an app um, they've got some really cool stuff coming up on the new ipad as well Nice. We have one more question, so we'll stretch it out a little bit, or hopefully maybe somebody has some other ones out there. Cami uh, Vanzafik uh, says, given the issues between Epic and Apple, is there any other software that's getting close to what they are doing in Unreal that might have a better future on Mac OS? Anybody see anything on the horizon from I mean, any other manufacturer? Go ahead. Rick. Unity is about the only thing I can think of, but you know, that's a pretty big competitor already. So, Unity, Unity is the other option, <clears throat> but it's not. I don't think that right now they're in the same space. I mean, when you look at MetaHuman and you look at a lot of the other things, I don't know if they're they're a different solution. You know, for for something different. I, I, there are a couple of us that work pretty closely on the iOS platform, and so we are kind of watching 
the legal ramifications <laughs> you know, of, you know, if the, the main thing is, is that a lot of the frustration that I've had with the legal battle between Epic and Apple is that Epic had a clean shot and then they, they muddied the water, you know, so they had a clean shot of just owning it. And now if, if Apple, if Apple shows up in June with unity on the stage, it's just not, it's just going to be complicated. You know, you're going to see a lot of developers go different directions. And so what was a nice, clean experience for us as knowing what the path was, we now have to like pay attention to it. <laughs> you know, and so, so like we had kind of forgotten who Unity was, you know, for a lot of us, we, I started in Unity. I mean, most of our early tests in 2016 and 2017 were all Unity, Unity stuff. And, um, but uh, you know, Unreal was moving so far ahead that we were, we were kind of in a mode of, okay, well we, we, we can now settle in and now it's not that clear. So, so it's, that's, I think a lot of us that are upset about Epic going down this path with Apple is just, mo it's not because we don't like Epic. It's because we had a nice clean, like we, we do this, it's all going to work. You know, they're showing up on stage. It means that they're all part of that, that, that family. And, uh, now they're not. <laughs> so, 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 you know, they'll never be on stage again with Apple. So we know that that kind of nice clean connection is, is gone forever. Um, and, uh, and that you know, if Apple starts putting Unity on every on every event, because the problem is, is that the, the fight was happening when it didn't matter. You know, when AR hits, like really hits, that's when all this stuff matters. And and so if Apple starts pushing another platform, it it was just an unforced error in my opinion. <laughs> so that, that's my as a as a user, that's my frustration is that it was it was it's just kind of like you were winning sixty to nothing, <laughs> and, and now it's going to be like sixty to. 35 or 60 to 40 and still enough time in the, on, the, you know, that, that's the problem. So yeah, go ahead, Apple, Courtney. Apple and, um, sorry, go ahead, Courtney. Oh, well, go ahead and finish your statement. Yeah, go, 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 go Jason. Topic. Go Jason. Um, so the, the, the potential silver lining, um, is f Apple has repaired a few relationships in the past, which is good. Um, some longstanding feuds, but, uh, Apple and, or sorry, um, uh, Epic games, uh, as the publisher and Epic Games uh, um, Unreal Enterprise are luckily, you know, two different organizations. Uh, so there, there is some opportunity there for for Epic Unreal to to publish to the App Store. Oh, I don't think I don't think there's any issue with Unreal publishing to the App Store. I don't think that there's any danger of that. It's mostly that it's mostly a a public image thing of new developers because what's going to happen is we're at the very tip of this hockey stick. Um, and, and so as that hockey stick comes up, as new developers come in, if they're all seeing tons of messaging from Apple around unity, it just means that there's a ton of competition that that's, you know, coming in, which is probably good. Competition is good for everybody, but, but it was just a, it was just simple before. <laughs> yeah. 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 We we're, we're in the same boat of looking across, you know, the technical debt we have or the, you know, the relationship with Epic and yeah, that certainly can can jeopardize some large studios that have dependencies on Unreal. So we, yeah, it's 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 tricky. But I I think um, I think they're they're certainly mindful from the the Unreal perspective, uh, and I think there's there's they'll they'll hope to to deploy those those apps and and manage that relationship from the perspective of all those cl clients and. I mean, it's and, and it, right now I think that Epic is. I mean, Unreal is clearly technologically way ahead, in my opinion, of of Unity for most of the stuff that we do. I mean, Unity has its own strengths, yeah. but I think that's the that's the challenge. And they have some they have some interesting. Uh, check out that space in about six months or so. They're going to have some some interesting stuff in the works there. So, Epic lots, or lots or, to be or, about. or 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 uh, Unity. Or, Uni yeah, oh, Unity. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Don't don't uh, don't write them out yet. <laughs> I'm not. Well, well, the thing is, is, is that all I can say is before the lawsuit, I had, and now I don't at all. <laughs> you know, like that's, and that was, an, uh, again, why why it was potentially long term expensive for Epic to go down that path. But we'll see. Nikki? What's the cost of Unity? I mean, Unreal, at, 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 at least at the entry level, is free. Well, what, how do you I think Unity has a similar you? model. I don't think that the model is that much different. I know I don't think we were paying for it. I think it's if you're it's it's a licensing deal when you start publishing, and I don't know what the exact numbers are because we were doing all the R and D, so we weren't publishing anything. We were showing it to people and doing stuff inside of Oculus and you know that kind of thing. So I I don't know, uh, I don't know if there is a price 
until you start publishing and then it becomes a percentage of your uh, of your income i think it's similar in a similar sense that epic is there are a handful of um there's some frameworks within unity that still have a, a, a bit of a paywall um mm -hmm. or a cost associated so um epics uh integration with aj and, and black magic so for for media frameworks some of those additional plugins and extensions to the engine uh, do have a, um, a cost entry on the Unity side. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, there's a lot of really interesting third-party plugins that are kind of filling the gaps for, for virtual camera. Um, uh, if you look at uh, their end display equivalent is, is really good. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, there's some options. It's just at the moment, it's a bit fragmented because there, a lot of those solutions are being filled by uh, third-party vendors that then have a cost associated. So you, you have a slightly uh, cheaper point of entry or, or more affordable well, point think, of entry for Epic at the moment. <laughs> I think I think Epic is just genius. This idea, we'll just buy it and then we make it available to everyone to keep working on it. As soon as uh, Reality Capture was bought, we were like, okay, when is it free? You know, like that, that's the one problem is, is that as soon as you see it, like no one wants to buy it anymore. Like the, no one wants to buy it anymore because we we're like, eventually they're just going to let it go. So yeah, go ahead, Courtney. Yeah. Go ahead, Courtney. You've been waiting a while. <laughs> I was. It's a change of topic, so I just want to let you guys finish that thread of thought. But um, what about uh, deep fake software? I know it's not real time, uh, and it's an AI type based uh, engine. But for character development, because it seems to be able to surpass, pull you out of the re the uncanny, uncanny valley fairly successfully, whereas most of these real time uh, facial capture and you know. Uh, uh, character animators seem to keep you firmly planted in the uncanny Candy Valley. Do you think that's going to have a impact on real time software if they can get the speed up? I, I, think, I, so. I, think, I, I think so, and I also think. I was going to say I think so, and I also think that I think that uh, pairing deep fakes with something like a meta human has a lot of potential. I mean, you have a meta human base, and then pair it with a deep fake, and then you know you have something really interesting. But, but certainly I mean, not I think real you'd have time. Have to right. do do a deep fake first to understand, you know, what what you're asking, um, because it's it's there isn't a whole lot of like tweaking effort, but there's a lot of calculation involved. And so I've had a bunch of our students have been experimenting with deep fake, and you know they're leaving graphics workstations or working for you know a day or two on on a on a clip. So we we have a while like obviously everything always gets faster and always gets cheaper and so is there a day in the future when deep fake is running just the way like a uh, uh i don't know instagram filter works maybe um but we're really far from that right now i do think rick's note about you know being able to do a deep fake onto a metahuman is kind of is, is so it's kind of a finishing as a finishing pass but it's still something, yeah, but it's still something that is more of the uh, traditional shoot it, you know, there's a post-production time uh, pipeline involved rather than something that you would use on a on a day-to-day, -day, uh, you know, something that you're going to broadcast daily or something, you know, that's going to be done live. I mean, I think that one of the things that's a, that we all assume is probably there somewhere in the, in the depths of, of R&D over at Epic is that uh, in the same way that iClone can take photos that you could build he meta humans where I have a couple photos of a photo of a face and it'll just map all these trajectories to it so that it will give me something that looks a lot like it so that people could be their own characters in, in games or in VR and so on and so forth. Obviously, there's some uh, PR issues or legal issues that, that come like with that. But I think that that is uh, I think that's coming. I, I mean, mean, I can certainly Rick, Rick, I can certainly envision. I was just going to say that it wouldn't be a stretch for a, a machine learning system to take a photogrammetry input of a face and it for it to be able to derive all the landmarks and map that to the metahuman geometry. Yeah, one of the things that I'm I'm looking at doing, we I have to match a couple of people to a to build a metahuman for, from their face, and one of the things I'm looking at doing is just having them use Bella's 3D and just do the whole move your face up and down and give me a 3D model back so that I can basically put that geometry over top of the geometry that comes out of MetaHuman and just see, oh, I'm off here, I'm off here a little bit, and just have them just sitting on top of each other. So I, can, you know, I can't do it in MetaHuman, but I can go back and forth between Unreal to just see 
you know, where, where I'm off, you know, the cheeks are a little too far out or this is a little, so I can do it by hand right now, but at, to the next point, that should be something that could, a computer could do really fast. <laughs> and Rick, Rick, the, the iClone does that right now, right? A uh, character creator does. Um, and I think, now I know you can do this, but I haven't tried it yet, but you can export your meta human into something like Blender. So I'm hoping to be able to take that and then re-import it back into character creator and then try to rig that. It seems like a more than a couple of weekends project, but I, I might try to do that someday. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Theoretically that is possible, but again, the, the magic of MetaHuman is how integrated every aspect of that human is. So it's not where like you could, you could take the, neutral pose and you could sculpt it to match someone's face and they, it would match them in in that neutral pose uh and you, you know start out with something close in metahuman and then just like tweak a few things but then all the target blend shapes wouldn't be you know right so now you've got all the target blend shapes and then all the the textures and all of those you know deformations and the displacement maps and the normal maps and all of that like all of those things and and the way that they mix from one another, depending on the, the animation values, like it, it is, it is a fully integrated system. And so, um, you know, when you start getting into recreating someone like that, well then, then you, you need Jason's team to, uh, you know, essentially build out all of those pieces. So I, I suspect that, you know, it's doable. I mean, as far as metahuman is concerned, you know, you're just kind of pulling things and pushing them around. So, and then I, I noticed that, for example, when you do roughness in the face, it, it seems to be doing a randomization of a variety of wrinkle maps, you know, so that it's got this, what appears to me to be a fairly deep library of various wrinkle maps at various depths. And so that when you're moving that slider, you're not simply like there's this preset set of wrinkles that boom it's going across the whole face like it's pulling from a library of a variety of different wrinkles that are generally appropriate for different parts of the face and it's kind of randomizing them across the face and so those all of those things integrated with the animation is uh it, it's a it's a big lift to just to just make that match one person yeah this is it's it's many years of PhD level research um, from these teams. So just it's if you if you look up three lateral or cubic motion and kind of look at their backstory, you'll understand the extent of this this facial research that's gone into meta humans. It's not necessarily just some kind of off the shelf stuff they threw together. It's an it's an impressive system. And also from a game design perspective, you have the LOD system, so level of detail. So the game engine being able to uh, call um objects based on camera distance and field of view and so forth um the metahuman system has a really intelligent LOD system that is um constantly calling those different components it, it works down to a component level in the engine so you can switch in real time you can switch the hair to a card based system from the really expensive you know particle based system when you're really up close for those details and it's the same for you know it's it's in real time, it's swapping out those the the level of detail for the maps, uh, for the face, the the geometry, the whole system, and and no matter what size or or type of metahuman you create, that system is universal across all of it. Um, and also, once you start to dig in, you look at the pose drivers, what's called an RBF solver. Look inside of some of those blueprints that they give you with the the sample project, and you'll see that. Things like um, they the bodies are broken up into different they're they're classified so you have a, a you know a short medium and a tall body um, and then and it breaks down from there as well but body types body sizes and so forth and they are remapping and retargeting and uh, conducting what's called a, um, a JCM a joint uh, corrective morph there's a whole system inside of there that um, you know as the arm flexes as the hands come together they've done all of that scaling and retargeting for you with that system so if you dig into there into those blueprints you can see then where you could plug in your own source for the live link and now it's doing all of that on the fly based on the geometry of this metahuman that you've created and that's you know that would take that could take days for a technical artist to do but for someone just now jumping into it 
you know, that's that's potentially, you know, a year of worth of understanding how joints and skeletons and animation and all of that work. And they've basically done all that for you. I would say plural years for mm-hmm. sure. I mean, I, I I was a small part of the team that worked on Curious Case of Benjamin Button and and that was years and years and years of research development experimentation uh sculpting i mean there were there was there's just so much it's amazing to see like that all of that is now becoming almost a commodity with something like metahuman um but yeah the, the amount of work that goes into creating a tool like that is is phenomenal it is amazing and the fact that now anyone can use it. I mean, really anyone, it's free. Um, again, I think that that democratization, the fact that you can get to work on that, I almost feel like it's more interesting to see what can you do with all of these lifelike humans, uh, than to obsess too much on, can I make it look exactly like me? Um, because that can't be like that far on the horizon. If, if this is where we're at right now, uh, it'd be surprising if it takes uh, more than a, a couple of years to get to where, oh, here's the plugin. Someone else could potentially develop a plugin for that um, if Epic doesn't come up with something on their own. Uh, and, and I have seen there are a few people that have been somewhat successful at, at creating a, a fairly reasonable likeness of themselves. I think I saw someone on uh, Matt Workman's uh, Facebook group had done a, a pretty good uh, Tony Stark with a metahuman, uh, so you know, there's there's some really talented folks that that you know have that practiced eye for the seeing that detail, and um, and really being able to to recreate it. That that are they're getting there in terms of recreating people. Bill, well, I just wonder how long because I'm thinking back halfway through this conversation, I started remembering back to the first time. I read William Gibson's Pattern Recognition, and there's so many things that link me to thinking about that. That's almost 20 years ago. And through the lens of what part of that imagination that Gibson did has come to fruition and what part is still ahead. So it's just odd. So many things that develop so fast, but so many other things are still so lagging that trying to predict where this goes just seems to me to be crazy. I'm going to go back and reread that because it was absolutely yeah. fabulous. I mean, the thing that's that's happening here is, of course, there's these exponential uh, increases in hardware performance, right? So every year, you know, so long as the, the Bitcoin folks haven't bought every piece of technology on the planet, um, you know, we're able to do more and more faster and faster with our computers. And on top of that, we're interconnected, right? Here we are. We're all, you know, some of us are from all over the world. We're all over the, you know, the United States and the world, and we're sharing these ideas in real time. And, and this is just one little tiny piece of the internet. And so we're, all of the information exchange has now, in, you know, increased exponentially. And, and part of that will be how these tools are implemented. Um, you know, virtual production in general, one of the things that really excites me overall is its power as a communication tool. Uh, one of the things that I keep pointing to is uh, Fox Sports has their Race Hub daily uh, show about NASCAR. You know, and there it's a virtual production and there's definitely the, the gee whiz wow aspect of it. But part of that is main, you know, holding someone's attention. And another aspect of it though is to be able to point to a moment in a race and, and bring in a, you know, a fully assembled NASCAR that's, that's digital in virtual production and say, well, you know, there's this bolt in the brake system and the car explodes and you can get down to individual bolts. And so all of a sudden you can now explain to a lay person who's just like, hey, wow, those are really fast cars down to the internal mechanics and and they could someone who'd never seen any of that before can walk away from that conversation with an introductory understanding of hydraulics and and the friction and the materials of a brake and how that ultimately impacts the result of a race and i think that's for me as an instructor as a teacher as a communicator is where this becomes incredibly powerful and uh, that's where i'm really hoping to see it get implemented more and more Courtney, you had some. Yeah, a question for um, uh, Rick. The 
the model of your own face, which is sitting on the dodecahedron in the corner there, uh, what did you create that with? And is it possible to use that model into the metahuman that you're showing on screen now? That's a Bellu's 3D scan. Um, you know, that's kind of what I'm hoping. I mean, maybe not necessarily that scan, but I would like to be able to use my own facial scan somehow. Um, and that's my goal is to bring that into at least character creator. Um, but as far as metahumans, there's no input that I know of other than the pre-provided um, examples. And 10 points for Courtney for using dodecahedron in a sentence in my lifetime. <laughs> I think we have another question. I hit dice, but... <laughs> uh, yeah, we have a late one. question coming in from Cami. Uh, Van Zuvik. I'm sorry, I have trouble with that one. Van Zuvik. Uh, Nick, what are you using to create the two simulated screens on your desk if they are in fact simulated? They are simulated, yeah. So uh, these are just inside Unreal Engine. So there, there's a bit of a pipeline. Um, this is not an entirely uncommon question, but um, so this is my Unreal Engine screen. And these are just two planes, right? So there, this is just a 2D plane. This is a 2D plane. Uh, there's some light bulb assets that came out of the Virtual Studio Kit that uh, Unreal offers for free. Um, the material is a mix. Uh, there is a free package of advanced glass pack is on the um, Unreal Marketplace. And so I'm using a material from the advanced glass pack to give the, there's a, a bit of refraction and I could even make them dirty if I wanted to. Um, so, uh, so that's the material that's being used. And then to feed them the screen captures, I'm using a tool set called NDI Tools. It's from NewTek. It's also completely free. So there's one component called uh, Scan Converter that runs on your computer that is a, it's basically screen capture and it then streams that screen capture over your network. So on this side of me, I have a Mac and it's running a NDI uh, scan converter. And over here is my PC that's running the Zoom meeting and Unreal Engine. And both of them are running scan converter. And um, what I can do, there is a plugin for free from New Tech for Unreal Engine called uh, the NDI SDK plugin. And that allows me to effectively tune into those video feeds over the ethernet and bring them in as a texture so somewhere here right here like this is basically the ndi plugins installed into this project and right here is my you know the ultimate the output materials that you know so i'm actually broadcasting myself um, as well as here's you know one screen um, and here's the macintosh screen ultimately as textures and so they're added into that glass Another thing that I'm doing so that I'm able to share my screen is that I have those textures applied to two other materials. Down here in the basement of my, uh, of my world is a pair of cameras that are just pointed at two solid 2D cards. So that's cameras four and five. So if I want to, this is camera five, this is camera four, and they're just aiming at these two planes that are actually just doing playback of those NDI feeds. So if I want to look at the Mac, I just hit camera five and now you're seeing my Mac. And if I want to go back to the PC, I hit camera four, and now you're seeing uh, the PC feed that's coming in via NDI. So I'm able to share my screens that way. Um, also, I've got the Mac NDI feed on that, the, the big wall behind me. So earlier I had a really messy uh, desktop shown and, and you couldn't see me raising my hand. Um, so I just went to like a nice subdued desktop. And uh, so yeah, that's, that's the whole pipeline. Uh, there's actually, my YouTube channel is uh, PixelProf, and uh, I have tutorials on how to use the NDI tools, and there's actually a, a specific video on how I set up those holographic displays, so you're welcome to watch those, and, and it has everything step by step. Any other questions there, Bill? Have we gotten to no, the... No, we've come to the end of today's list. Outstanding. Well, thank you all for, uh, for coming. Um, it was uh, Jason. It was it was good to meet you, um, and and thanks for coming in. Yeah, and thanks Jess, for having me. Yeah, absolutely. And Jesse, it's good to see you back. Yeah, nice to be back. I've yeah, been watching, but just not coming on much. Why? What? 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 what why aren't you coming? You got to come hang I, out with us more. Yeah, often. yeah, I will. You got will. life, right? 
life. It's that's how that's how, that's how they get you. Um, and yeah, so, definitely. Like I was just saying, I definitely like to ex extend you know the invite for folks you know that, that are yep. maybe just watching as attendees um, that are interested in Unreal and virtual production. I think we're gonna stick with the 10 a.m. Saturday hour as being. Mm -hmm basically a Q&A session, just discussion of Unreal. We, for the labs, we were trying to, you know, do specific topics. You know, we, I, I put out videos of like, here, here's how to build a set and here's how to, you know, use the, this tool or, you know, we're going to talk all about metahumans today. But I think going forward, I'd like to see more, uh, both experts and newcomers coming in and uh, getting some more folks on the on the panel here coming in and uh, and answering a lot of questions. Yeah, I think that we're going to move to kind of a definitely a more opened forum of us just figuring this out. A lot of us are are playing with it and trying to figure a bunch of stuff out. So it's going to be you know an hour each Saturday that we can trade notes. Uh, we may still have some labs in the future where we just we're all going to work on something together and try to figure something out together. Uh, maybe we'll all use MetaHuman or or all use uh, you know all do something to, together, but. Uh, definitely come 10, 10 to 11 and it's a great way to get to know people other people people will kind of get to know you if you are in the in discord and, and mukana but if you come into the panel and start talking you just start making more friends that are thinking about it we really get to know who who you are and what you're up to so especially if you're playing playing with this uh, we highly recommend uh, jumping in all right uh, great work by the producers uh, excellent morning and uh, great work by the panelists uh, for answering all those questions and being part of a great conversation. Now we're going to go ahead and jump into the post show. All right. See everybody.